Good morning, everyone. It's June 11th, 2020. I'm Chauncey Goss, Chairman, Governing Board, South Florida Water Management District, and I'd like to call our Governing Board monthly meeting to order. First, uh, first thing on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Steinley, if you're available, would you like to lead us in the pledge? We can ask everyone to unmute. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands. One nation, indivisible, with Thank you very much, Mr. Steinle. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And I'd ask uh, our, our staff to remute themselves if they would, if that's a word. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us for this public meeting. Uh, members of the public who wish to address the board can use, as we have in the past, the raise your hand feature if you're using Zoom. And if you're using a phone, we'd ask you to use the uh, star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute or unmute. If you're having any problems, you can go to our website. It's sfwmd.gov. You can click the ask us button at the top of the page. Um, as a courtesy to others um, who wish to speak, members of the public, we're asking you to only comment once on each item. Board members, I'm going to ask you to also use the raise your hand feature as we've done in the past during the meeting, except when you're making a motion or seconding a motion. In those instances, please unmute yourself, state your last name, and make the motion or the second. Um, during the presentations, you can raise your hand at any time during the meeting if you have a question, and we'll try and I'll make sure I get to you. Uh, for the actual voting, as in the past, we'll be conducting a roll call vote. Uh, please unmute yourself to cast your vote when I call your name. Um, as last meeting, we and last two meetings, I guess, we'll be working through lunch. So make sure you've got enough sustenance to keep you going. Um, a housekeeping item, um, June represents an ideal time to remember that the ability to live, work, and raise families in South Florida depends on the district's water management team. The governing board is recognizing June as Flood Awareness Month to underscore the commendable work our water managers, water managers and those who are in the field who operate and maintain our flood control system. We thank them for their dedication to the district and the communities they serve, and I know they've been working real hard. Uh, it's the mission of this agency to ensure the flood control system it was built over 60 years ago for just 2 million people. It performs today's standards, providing flood control service to more than 8.7 million people in uh, South Florida. Be sure to tune into the district's social media channels and uh, learn more about how we support flood protection and how you can help. Um, Drew, I'm gonna turn this over to you for employee recognitions this month. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I am very excited to announce the June team of the month, which is the EAA Reservoir Projects Stormwater Treatment Area Permits Team. And this represents a 19 member team consisting of Lucene Dadrian, Mike Debish, Tim Harper, Nimi J. Kumar, Julian, Julian LaRock, John Madden, Nicole Niemeyer, Sarah Nurjan, Jose Otero, R Armando Ramirez, Pete Rollick, Alexis San Miguel, John Schaefer, Terry Schwartz, Bob Taylor, Robert Todd, Leslie Waugh, Walter Wilcox, and Marcy Zender. Now, all of you know that when Governor DeSantis took office, he gave us the charge to get these projects done quickly, expeditiously, and ahead of schedule. And this team sprung into action because the first thing you need when you're doing a project of this magnitude is getting permits. And these permits aren't simple. It's a 6,000 acre stormwater treatment area. You gotta deal with wetland issues, wildlife issues, Endangered Species Act, um, cultural resources, downstream effects, water quality considerations, and you're coordinating with many agencies, both on the federal and the state level. So it's a, it's a monumental effort to get these permits. And this team really worked hard. They worked around the clock almost, you know, I saw them in the conference rooms routinely. They were on the phone with all these different agencies. And when they would get a question, which came frequently, they would get a question, they'd all mobilize and get the answer as quick as possible. And because they were turning around so quickly and getting, getting this done, uh, we are 12 months ahead of schedule and we are building the stormwater treatment area right now. And I can't wait till we can all be back you know, together so that I can get on a bus with these folks and take them out to the project site and look at it 
and say, hey, you guys helped make this happen, um, and you did this due diligence, and here we are building a project. So really appreciate this team. Uh, fantastic, fantastic work. We have a 35-year service award, uh, Cal Nidrawler. Uh, he's our chief engineer in the Ecosystems and Capital Projects Division. Cal came to us in 1985 from Purdue University with a master's degree in civil engineering. And since then, he has been just an incredible member of the team where he brought, brings his technical skills and his pragmatic solutions and his really just strong effort to make sure that we make a lot of progress at the district. He really entered our modeling group in the 90s and started building these models that we use to look at planning, whether it's water supply planning, project planning, or operational planning. And he supervised and made that happen. Um, and we still depend on that today. You know, a model is only as good as the way it can communicate with people. So he was also instrumental in developing the interface uh, with those models so that not only do we understand what they, they do, they calculate what we need to know, but they're able to present it. And you see that kind of presentation from John Mitnick every month. And so that interface is also critical. One of the unique things about Cal, you know, you can model something and see what the computer tells you, but that's different than actually operating, you know. And so he actually moved into the operations control center in 1999 and assisted with the daily operations of the CNSF, which is different than modeling it. Um, and so then in the, you know, in, in the, the last decade, he went back to the modeling effort, took that knowledge, the practical knowledge, and he's been working, you know, for the last decade on models, like with respect to Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades, the Kissimmee, so that we can use those to do planning, whether it's operational planning or project planning. And it's just been a fabulous, uh, fabulous benefit to the district. Many of you may know him also because you may have seen him do the Lake O simulator. And that's a great exercise that maybe we'll have to make sure every one of you do, where you become the operator of Lake Okeechobee and you make the decisions on where to send water and live with the consequences on where to send water. It's a, it's a fun exercise um, and, and he does that routinely and everybody completely appreciates it. So he has been a PE since 1989 and he's written technical reports, he's published papers and he's made numerous technical presentations at conferences and public meetings and everyone respects his uh, public acuity and he's just that public servant that everyone uh, goes to and relies upon and trusts. He's just that kind of person. Outside of the district, you know, he also does tutoring for high school calculus and physics. That's impressive. And he's a high school substitute teacher. Even more impressive. He enjoys reading, golf, softball, and hiking. Cal and his wife, Teresa, they raised three ch children. And I hate to say this, but not for Cal's sake, but for my sake, that later this year, he is going to retire and they're gonna to relocate to North Carolina, which is a very nice place to relocate to. So Cal, thank you for your significant contributions to the agency. Your outstanding work will absolutely leave a lasting legacy in our agency and we'll miss you when you retire, but congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair, that's my report. Uh, thanks very much, Drew, and, and thank you, Cal and EAA team. Uh, very impressive, as always. Um, the next agenda item is uh, number four, and that's agenda revisions. Uh, Rosie, do we have any revisions? We do, Mr. Chair. Uh, changes include revisions to the contract language for item 20. For item 20. Item 31 was added to the agenda, and the item numbers after the addition of 31 were renumbered so that the in agenda could easily be followed by members of the public. Great. Thank you, Rosie. Next, we'll go to um, abstentions by board members. And I'll do a poll, as I normally do, and we'll start with Mr. Bergeron. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Bergeron, I can hear you. Will you be abstaining okay. or have any yes. disclosures? I'm, I'm abstaining from voting on consent uh, agenda item 15, while my company, Bergeron Land Development, Inc., uh, did not submit a bid on the emergency debris management site service project, we are in the business of debris, debris removal. 
Therefore, I am abstaining from the voting on this item to avoid any perception of a conflict of interest. Also, I am uh, abstaining from voting on discussion uh, agenda item 29, as my company, Bergeron Land Development, Inc., was selected prior to my appointment to the governing board as the prime contractor for the C-44 Reservoir uh, STA project. I will not be participating on these two items. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Butler. I have none. Thank you. Mr. Martinez. I have none. Ms. Meads. I have none. Colonel Roman. I have none, thank you. Mr. Steinle. I have none. Mr. Olipich. None. Vice Chair Wagner. None. And I have none as well. Our next order of business is the Big Cypress Basin Board Report, and that'll be by Colonel Roman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Basin Board met on May 22nd, 2020, and I'd like to give you a brief summary of that meeting. Lucene Dadrian went over our Basin's ongoing capital projects and also updated five-year capital plan. Candy Heater gave a preview of the Basin's tentative uh, budget for fiscal year 2021 and highlighted changes since the October preliminary budget discussions. Additionally, the board received multiple comments from the public about vegetation maintenance and canal bank erosion. Because we operate and maintain the primary flood control system through a cooperative agreement with Collier County, we are working with the county to find a balanced approach for these maintenance efforts. Our next uh, basin meeting is scheduled for July 6th, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions for Colonel Roman on the Big Cypress Basin? Hearing none, we'll go to the uh, approval of minutes for the uh, May 14th meeting. Are there any changes to the May 14th meeting? And if not, um, I'd love to hear a motion and a second. I move to approve. Oh, Thanks. this Who is Cheryl Meads. I Thank move you, to approve. Butler, second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion or any discussion by the board about this? If not, I'll call that question. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Steinley? Yes, sorry. That's okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Olipich? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. And I'm gonna vote yes, that's unanimously approved. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to move to uh, public comment. Um, I'll read this quickly. Members of the public, if you'd like to speak, uh, as we have in the past, use your raise hand function in the Zoom. Um, and if you're using a phone, you can push star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute and unmute yourself once you're called upon. Um, we have received some public comments and those will be submitted and have been submitted to the board. And We've had a chance to look at them. They'll also be published as part of the final meeting packet after the meeting. Um, we're gonna try and keep everyone to three minutes and we'd appreciate your abiding by this. Rosie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a telephone caller with the last four digits of the number 0243. If you could unmute your mic by pressing Zero, I'm sorry, star six. This is Newton Cook. Good morning, Mr. Cook. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to be sure to uh, invite the uh, governing board and anyone listening to the uh, recreation uh, forum that we'll be having uh, Monday. Uh, it will be by Zoom and uh, I'd uh, particularly like to uh, appreciate the fact that Drew uh, will uh, be uh, making a comment early in the meeting. It will be at 5 o'clock p.m. as normal. Uh, it will be on Zoom, as all the meetings are today. We have some very uh, interesting uh, subjects on the agenda, uh, including the uh, Python report, 
uh, also a uh, report on all the different uh, new activities that will be occurring uh, on the recreation on the properties, uh, district trail access, uh, also an update on the uh, uh, COVID-19 land closures and the uh, Kissimmee River restoration update. We will have uh, co comments from the uh, horse riders and the hikers, the trail associations. So we look forward to a good turnout and I just want to be sure that everyone understands how much we appreciate the opportunity to have this meeting. And, and, that, and, and that's all of my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cook. I now have a telephone caller with the last four digits of 5372. If you could press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, this is Drew Martin. Can you hear me? Good morning, Mr. Martin. Uh, I just wanted to uh, speak about the uh, levels of the lake and the issue with agriculture taking the majority of that water. <clears throat> I, I saw a presentation by uh, Congressman Mast and the majority of the water that came out of the lake went to agriculture. Now that's not necessarily bad, but I think it's important that when cities and counties come to your board and they say there's not enough water for the counties and cities, rather than blaming the fact that you were maintaining the lake levels at a proper level to prevent uh, problems with the health of the lake, that the problem was basically that agriculture was taking the majority of that water. And I'm hoping that as a governing board, you will have a workshop to analyze how agriculture uses that water. Now, some it, we definitely want to continue with agriculture in the EAA. And many, much of that water does go into the groundwater system, which is, benefits the surrounding areas, but it is not getting south to the Everglades National Park, where it is needed to Florida Bay and to Biscayne Bay. So I believe that we need to begin to analyze how we can monitor that water. During dry times, maybe there is a possibility to pay agriculture to use less water and then to have more water to send south. So I hope this will be something that you will workshop at some point in the future so we can determine how we can reduce the amount of water being given to agriculture during dry times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Next, we have Gary Ritter, followed by Diana Umpieri. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, in, in response to Drew's comment, I would, would like to remind everyone that, that agriculture, like uh, public utilities, is a permitted water user down in the EAA. Um, I'd like to also echo um, some of Nyla's comments um, yesterday, which was an extremely good governing board um, workshop. And I think the challenge with our, with our public lands is certainly going to be finances and resources. And, um, you know, fortunately, we have folks like Newton Cook that, uh, that certainly help um, with providing resources and, and direction for some of these lands. Also like to follow up on a comment um, discussion from Mr. Collins on the 43 cattle leases because I think there's a there's a big misconception that um, that cow calf operations fertilize you know all their their acreage and and um, just to you know to give you an example you have 43 cattle leases and roughly only four of them um, have asked for. Uh, permit to fertilize and it's likely that they're not going to fertilize uh, all of the acreage that, that that they're responsible for. And I bring us back to um, a comment from Matt Pierce who um, actually manages about 12,000 acres and, and, and as he points out he only fertilizes about 5% of that which is about 600 acres. So I know, I know folks that uh, look at the Lake Okeechobee Basin and, and see um, a great deal of, of, of 
acreage in cow-calf operations, very little of that is, is actually fertilized if you, if you um, go and look at it. So I think we need to be um, careful on how we deal with, the, with these operations because um, they are great stewards. They provide habitat, they provide water recharge. Um, and if we lose them, as, as Hillary Swain has said, if we lose these operations, um, what's going to end up happening is, is that you may have more intensification of agriculture or you're going to have development come in. So, um, I, you know, I think we, I think we ought, to, ought to give great credit to our cow-calf operations and get a better understanding of, um, uh, you know, just how they manage their, their property and what little fertilizer that they, that they actually apply. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Next, I have Diana Ampieri, followed by Ryan Rossi. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Good morning, Ms. Ampieri. Uh, yes, hi. Yeah, I'm um, making the, the following comment, um, mostly on behalf of, um, uh, I, know I normally comment as a, a representative with Sierra Club, but I'm gonna make this comment on my personal um, time um, on behalf of the, um, the Florida chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, some of you on the board um, that have known me for a while know the incredible amount of passion I have over um, the night sky environment, the nocturnal environment um, in our greater Everglades ecosystem. Um, over the past few years, I've had the opportunity twice um, to make a presentation to the RAC uh, Recreation Forum. Um, to talk about the incredible importance um, of this often neglected um, resource um, in our public lands. And so I just wanna make this general comment to just invite the, um, the Water Management District Board members um, to review um, some of those presentations that I did back at the RAC Forum. I'll be glad if the, if the if the board was open to it in the future to do just a workshop on, on the importance of the nocturnal resource um, in the district public lands, I'll be glad to do it. Um, but most importantly, what I want to stress is just the role that, that you played, even though um, obviously water um, resources are the main mandate of the district. Um, these public lands are the home of a lot of animals that do not have curtains. I know of a lot of people that um, where the Everglades um, is the last place they have now to enjoy time with their families and enjoy something as simple as a meteor shower. Um, so I want to encourage the district to consider um, applying for international dark sky park status designation for some of the areas in the district public lands that I know for sure would qualify. Um, it would send a really strong message um, to the community at large. Um, and I know that this is very much a bipartisan issue. And this is one that is embraced by many people with many different interests. And I hope that you will consider that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sampieri. Next we have Ryan Rossi followed by Nyla Pikes. Hi, good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, Mr. Rossi. Good morning. Uh, and as always, uh, you know, thank you for allowing us, the public, really, to participate in forums like this. Um, many of these issues affect us directly, and these opportunities certainly are appreciated, I'm sure, by all. Um, as you probably know by now, my organization, the uh, South Florida Water Coalition, has been advocating to ensure our water supply is protected, uh, both in the short term and the long term. Um, I've spoken for many months at your meetings about this, as well as many other groups, um, you know, around the, the tri-county area. I'm sure, as I'm sure that all of us here in the in the short term are relieved that the desperately needed uh, rain finally came. Um, but as I said, I think that's more of a short-term gain. And as I've said before, there is a long-term element at play that we need to really be concerned about: uh, our communities, our utilities, the environment. Uh, cannot afford to live year to year when it comes to water management. That is just the bottom line. Uh, a good year might be followed by a not so good year. Um, and I think if we eliminate 
guaranteed water protections like the savings clause, for example, affords us, I know there's been a lot of discussion on that recently, so I've certainly been very vocal about it, uh, then we're going to continue gambling um, on a future that's just simply unpredictable. Uh, and I don't think that the residents of the Tri-County area want to see that. Um, none of the people that I've spoken to directly certainly are, are comfortable with that, that concept, that idea. So, you know, we depend on the comfort of knowing there is some sort of baseline protection for our water in the long term. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's really, I can't underscore it enough. That's, that's really critically important. So on behalf of all of us in South Florida, please consider this when making decisions that affect our water supply uh, and our water supply protections. Uh, I can tell you that the 8 million residents of South Florida certainly would welcome that and appreciate it as we go forward. Um, that's all. Thanks again for your attention as always. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Next, we have Nyla Pipes, followed by Mike Elfenbein. Good morning, everyone. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, Ms. Pipes. All right. So for my public comment today, I want to remind people not to uh, suddenly begin rewriting history uh, regarding water supply, which is unfortunately what I have seen Congressman Mass do recently. You know, he's uh, going around telling everybody that we've had a win. And I want to underscore that a month ago at this meeting, we were in some pretty dire straits and looking at the possibility of heading down a really bad road. We were on edge, knife's edge, as far as our water supply goes, and not just water supply for human beings. We were looking at having to reduce what we were sending to Caloosahatchee. We were looking at fires in the Everglades that we did not know how we were gonna deal with or what was gonna happen if we had more of them. Um, the Moonfish Fire, from what I understand, quite possibly has burned up subpopulation A of the Cape Siebel Seaside Sparrow, which we're trying to protect. So there's an environmental aspect of water supply, and I think it's really important that we look at the entire water management pie as a whole. And yes, okay, it's a win when we don't have discharges to the St. Lucie River. Absolutely, we don't need those releases from Lake O to the St. Lucie River. However, you can't take a win on the backs of the rest of the Everglades. And, and that's what I see having happened. And I, I wanna caution us as we listen to the ecological conditions report today and, you know, that we, that we keep that all in mind because this system is interdependent. The, the, the pieces, you can't carve an arm off of a body and say, oh, but it was good for my right arm and let the rest of your body, you know, suffer. And, and I see that that's the messaging that is occurring in my community and people along the St. Lucie River. It's great to say, yes, this was good for us. But you have to look at holistically and you have to realize that we had some pretty serious um, groundwater level concerns, which means saltwater intrusion possibilities, saltwater intrusion, not just for drinking water wells, which are a permanent loss, but also for the environment itself. Again, a permanent loss. So we've got to consider the system as a whole, and I, I cannot underscore that enough. I'm really disappointed um, that my congressman would be so blinded to the rest of the ecosystem um, and only be focusing on the St. Lucie River aspect of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Next, we have Mike Alvinbeam. Good morning, everyone. Happy governing board meeting. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity first and say I love everything Gary Ritter had to say, and he sure does put it out there eloquently and very succinct. Um, so I echo his comments. I wanted to take an opportunity to uh, let the governing board know what a wonderful job Jackie Thurlow Lippish is doing. Um, and your staff, especially Lawrence Glenn, um, when the Gladesmen and the Sportsmen had concerns with an algae bloom in the L28 a month or so ago, uh, Jackie spared n uh, no time in getting to the bottom of it, addressing it, making sure the district was aware of it. Um, she listened to the Gladesmen to our concerns, um, and uh, thankfully nothing uh, horrible came of it, but at least we know that uh, if something looks like it's going to happen. You guys are on top of it. So I thank you for that. Um, an, another thing that uh, bears mentioning, and, and, and I'm guilty of it too, is the constant discussions over the savings clause and, and similar issues that 
seem to be geared towards uh, an attack on agriculture, which, which I think is um, not worthy of the effort everybody puts into it, while more important issues like uh, invasive and exotic plants and animals are overtaking a system that we're spending billions of dollars to restore. Um, I'd like to see uh, people have not only more conversations about it, but actually uh, present some more results and some more uh, viable solutions to um, a lack of funding for some of these projects. Um, Malaluka's, I know the district was successful in getting extra funding from Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in Conservation Area 1, um, but the system overall is being overrun by exotics all the way from Everglades National Park. And for the amount of conversation that we have about sending water to Everglades National Park, um, you know, we're, we're losing, like Nyla mentioned, the seaside sparrow in subpopulation A just uh, essentially barbecued itself. Um, the riparian areas along Shark River um, in Everglades National Park are overrun by Brazilian pepper. Uh, Big Cypress is overrun by Malaluca, Brazilian pepper, uh, Kogan grass and the panther refuge. Um, and, and we're missing the boat while we're all talking about where the water's gonna go on projects that are not gonna happen for 30 years. Um, the things that we can solve now, we're not solving. So um, if we could somehow work towards that and if I could be uh, included as a part of that um, conversation and actions to make those things better, I look forward to the opportunity. Thank you guys so much for doing such a wonderful job and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Mr. Elfenbein. The next speaker is participating by phone with the last four digits of 1352. Good morning, um, it's Becky Harris, can you hear me? Good morning, Ms. Harris. Awesome, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to address the 4061 permits. Um, essentially, it looks like the monitoring component of that is gonna be very comprehensive but I don't see that there's much enforcement in there. And um, at least the 4063 permits um, that are working so excellently in the South, they have both monitoring and enforcement. So I was hopeful that the 4061 permits would do for the Northern watershed what they're doing um, in the South with the 4063. Um, I think that's been going on for decades. They've been monitoring, there's been enforcement. They've worked hand in hand with agriculture and it's reduced phosphorus level tremendously. So I think we also know that the current policies happening north of the lake haven't been giving us good results. We've had no nutrient reduction. So why can't we model the 4061s after the 4063s? Add the missing component of enforcement and just maybe we could see those TMDLs improve. So um, I do realize this requires some changing of a bill, and I understand it's not yet signed by the governor. Um, so I've done my part. I've met with my legislators, um, and I've asked the governor for enforcement to be included, and I've also asked him specifically to remove Section 8 from House Bill 5003 and to give the district more regulatory authority. So I'm also asking the governing board to do the same. Um, my understanding it's tricky, asking for change from the legislature and the governor, but I believe this board signed up to tackle the difficult issues. So I, I'm sure you all have that direct line to the governor. Um, if you can pick it up and tell them what you need because we need this done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Next, I have Emma Haydocky, followed by Scott Greenwald. Hi, can you hear me? Good morning, Ms. Haydocky. Good morning, it's Hay to see. Uh, thank you for the attempt. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Governing Board members. Uh, Emma Hay to see representing Florida Bay Forever, Save Our Waters today. I wanna thank you all for hosting this meeting and for, as always, providing the opportunity for public comment and additionally, your diligent work uh, on the STA for the EAA Reservoir. Now that we have officially entered into the wet season, Florida Bay and the Greater Everglades are readily receiving our annual rainfall and soaking up every droplet that falls from the skies, but 
these droplets in no way calm our anxieties over the future of Florida Bay and in no way make up for the water that's allocated to agriculture rather than being pulled south to Everglades National Park in Florida Bay. This past spring, as the Florida Keys quieted down for our global health crisis, the Everglades and Florida Bay experienced some of the driest conditions on record. Our Florida Bay fishing guides missed out on tarpon season and our water-based economy halted like so many others across the state and the estuary. All this happened while our captains were still out on the water, armed with refractometers and measuring salinities twice that of ocean water out on Florida Bay. Now, these findings are anecdotal, but this is the reason why I would like to remind the governing board as we enter into the annual hydro period that the threats of hypersalinity, of seagrass die off, toxic algal blooms, fish kills, and the like remain heavy on our minds in the Florida Keys community. I think so often we tend to breathe this collective sigh of relief as the first rains of the wet seasons come, but this is not any time for complacency. This is an opportunity. Uh, to reflect on how you and your partners in restoration can work to maximize flow pulled into the park and into Florida Bay. Right now is actually the time that we have to build resilience for the next dry season for Florida Bay. Uh, we have several dry seasons to come before we'll realize the benefits of southern storage. And again, I just hope that you will consider as creatively as possible how to, to maximize the flow of clean fresh water that we're conveying into the park and into the bay, not just during the wet season, but during every season, uh, as well as continuing with your work with staying on track with restoration, expediting the process uh, when possible, uh, because Florida Bay really cannot rely on the wet season for relief. Uh, and particularly when that relief tends to favor other water supply users over ecosystem. So thank you, and I look forward to your creativity and innovation for restoration within the district. Thank you, Ms. Hadesey. Next, I have Scott Greenwald, followed by Michael Collins. We can circle back to Mr. Greenwald if he wants to raise his hand again. Next, we have Michael Collins followed by Steven Leitner. Good morning, Mr. Collins. Yeah, can you hear me? Good morning, Mr. Collins. Jackie, can you hear me? Good morning, Mr. Collins. Yes, I can hear you. Mr. Collins, if you could unmute your mic. Okay, next we'll go to Stephen Leitner and then circle back to Mr. Collins. Good morning, this is Stephen Leitner. Thank you for giving me this opportunity for public com comment. I would like to ask that no easements or permits be approved to the iHeart uh, antenna property in the Bird Drive Basin. My concern is derived fr from Everglades restoration, the Biscayne Aquifer recharge, as well as wildlife impacts. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Leitner. Next, we have Michael Collins. Mr. Collins, if you could unmute your mic. Star six, Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins, if you could unmute your mic by pressing star six.
Mr. Chairman, it appears that Mr. Collins is having some technical issues. Do you want to go on and we can circle back where he could speak at the next opportunity for public comment? Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Collins to try and, and hook back up with us. We're about to just go into general board comment and then we'll have another public comment um, right before we go to the um, consent agenda. So I'd, I'd ask Mr. Collins to try back. It looks like he's having some technical difficulty. So with that, we will go to um, to board comment and um, I'll, let's start with uh, Vice Chair Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no comment today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Wagner. Um, let's see, Ms. Thurlow-Lippich? Thank you, Chair Goss, Jackie Thurlow-Lippich. Um, I'll try to give a, a brief summary of what I've been doing so the public knows. Uh, as everybody knows, there's been tremendous rain, uh, up to 24 inches in some parts of Martin County where I reside. And uh, there has been severe flooding in uh, some areas of our county where people are uh, in great need. And uh, the district and local governments have been assisting people with that as well as, as they can. Um, also flooding in areas out in Palm City Farms. Uh, people have contacted me about their uh, commercial uh, business interest and um, staff has been so helpful, uh, especially Mr. Priest. And I just want to thank staff. You know, I just see myself as an intermediary and uh, I try to do the best I can with that. Um, there is algae again in Lake Okeechobee as we'll be learning. My husband flew over and I have posted these pictures on my blog. Um, of course, uh, we thank the Army Corps and the district for supporting sending water from the C-44 canal back into Lake Okeechobee, uh, which I'm sure has been adding to the nutrient levels that are causing the algae blooms. And there would be algae blooms in spite of that because the lake is eutrophic and uh, we're all working on that. Um, I would like to mention that I'll be meeting with FDOT and staff members uh, regarding fencing on uh, highway, B-Line Highway 710 that goes between Martin and St. Lucie counties where the Florida Panther was hit and killed uh, on November 2nd of 2019. And Meredith Budd of uh, Florida Wildlife Federation has been assisting with that. She is a, uh, an expert in uh, panther habitat. And uh, there are panthers here. There are more on the West Coast, but they are here as well as bears. So it's very important that uh, these expanding highways through wildlife areas um, are offering animals an opportunity to uh, cross without causing a death to a human being or themselves. And uh, I appreciate all the help with that. And I think that's something we can do right now to uh, say what uh, Mr. Elfenbein was saying, and it's so true that sometimes we're spending all this time working on things that are 30 years out. And the most important question of all for, for the district and the Army Corps is what can we do today? So um, I will work harder at that. Um, I continue to uh, try to educate myself by going on field trips. Uh, I took a wonderful field trip with Matt Pierce uh, along the Kissimmee River. It was just such an eye-opening experience for me to be able to see that. This was um, a little while back in high COVID times, but we were very careful. And um, uh, it was, I, I, I know all of us are going on field trips and it, it really helps. And I am concerned about fertilizer and I hope we can balance that with all of the other things uh, that the, the cattle community, the oldest community uh, and business in the state of Florida brings so much to our state, especially for wildlife, as far as what is what I care about personally. Um, I'll be going to Dupuy here in Martin County coming up and uh, I look forward to, I, I hear great things about that and it's right in my own county and I haven't seen it up close. And so I look forward to that. The hunters had contacted me and although I'm not a hunter, 
uh, I support that community and I, I tried to learn about what their concerns were about being able to stay on that property. Uh, and uh, I've learned a lot about that. I guess there's limited uh, places for them to stay and it's kind of like uh, people compete. Um, last thing, I talked about this at my briefing. Um, I commend staff for all that they're doing and today's uh, staff that was recognized for the EAA Reservoir STA in light of the new start situation. And again, the theme, what can we do today? I hope and ask my board to support expediting the EAA Reservoir STA. And I know we've already done that, but we can do it even more for inspiration and for uh, material benefits to our waters and to wildlife. And um, I was uh, encouraged, I felt in my briefing that that was not a ridiculous thing for me to be inquiring about. So I hope that staff will um, support that. And I can't imagine that um, uh, our governor who has been so good about all these things wouldn't uh, support that as well if that's possible. Thank you for your time listening to me. And um, I, I, I'm really looking forward to our meeting today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mr. Olipich. Are there any other board members who want to make comments? I just realized I'm going through the list and I don't need to do that because we have that cool raise your hand function. So I see Colonel Roman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, two items. Uh, the first is last month, the district held a kickoff meeting for the sub-regional water quality feasibility study in Collier County. Yeah, in the spirit of Governor DeSantis's executive order calling for greater protection of Florida's environment, the district proposed a collaborative water quality feasibility study with the Big Cypress Basin local stakeholders in Collier County. And as you recall, in May, the governing board uh, approved the proposal. Well, within a week after that approval, the group was ready to begin. And together, the stakeholders will work with the district staff to review the data and evaluate the sub-regional water quality condition, conditions of flows into Collier Seminole State Park, Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve and the 10,000 Islands National Wildlife Refuge. And their, their charge is to come up with solutions to address flows and improvements in water quality. And as you'll recall, this area is south and west of the Picayune Strand SERP restoration project. So in, a, in a several months down the road, the final result will be a conceptual plan along with the cost benefit analysis to address flows and water quality improvements. And I just wanted to share this with the board because the stakeholders are very engaged. Uh, the kickoff meeting was well attended and uh, everybody's leaning forward to roll up their sleeves and come up with solutions regarding uh, the water quality uh, piece here. The second item uh, that I have is that I attended the virtual meeting of the RAC last month and I, I just want to give a shout out to the staff uh, for the quality of the presentations and to also our, our public participants for the quality of the discussion. I, I thought that that rack was extremely productive and I want to uh, commend everyone who, who made that possible. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, thanks, Colonel Roman. Now, a question, the uh, Collier County water quality, that was what we voted on last month, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the governing board uh, approved the proposal with uh, some money uh, for a consultant. And this kickoff meeting was to uh, work with the stakeholders to fine tune that scope of work. Uh, and then um, the meetings will then kick off with public participation. Probably next month will be the next meeting. Well, thanks very much for that update. And I, I hope that you'll keep us um, informed as this goes on. I will. Uh, we're very excited on the West Coast about this opportunity. And uh, the governing board should, should be very pleased with, with our efforts to, to move this to a more formalized structure. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Colonel. Uh, Mr. Steinley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, two comments too. I want to I want to um, recognize the the efforts of a of a number of different groups in in trying to solve what was uh, an important um, issue with the Loxahatchee River uh, since we since we last met. Uh, Loxahatchee River uh, District, City of West Palm, County of West Palm, and obviously the district. Um, so as we talked about before, the river was um, uh, suffering for a lack of water. Uh, and we had a corresponding increase of salinity. So we were um, not um, uh, reaching uh, uh, or we were going beyond the MFLs uh, for a period of time here. So together, those groups um, focus on a way of redirecting the flow um, uh, to add water, uh, or excuse me, in a way uh, to address the water quality concerns um, of the city. Uh, and meet uh, the minimum daily flow to the river. Uh, so that um, interim solution was agreed upon. It occurred end of May. As it turns out, uh, we really had about three days of operational uh, exposure before, um, before uh, the biblical rains uh, that we got uh, where where the river was uh, provided natural relief. So now we're safely above daily flow in the river and salinity levels. Um, uh, uh, however, we'll continue, and I'm going to continue to work with with those groups to determine the best ways to avoid uh, breaching those MFLs in the future. Obviously, before we have the longer term uh, solution of the Loxahatchee River Restoration Plan. Uh, the second item was uh, we do have a, a audit and finance meeting. Uh, in July, but given uh, the development since March and, and how the virus uh, has impacted markets, I thought it might be helpful to just give a quick update on uh, how uh, especially the interest rate environment affects the district's operating and investment account. So uh, while that component is a modest part of our overall budget, it's still important. Uh, current fiscal year, we budgeted about 7.8 million in earnings. We're actually on track to deliver about 9 million uh, so thank you to, to staff on that. That's at, to give you um, a perspective, an average portfolio yield of about one and a half percent. So as everybody knows, of course, in response to, to, the, to COVID, uh, the Fed lowered rates uh, even uh, you know, further uh, uh, below where we were already uh, at a low point. For savers, uh, investors with low risk tolerance, uh, and like the district, whose obviously primary objective is preservation of capital, uh, this makes things even more challenging. So uh, we, as everybody knows, can only invest in liquid low risk uh, bonds or remain in cash. Uh, so this new environment or, or a, um, uh, a downward sloping interest rate environment uh, makes things more challenging. So before March, we had about a one and a half percent yield. Now we expect about 0.85, so not about not not exactly half, but almost there. So a significant um, decrease. As such, um, we're talking about uh, budgeting about four and a half million for next fiscal. So I just wanted to update the board. The executive team's aware of that. Um, they're taking that into account with with uh, the budget. Um, obviously, there are larger components of that budget that we'll talk about in the future, but. Um, uh, thank you to, to the Treasury team for, for working in what's a challenging environment. And then lastly, as, as Jackie and everybody else said, thank you to, to, to staff who um, uh, very quickly uh, went from uh, low water levels to sort of flood control levels. Uh, and I appreciate both uh, what I understand was, was active um, preparation uh, as well as effective management uh, of our um, of our uh, resources during during the rain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Steinley, and thank you for that um, update on interest rates and keep us apprised as as things unfold. Uh, Ms. Meads. I um, I just wanted to let you know that I'm so grateful as an at-large member of the board. I represent six counties, and I live in tiny little Monroe County, uh, the Florida Keys. And I want to give a shout out to our farmers 
um, uh, to the north of us. Um, I might get a little weepy here. You may not know this, but they fed Monroe County during um, this, the COVID shut down. So we've been shut down. We just reopened um, and we are a community that lives off of tourism and fishing. And we had to close uh, ourselves off to the rest of the world because we didn't have the infrastructure um, to weather a surge of the flu. So um, people in Monroe County have suffered and the farmers um, fed us and if you are one of those stakeholders that sent us food, I want you to know that people lined up for miles to get those boxes of fresh vegetables and fruit. And we are so grateful. And that's all I've got for now. <clears throat> now thank you very much, Ms. Meads. Appreciate that. Mr. Bergeron. Yes, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? I can. Uh, first of all, I, I'm in the dry Tortugas, and fortunately, I have a very good reception, and I want to compliment our staff for setting up uh, how we can operate. Um, if I lose you, it's because I'm in the middle of nowhere, but things seem to be really good right now. Uh, I would like to compliment our staff and uh, uh, fellow board members on the workshop. I, I I uh, thought it was very productive yesterday, and I would like us to look at uh, the conservation land that, that we have, land outside of uh, SERP, in, in regards to how we can, could possibly uplift that back to being totally natural, and may, maybe uh, as creating uh, uh, wetland credits and revenue uh, to the district to be able to pursue more Everglades restoration uh, work. Uh, I know there was some discussions that we had two uh, wetland banks that we were getting revenue from, and this could be a good source of revenue and also uh, uplift areas that were uh, uh, converted being back to totally natural. Uh, also, uh, we got, thank God, we got plenty of rain and plenty of water from, from very close to uh, a drought. Uh, and I look forward to us moving water south uh, and being able to operate uh, the first stage of modified water delivery uh, for water needed uh, very bad in Everglades National Park in Florida Bay and be able to minimize the discharges uh, in volumes of water that's very destructive uh, out our rivers to the Atlantic and, uh, and to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, also look forward to working with our staff on making sure there's no obstacles uh, that would not let us continue to move water south with the 3.3 miles of bridges, the modification of the 333 structures uh, that will get us uh, tremendous volumes of water where it's needed. Uh, so uh, I think that's about it and I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it um, we I've gone through my first transition from dry to dry to wet season as a as a board member, and um, and I just want to commend staff on how well uh, from what I have seen and, and been able to witness how how well the transition uh, has gone. I know we've had our issues, and 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 the transition was really tough, and we've got flooding in areas that I know have really impacted. Um, re impacted some public with some flooding and homes and that kind of thing and um, uh, I hope that uh, I know that uh, I know the district is, is doing their part and I'm sure we'll get some updates from Mr. Mitnick as we go here but um, but I want to commend the staff on the transition and um, 
uh, especially the public outreach meetings that they've had uh, during the dry season and um, and have committed to uh, to doing some monthly outreach meetings as we go through wet season to kind of discuss operations with some of the key stakeholders. I, uh, I appreciate that. I also uh, found the um, I found both uh, the, uh, the the rack uh, rack presentation and then also our, our governing board meeting yesterday. I found it very beneficial. Um, I really like the uh, discussion uh, between the two meetings on the, uh, on integrated pest management. Um, the IPM and, and what that means and, and the holistic approach that we that we take to uh, to controlling invasive uh, invasive species and um, and it, it it I think it was emphasized but I just want to emphasize it again that it, it does take that holistic approach of, of mechanical harvesting the prescribed burning um, the biological controls and also the chemical herbicide um, the district has done a uh, has done a great job um, at, um, at looking for ways that, they, that we could be better stewards. Some of that is reducing our use of chemical herbicide. Um, but I do want to caution us that, um, that these, um, th th these herbicides are, are an important tool in that IPM. And um, as we develop new technology, I, I think during that RAC meeting, um, there was some discussion about some of the new technologies that we're trying. We're using, um, we've even got uh, backpack sprayers. We've got ones that are GPS uh, have GPS locator and um, and monitors how much um, how much a herbicide gets used at a specific location, so we can then go back and track it. Uh, I think it's just fascinating, and, and as technology improves, uh, we're going to get better at being able to control these control these invasives. But um, uh, but it takes all those tools in the toolbox. Um, I talked about the transition to water. John Mitnick, I got to share this. Um, I. I, I as we transition and we begin to get, as Jay said, those biblical type rains here, what a hard transition. But uh, I asked John if he could stop the uh, if he could stop the rain. I think we've had enough. And and, and John said, "I'm oh, sorry. Um, everyone wanted water. Everyone gets water." Um, knowing that we don't have control over uh, over when when and where and how we get the water. Um, but uh, but I commend again commend the district on, on how how we've been able to manage the system and manage the cards that have been dealt with us and continue to uh, wish that we, uh, you know, continue to try to strive and do a better job. With that, Mr. Chairman, those are my comments. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. Butler. And I, I don't have many comments, but I, I do appreciate what you just said. Uh, it was certainly a tale of two months. I'm going from dry to wet and I want to, you know, thank staff um, for making that transition so seamlessly. And for being so proactive, I know it's, it's really hard, um, but they're excellent professional water managers and they do an incredibly good job of sort of getting ahead things. And, you know, the forecasts aren't always perfect, um, but we work with what we have and I think we do a really good job. And I'm sure for every single one of my governing board members, your phone started ringing off the hook um, all of a sudden after those rains and people said, hey, it's, my yard's really wet. We know we're working on it and it's, uh, it's, it was an unusual amount of rain very quickly, but that's that's why we have to try and be proactive. Um, in Lee County, I think we're still in drought, and I'd like to thank the county for keeping people focused on that, even though everything's incredibly wet here right now. I think we do, still do have some watering restrictions in place, so I'd like to remind our, our folks in Lee County that that's, that's the case. I'd like to thank staff for the workshop we had yesterday. I thought it was excellent. Um, I learned a lot from it. And I'd like to comment quickly on um, what uh, Diane Ampieri said about dark skies. Um, if that's something that's easy to do for us, I mean, if we have if we have places that lend themselves to it for a certification for international dark skies, I, I hope we can pursue that because uh, we have that on Sanibel, and I, th I think it's it, it can be an excellent program. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, consent agenda. Is there any board member want to move any items to consent? Okay, do we have any public comment on consent? We have one, Michael Collins. Well, is this working now? I can hear Good morning, you, Mr. Mr. Collins. Collins. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your patience. Um, first, I'd like to start supporting uh, Mike Elfenbein's comments about invasive species. It's not an accident that those of us that spend the most time physically in the Everglades 
are concerned that the entire restoration effort may come to naught if we don't start doing so, something more substantial in terms of dealing with invasives. They're going to destroy the place before we get to restore it. Secondly, I want to make a blanket comment. The truth is important. And the truth is the water management districts were created and the statutes created a board that was designed to be separate from undue political influence by elected officials. That was not done accidentally, it was done deliberately. And the truth is the only officials in the state of Florida that have a larger constituency than the board of the South Florida Water Management District are the governor, the cabinet, and the US senators. Everybody else represents a lot smaller group. And the statutes demand a balance be taken and there is a apparently well-organized and massive campaign of misinformation designed to put political pressure on this board and the water management district um, to pursue agendas that are purported to be environmental that I don't think have anything to do with the environment. I've spoken to people who are close personal friends in the EAA whose children receive death threats on a regular basis because it is known that their parents are farmers in the EAA. The people making those threats are basing it, basing their, their concerns and their actions on the actions and the information they're receiving from some elected officials and some organizations purporting to be environmental. It makes your job a lot harder if you have to deal with this. I would just request that this board continue to balance your outlook on between all the existing losers and users, which is what the law says you're supposed to do, and not attach a whole lot of credibility. And this is important to the people that are resorting to misinformation to attempt to sway what you people say and do. Um, I appreciate your efforts and I wish you nothing but the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Next, we have Eve Samples, followed by Scott Greenwald. Good morning. Thank you for taking my comments. I was just reflecting on the fact that it's been almost exactly a year and a half since Governor DeSantis called for the resignations of the entire previous South Florida Water Management District Governing Board. And I was there when he did that in Stewart, and it was a pretty remarkable moment. And of course, the governor is an elected official. And the reason he called for that is because the old way was not working. It wasn't working for the St. Lucie Estuary. It wasn't working for the Caloosahatchee. It wasn't working for the Central Everglades and Southern Everglades. And it wasn't working for Florida Bay. So the entire governing board that now exists and has been subsequently appointed is there to change the old way. And I'm surprised to hear a continued advocacy for the savings clause to be applied to LOSUM legislatively because nothing reflects the old way like the savings clause. 20 year old water supply guarantees that don't allow for the flexibility we need to protect our waterways from toxic cyanobacteria blooms. The blooms on Lake Okeechobee that we're seeing now and thank you Jackie Thurlow Lippish for documenting those are a visceral reminder of the health threat posed by toxic algae. And I certainly hope that toxic algae does not come to pass this year. And moreover, I hope that it's not discharged to coastal residents or any residents if and when that happens. So um, I just wanted to take a minute to step back and think about the year and a half that's transpired and hope and encourage the new guard sitting on the governing board to do what's right to protect the health of Floridians. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samples. Mr. Chairman, there are no additional raised hands. Um, thank you, Rosie, and thank you both for your comments. And uh, Mr. Collins, I agree with you 100%. Um, we are absolutely striving for balance. Um, if there are Mr. no- Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt. We do have one raised hand. It's Mike Connor. Uh, let's hear from Mike. Mr. Connor, if you could unmute your mic. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. Great. Appreciate it. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, on the subject of al algal blooms, uh, I too saw the images uh, the last couple of days on the eastern side of the lake. Um, 
with all the fresh water in our system on the uh, St. Lucie River and IRL, I will tell you, there is a little bit of algal bloom in our, in our area. Um, there's a small little area on the western bank of the IRL. And I did receive a picture yesterday from a, a friend who works in Fort Pierce, and there apparently is a bloom going on at the mouth of Taylor Creek. I'm going to go see that this morning myself. But, you know, it just illustrates the fact that when our system is totally fresh in some of the areas uh, in our uh, lagunas, and not surprisingly, have been so fresh, very little salt, if any. And that's what it takes. You know, we have our inputs, we have our runoff, we have our nutrients, absolutely, locally. But when our system is fresh as it is now, we too can get a cyanobacteria bloom or other type of a, a blue-green bloom, not necessarily toxic, but it just, it just amplifies the point that our estuary in wet season, uh, when Lake Okeechobee is discharged, that is when we get the horrible blooms because of the freshness of the water. So I would hope that uh, this wet season going forward that uh, everybody takes in consideration that uh, whatever it takes to keep the S80 locks closed is a big boost for our estuary. And uh, that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Next, we have Shannon Estinos. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your indulgence. I had a little technical difficulty trying to raise my hand earlier in the morning. Um, let me just say that um, I, I wanted to underscore some of the points that I heard in general public comment earlier in the morning folks raising concerns, for example, about fire in Everglades National Park, um, destroying, for, for example, important endangered species habitat. Um, this is why it is absolutely critical that the governing board, the Army Corps of Engineers come to grips with flowing water south in the dry season. Now, I don't know if the voices this morning would um, necessarily agree with me on the prescription for fire to the south or for water shortages for the five and a half million people that live to the south, uh, for example, of the Everglades agricultural area, but that's the solution. The solution is to flow water south as much as possible in the dry season. Now, we're building some really great infrastructure to increase our capacity to do that. There's no question about that. The EAA reservoir, the Central Everglades plan. I mean, that's, that, you know, that is the primary purpose of that new infrastructure. That does not mean, and I, I'm sorry that I can't remember who made the point, but that does not mean that in the interim, we shouldn't be looking for opportunities to flow more water south between November and June. We should be doing that. The LOSUM process should be doing that. And we would hope certainly that the Water Management District would agree with us on that point and would be uh, urging the Corps to consider flowing water south as a beneficial use. Um, I think there are also some uh, weighty policy issues that the governing board needs to wrestle with in the coming months and years, including, um, for example, supply side management and what that means for uh, equitable distribution of benefits during uh, times of scarcity, i.e. the dry season. And um, I think there are some opportunities here to change the paradigm for what happens happens when the lake is falling and that's the dry season. Remember, if we're talking about stopping algae blooms or distributing water in the wet season, it's too late. It's too late. The, the most important steps that we can take to prevent discharges uh, in the near future uh, should be taken in the dry season. So thank you for the opportunity to make these comments. I would have made them a little earlier. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Estenos. Next, we have Nyla Pipes. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. I do want to echo Shannon's comments about sending more water south during the dry season. Of course, that's absolutely what we're all trying to do, and that's uh, part of the purpose, really the main purpose of the EAA Reservoir, which is why we have to get it built. However, you know, we have to remember that that's still a number of years away before we get all the infrastructure in place. Before we can really send the amount of water south we need, we have to keep the foot on that gas pedal, of course. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to note is, is this conversation has a lot of nuance to it. And one of the major points everyone is missing is the number one way that water, that we lose water off of Lake Okeechobee is evapotranspiration. 
you know, the water just literally evaporates off the lake faster than any other way we can send water using our canal system and conveyance system. So, uh, you know, just wanted to clarify that point that absolutely I am in support of sending more water south during the dry season whenever possible. Um, I'm in support of building more storage wherever possible as the UF report um, clearly and concisely laid out. We need storage north, south, east, and west. And we just have to keep pushing on that. This is all the more reason to continue to get that reservoir done so that we can quit, you know, worrying so much about what we're going to do with the lake level. But it's not the reality today, and it's not going to be the reality for probably the next, you know, seven to 10 years. And I'm being really hopeful with those numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. And that's it for this item, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you all very much for your comments. Um, let's move on to a, a motion for the uh, consent agenda items 12 to 23. This is Scott Wagner. Wagner. I'll make a motion. Motion by Vice Chair Wagner. Jay Steinley, second. I have a second by Mr. Steinley. If there's any further discussion, I'm seeing none. I'm going to call that vote. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Steinley? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. I'm going to vote yes. Um, that passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Bergeron abstaining from voting on item 15. Thank you. You got it. We're going to move on now to uh, technical reports with uh, Mr. John Mitnick. All right, morning, everyone. Um, Rosie, if you could pull up the presentation and then give me control. While we're waiting for Rosie to do that, um, a lot of the board members, you've already heard comments from the public. Um, what a difference a month makes. Um, so we went from one extreme with very dry conditions throughout the system um, to dealing with uh, several areas of the system experiencing flooding light conditions and, and how do we grapple with that excessive rainfall. So with that, um, also Rosie, if you could get me the laser pointer, please. Oh, I found it. All right, so looking at the overall rainfall, um, looking back at the month of May, you can see we got an excessive amount of rainfall, um, well above average for the month. Um, and most of that occurred towards the end of the month, um, right there in the last week, maybe week and a half of the month of May. So in total, it was about uh, just over three and a half inches of excess rainfall. More importantly, when you look here at June, we're already off to um, a big start for the month of June, and we pretty much received almost half of the month, uh, monthly rainfall, um, and here we are only 11 days into the month. Um, so we'll see what the rest of June looks like. Um, but as far as the wet season, the wet season has definitely started. Um, it actually started May 15th which if everybody goes back and looks at the calendar was actually the day after the board meeting um, last month. So all the discussion that took place last month and as Mr. Butler pointed out, people asking for rain um, the very next day, there was a lot of rain and the wet season started. Um, so looking at how it fell and where it fell over the month, over here on the left-hand side of the screen, um, you have the rainfall totals for the month of May. Um, pretty much the majority or the highest areas that received the most rain were down in the southeast portion. So you're talking down the Florida Keys, um, Miami-Dade, Broward, and into Water Conservation Area 3A received the most rain by some quirk of nature. Um, you can see Everglades National Park was the area that received the least amount of rain, but still um, about 150% above normal for the month. Um, so it was just a little quirk of nature that areas surrounding the park 
received the most rain, but the park itself received the least rain out of the entire water management district. So looking over at the right hand side of the graphic here, um, you can see how we are for the wet season. Really, we're only less than a month into the wet season. Um, so pretty much what you see is a similar pattern as for the month of May. One thing I'll call your attention to is this additional inset up in the upper right hand corner of the screen and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, later on in the presentation and the rain event that it took place the last week of May. But for the most part you can see the deep reds, dark reds, and purples um, in this graphic are up there in the 18 to 20 inches of rain totals and that's the 30 day totals um, for the month. But like I said, I know it's really small on this graphic. I'll have a, a much larger image of it later on in the presentation. So looking at the system, um, seeing what response was in the system to all this additional rain starting in the upper chain of lakes. As we've talked about before, East Lake Toho was undergoing the rehabilitation and restoration work. Um, so that's why those levels were held down with additional pumping out of the lake to be able to facilitate um, that restoration work. But since the rains have started, you can see right there pretty much the last week of May is when they started. Um, of course, you would expect that the lakes start to rise, and that's what you see in East, East Lake Toho. Similar situation down in Lake Toho. Those that lake is also continuing to rise up towards its regulation schedule um, for this time of year. And the trend continues as we go down further into Lake Kissimmee over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, one thing I'll point out is you'll notice that this year Lake Kissimmee didn't quite all the way get down to the bottom of its schedule. Um, when these rains started happening here towards the second half of the month of May, um, the lake um, sort of cut that corner um, and when it began to rise and it's continuing to rise up towards its its regulation schedule. As we've talked about um, in the, the months past, uh, the Corps of Engineers is still undergoing um, construction along the Kissimmee River and doing that restoration work. Um, so we've been working in concert with them and, and almost daily communications on how the Kissimmee River is operated and how the upper chain of lakes are operated so as to be able to not only manage some of that rainfall and that stormwater runoff that we see the system starting to experience with the onset of the wet season, but also doing it in a way that um, allows them to continue some of that construction so we can get the river reaches restored um, to a more natural state um, sooner rather than later. Moving on down the system, um, looking at Lake Okeechobee, this is the current um, position analysis that we talk about every single month. Um, you can see back during the month of May, Lake Okeechobee had been falling. It reached its lowest point right about here, just below 11 feet. I think it was at 10.9 feet on that day before it took a little bump up. And then, of course, we had those rains that started the end of May that um, continuing to increase stages in Lake Okeechobee. So this particular analysis was taken from the June 1st stage. Obviously, we're only sitting here 10 days later, June 11th. Um, so right now, Lake Okeechobee is sitting right about here at about 12.1 feet as of this morning, 12.14. Um, so for the last um, 10 days or so, inflows to the lake um, have driven lake levels up further and we're tracking a little bit higher than this 95 percentile line right here. So it's sitting right about at this location um, as of this morning. Also as of this morning, um, there's a somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 cubic feet per second. Um, that are coming into the lake from all inflow points. Um, so I would expect lake levels to continue to increase um, for the next couple days. Looking at the next series of graphics, um, we've 
I've talked a lot about these in the past, but it's just the probabilities of seeing increased um, regulatory discharges through various parts of the system. This particular slide deals with the water conservation areas and moving lake water down to the water conservation areas um, as we move forward in time. But for the most part, everybody really pays attention to this um, graphic and the probabilities of having increased regulatory discharges to the two estuaries. That was a subject of um, some of the presentations in prior months. So as you recall, district staff has gone in and been able to break out this slide into the next two slides. So I'll just jump to those two. Um, looking at the Caloosahatchee estuary um, and the probability of seeing some of those regulatory releases going either greater than the 600 and 50 cubic feet per second, which is this sort of dark brown or light brown color um, versus those releases that are less than 650 CFS being this gray area. As of this morning, um, when I looked at it, there's about just less than 3,000 cubic feet per second that is moving through the S79 structure um, to the estuary. That is predominantly basin runoff from within the C43 basin. There's very little, if none, um, if any, lake water um, making it to the estuary itself. And you'll sort of see that in the next couple slides. At one point um, earlier this week on Monday, um, the flows moving through the S79 structure to the estuary were just on the order of about 5,500 cubic feet per second, so 5,500 cubic feet per second, and then they've sort of diminished um, over time since Monday to now as that basin runoff has subsided from some of the rain events that we've seen. Looking at the St. Lucie estuary, um, you already heard Mrs. Thurl Lippish um, talk about the flows moving back into um, Lake Okeechobee from the C44 canal. Um, but uh, as we move forward in time, you, this will kind of give you a feel for what to expect from a regulatory or potential regulatory releases moving towards the St. Lucie estuary. Again, I'll point out as I did last month, that this graphic um, is based on the model runs and the model probability. And in the model, um, it assigns that 200 cubic feet per second to the St. Lucie estuary, whereas in um, practice, oftentimes that 200 CFS is moved over to the Clusahatchee um, to make the total of 650 CFS. So I just wanted to um, point that out one more time for everybody. As we move a little bit farther south, um, this is the portion of the system where the majority of the rains um, have taken place over the last couple of weeks. So looking at um, up here in the upper right hand corner, Water Conservation Area 1 um, is above its regulation schedule. The Corps of Engineers have implemented operations along the S10 structures, which um, separate Area 1 from Area 2, and they began moving water from Area 1 into Area 2. Um, right now, there's about just less than 3,500 cubic feet per second uh, moving from Area 1 into Area 2. And of course, you can see not only that rainfall, um, that occurred directly over Area 2 right here, but also those additional inflows coming down from Area 1 have increased stages in Area 2, and Area 2 had gone from being well below its floor down here, and the floor being this sort of um, tan line going across the graphic, to where it is today above its regulation schedule. So with it being above its regulation schedule, the Corps of Engineers is also um, begun moving water from area two down to area three through the S11 structures that sit right along this levee here. As of this morning, um, they're moving just over 2,800 cubic feet per second from area two down into area three. So that takes us back to the left-hand side here for area three. It also was below what we call its floor elevation way down here. Um, with the rains that fell directly over Area 3. As you recall, I mentioned it's one of the areas that received the most rain um, directly over Area 3. Um, 
this month. So obviously not only that rainfall, but um, the additional inflows coming from area two and other inflow points cause its stages to increase rather quickly. And now area three is once again back above its regulation schedule. So when area three goes back above its regulation schedule, the rainfall plan that we've talked a lot about in the past um, calls for maximum releases from area three down into um, Everglades National Park and farther south. So right now, um, the Corps of Engineers has opened uh, S12C and S12D structures. Those gates are fully open and out of the water and combined between the two of those structures, they're moving about just over 600 cubic feet per second um, out of Area 3 down into Everglades National Park. Um, you'll notice on the graphic on the screen that both S12A and S12B um, still remain closed. That's in um, concert with the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow and their nesting and breeding season. So S12A and S12B will remain closed this time of year up until July 15th is when they can be opened back up. In addition to the two S12 structures, um, we've talked a lot about the S333 structure that sits right about here that moves water from Area 3 into the L29 Canal. Um, I've mentioned in previous meetings how there's some construction going on with the sister structure, 333 North, um, immediately adjacent to the existing structure. So in order to facilitate that construction, um, which we're trying to get wrapped up as quickly and as expeditiously as possible, right now it's on track um, to complete that construction the middle of July. So we've got roughly another 30 days before we can get um, beneficial use and be able to utilize that structure if needed. Um, so in order to facilitate that construction, what you'll see is during the day, the 333 structure will be closed as construction activity occurs. And then between at night, the structure will be fully opened, moving about uh, just over 1,200 cubic feet per second um, into the L29 that subsequently flows underneath the bridges and into Northeast Shark River Slough. So that sort of Daytime, nighttime operation will continue from now until about June 18th, and hopefully they can get that work finished up, and then we'll all go back to 24-7 operation of the 333 structure. So on a daily average, um, I'd say the 333 structure is moving uh, about 600 cubic feet per second over that 24-hour period. So with that and all the rainfall, um, this gives us an opportunity to talk about another structure a little bit farther here to the east that we haven't mentioned in a really long time. Um, typically when I've talked about this corner of the world, it has been to describe water moving through the L29 canal and through one structure and then moving south down the South Day conveyance system. However, with all the rain, um, it, uh, We've begun operating the S-356 pump station that also sits right here uh, at the corner of Tamiami and Chrome, right in that neighborhood. Um, with that, purpose of that uh, pump station is to return water back to the L-29 Canal in Northeast Shark River Slough. Um, it was constructed as part of the modified water delivery project um, to be able to manage seepage that gets into North and from water that gets into Northeast Shark River Slough and then moves off to the east. It would then collect that seepage water from the canal and return it back into um, Northeast Shark River Slough. So with all the rain and the increased water levels, um, that pump station began operating for the first time in a while um, and returning a lot of that seepage water. One other thing that I'll talk about um, here probably in about two more slides, I think it is, is some of the operations along the South Dade conveyance system and how it responded um, to the recent rainfalls. And for the first time in a very long time, probably two years or more, 
um, we had to take some actions and operate the S197 structure all the way here at the bottom end of the system to discharge water out into um, Barn Sound. But as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a slide or two. But overall, um, the high-level summary for this portion of the system, um, we're dealing with a, a lot of water. Um, looking at the three conservation areas, they're all above schedule, and the Corps of Engineers is moving water from area one to two and two to three, and we're trying to do maximum releases out of area three down into Everglades National Park as um, system levels continue to rise with um, uh, rainfall and continuing rainfall. So I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about groundwater because it's a very different situation this month than it was last month. Last month, um, You'll recall last month a lot of the areas down here in um, southern Miami-Dade County, they were sort of these orange and red colors as being indicative of low groundwater levels. Um, that situation has obviously reversed itself and pretty much all of the wells along the east coast um, have recovered dramatically. Um, and groundwater levels have increased. There is that one area that I think Mr. Goss had mentioned during some of his comments over here on the west coast where groundwater levels are still low and still of concern. Um, however, they are beginning to recover and they have increased some, but there's still a little bit more ways to go in their recovery. And I think uh, maybe Lawrence Glenn will touch on that a little bit more in his presentation following mine. So looking at how water is moved around the system um, in the northern part of the system, so Lake Okeechobee and points north, um, we have entered the new water year. So these next two graphics have been reset to start um, tracking this current water year. Um, last month I presented the year-end summary for last year and compared it to the year before. But um, from this point forward, these graphics will convey how we're doing in the current water year. Um, so water year 21, which will last from May all the way wrapping around um, to April of 2021. So there's not a whole lot of difference between these monthly totals and the overall season to date totals um, because we are only one month into the water year. A um, couple things that I will highlight though is over here on the East Coast um, going discharges that have been moved to the St. Lucie Estuary and up to the Indian River Lagoon um, by Fort Pierce there. You obviously would expect with the heavy rains that those areas have experienced that those numbers would start increasing and that's what you see a, a dramatic jump um, for those discharges to the estuary and the lagoon, lagoon from that basin runoff and the recent rain events. Similarly, over here on the west coast, I already touched on um, a majority of this water is basin runoff and you see a dramatic increase of water that has been delivered and moved through the S79 structure from that basin runoff and those excessive rains that have occurred and of course with those rains you would expect the inflows to Lake Okeechobee have started to increase and um, Lake Stage has been increasing as well. So moving on looking to the southern portion of the system um, I already talked some about uh, the status of the conservation areas. You'll see those numbers starting to tick up as we begin to move water down through the central portion of the system, um, down through Area 3 and down into Everglades National Park. This little pink um, arrow is indicative of the operations of that new pump station 356 and returning some of that seepage water. Um, so I'll jump down all the way to the bottom. I had mentioned that um, this past month uh, we operated the S197 structure for the first time in a very long time. Um, so a little bit more detail behind some of those operations. Um, as you'll see on some of the graphics yet to come in the next series of slides, this portion of Miami-Dade County, um, over here to the west and downtown Miami, C4 Basin, um, they received an excessive amount of rains 
towards the end of the month. Um, that coupled with some mechanical failures that we had on some of the pump stations along uh, the tension cells here along C111, as well as the restriction that we had in place and were not able to operate the S199 pump station and the S200 pump station due to restrictions associated with the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow and its nesting season. We weren't able to operate those. Um, those restrictions remain in place till the end of June. Um, so all of those factors coupled with the excessive rainfall that this portion of the system experienced, that is what necessitated the opening of the S197 structure. Um, one thing that I will um, mention here is we did a low level opening. Um, I think it was on the order of 200 cubic feet per second. Um, is what the structure was open to. So in total, there was about 900 acre feet um, that um, left the system and was discharged down into Barn Sound. To give you an idea, I know it's kind of covered up um, right here, uh, but you can probably see it a little bit better here in the table of the roughly 21, almost 22,000 acre feet it has been moved through um, this portion of the system down to S18C. It was only about 900 acre feet of that almost 22,000 acre feet was actually discharged out of S197. The rest resulted in overland sheet flow over into the panhandle of Everglades National Park and then through the, the model lands in this area. So with that, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the rain event, um, spend uh, a little bit more time um, describing the rain event. Um, so looking at the two graphics that you see here on the screen, on the left-hand side um, is the three-day rainfall totals that cover um, May 24th, which was the Sunday before Memorial Day, and then going through um, May 27th, which was the Wednesday following Memorial Day. So again, the deep reds, purples, those are higher rainfall totals. You can see the majority of the heaviest rains fell just offshore um, and weren't impacting the district, except for two areas right here in um, the C4 basin. So that's Miami-Dade, um, City of Miami, um, City of West Miami, and City of Sweetwater in this area here. And then you heard Mr. Olipish talk about the excessive rains that occurred up here in, in Martin County, just south of the city of Stewart. So those were the two areas that received most of the rain. If we look at a seven-day total, um, going from roughly May 20th through May 27th, you see a very similar pattern. Get a little bit more rains farther to the north and west in Miami-Dade County. So over here is... Um, Pensuco in that area, stretching into Water Conservation Area 3. Um, but again, localized, focused efforts, um, intense rainfall right there on the C4 Basin and the South Day Conveyance System down here. So with all of that rain, um, I'll take a couple minutes and talk a little bit more about the system operations and how the, the system responded and, and what sort of folks saw on the ground. So specifically talking about the C4 basin right down in here. Some of these rainfalls in the purples that you can see on the legend over here, they'll range anywhere from 10 to 15 inches of rain over that period of time. So with that kind of rainfall, um, there was a, a fair amount of flooding that occurred. So these are some of the image or some of the images, excuse me, from the city of Sweetwater and the conditions that they experienced. Um, not only these images, but if there are a lot of other images and videos that were posted to social media that you can go and look at and sort of get a feel for the conditions that um, this particular city encountered um, throughout the rain event. and. Um, you can see that a lot of the residences and businesses were heavily impacted um, 
from the, the rainfall and um, resulted in a fair amount of flooding throughout the city. So let's take a look at how the system handled that flooding um, and how it responded. Um, real quick, I'll orient you to this graphic. Down here across the bottom are days, so it runs from May 27th through May, I'm sorry, May 17th through May 27th. Um, and then the graphic is broken up into three different areas. Um, at the top, you have rainfall. So rainfall, longer or taller the bar is, the more rain is falling or, or higher rainfall accumulations. Um, in the middle, is um, a water level a canal stage gauge that we have along the C4 canal. This gauge is actually um, referred to as a T5W gauge. Um, it's more of a, a sentinel well or a sentinel gauge um, indicative of the canal levels. It is a location that is re referenced and referred to in a memorandum of understanding that the South Florida Water Management District has with Miami-Dade County, the City of Miami, the City of West Miami, and the City of Sweetwater. So this is sort of the gauge that we look to um, that based on its level and its reading and pursuant to that memorandum of understanding that we have with those cities in the county, um, it requires certain actions on our part um, in response to those canal levels. So down here at the bottom we, is uh, the flows that are exiting the system. So I know there's a lot of lines on this graphic, um, but I'll walk you through them. This sort of mustard colored line, those are gravity flows that are exiting the C4 basin and the C4 canal uh, to the east going to tide to the Miami River. Um, this red line here is the pump pumped water that is leaving the C4 canal to the east over by the S25B structure and the forward pumps that were installed a number of years ago. And then this green line are the pumping operations associated with the C4 emergency detention basin um, that is located along the C4 canal. So the way the system operates is um, during normal routine operations, it's discharging to the east um, to the Miami River and to tide either via gravity in that mustard colored line or via pumping operations, there's red line. However, under excessive rainfall events, that's when um, based on levels at this gauge, uh, the T5W gauge, then the C4 emergency detention basin is pressed into service to take some of that water out of the C4 canal and pump it back to the west and store it until such time as canal levels can be brought back down and gotten under control and that water then subsequently moved to tide. So focusing in on the event that we're talking about, so here you're looking at Sunday the 24th, going into um, Memorial Day Monday and then on through Wednesday. Leading up to the event, um, you can see canal levels um, were pretty low, tracking along here just above three feet. Um, there, we had been moving water, uh, got a little bit of a rain there on the 18th. In response to that rain, um, there were gravity discharges to tide over on the east end of the system. And then as there was a little, as in that little surge of the canal levels came back down, those gravity discharges then subsided. You kind of see that pattern play out on the 21st, a little bit of rain, increased discharges to tide via gravity here. But then you get to um, the weekend, um, so Saturday, there wasn't any rain until you get into the evening, afternoon hours of the day. In response, there was a very slight increase in canal stages um, going into Sunday morning and the commensurate increase in gravity discharges. But then on Sundays when a lot of the rains um, picked up um, throughout the afternoon, they were mostly focused um, during the early morning, early afternoon time frame and then dwindles into the evening. 
Um, and in response to that, you can see canal stages came up through here, um, just approaching um, four feet. And as you would expect, the gravity discharges increased dramatically, getting up above 3,000 cubic feet per second to be able to stabilize the canal and get it back under control. And you can see those gravity discharges were effective in doing that in a small, slight recession um, going into the evening hours, approaching midnight on um, Memorial Day. But then just after midnight, um, I think it was about uh, somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. Um, you can see the rains picked up again here and an associated response in the canal system um, with levels increasing. And it, as soon as the water managers um, saw that response in the canal system, we turned on those forward pumps on the east end pursuant to that memorandum of agreement or memorandum of understanding that we have with the county and the various cities. It requires the water management district to turn on those forward pumps when this canal stage reaches 4.0 feet. Um, from looking at this graphic, you can see that we actually turned on the pumps before it reached 4.0 feet because we saw this significant rainfall and we knew canal levels would be increasing. Um, so we were proactive in turning on those pumps and being a little bit more aggressive in our operations to try to get ahead of um, rising levels. So throughout the wee hours of the morning, I know I got a phone call very early in the morning. Uh, I think it was 4 a.m. or something about the rainfall and the conditions on the system. Um, we continued pumping um, very aggressively uh, throughout the morning. You can see we're able to get canal levels under control going into um, the afternoon on Monday. One thing that I'll point out down here at the bottom end of the graphic is you sort of see this oscillating pattern of those gravity discharges. Um, that's because this is a coastal structure. Um, the amount of water that we can discharge via gravity is heavily influenced by the tidal cycle. Um, so this down here is at low tide where you're not as able to sufficiently get as much flow out of the system via gravity. Um, and then at a low tide, we're able to get out significantly more water. And that's why you see this sort of oscillating pattern back and forth down to high tide, back up to low tide. And the pattern just keeps on repeating throughout the day. So going back to where we were um, Memorial Day, the afternoon time frame, you can see once again here in the afternoon, there was another downpour or another burst in the afternoon um, of rainfall directly over the C4 basin. Um, commensurate with that is the, uh, once again an increase in canal stages in this little bump right here. Um, and that's when we took additional actions and we turned on the emergency the pumps located at the emergency detention basin. So I'll go back to that memorandum of agreement, or, I'm sorry, memorandum of understanding that we have with the cities. Um, it requires the water management district to turn on the pumps associated with the emergency detention basin when the canal stage gets up to 4.8. Um, so you can see that, again, we were uh, proactive and aggressive. We actually turned on those pumps um, right at about four and a half. Once the canal stage crossed four and a half is when we initiated those pumping operations to begin moving water back to the west and into the C4 emergency detention basin. So again, ahead of what is called for in the memorandum of understanding. And those operations, um, the gravity flows, the forward pumping to the east and the pumping back to the west um, were able to sufficiently get the canal levels under control and start a recession. It dropped back below um, 4.0 and was sitting, I'm sorry, back below four and a half and was sitting um, just below there come midnight on Tuesday. And then throughout the day on Tuesday, canal levels continue to recede until we get down to close to 4.2, 4.1, and you see us um, secure the pumping operations at the emergency tension basin because canal levels are continuing to recede. However, then um, somewhere around 4.30 in the afternoon 
um, Tuesday, there was another um, significant downpour. Um, it was the largest of the three days. Um, so in total, over this three-day time period, there was roughly um, 10 and a quarter inches of rain fell over the C4 basin. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in the next slide. But with that sudden downpour of rain, once again, you see canal levels jump up dramatically and, and quickly. Um, and as soon as we saw that rapid rise, um, we, when we were hitting um, the four, we crossed through the four and a half level. Um, a, we flipped on all of the pumps. So there are two pump stations that serve the C4 emergency detention basin. Um, we flipped on all 10 of those pumps and they were running flat out along with the forward pumping to the east and gravity discharges to the east. Um, starting at uh, somewhere around that 4.30, 5 p.m. time frame um, on Tuesday. However, the canal continued to rise and it peaked out right about here just over 5.6 feet and then once the rain subsided and there wasn't any more rains going through the evening and into the morning of the next day on Wednesday, you can see how canal level rise. So, in summary, um, just from the operations of the system, the Water Management District was very aggressive in its operations. Um, we began operating the infrastructure to move those floodwaters out of the system and move it to tide um, well in advance of the trigger criteria that we have specified in the agreements that we have with the various cities. But uh, believe me, it's not lost on me that hearing that the system was operated proactively and aggressively doesn't really mean anything to you if you're one of those residents that live in the city of Sweetwater or in other parts of um, the C4 basin that were impacted and had flooding. So it sort of falls on deaf ears. So let me look at it a different way and put this rainfall event in perspective as to other rainfall events and what you would reasonably expect to see with this quantity of water. So looking at this slide, um, back in 2015-2016 timeframe, the Water Management District conducted and completed a flood study for the C4 basin. Um, and in that flood study, based on the modeling that was done, it defined um, what is reasonably to expect the canal level to be in the C4 canal as measured at that Sentinel location, that T5W location for various storm events, frequency and intensity. So if the basin were to receive a one in five year event, which means that quantity of water is indicative of um, only happening once out of it, every five years, then it would be reasonable based on the modeling that the T5W gauge would rise up to this level here, roughly at 5.6. If it was a one in 10 year event, then the canal would raise up to 6.0, one in 25 year event, 6.8. And if you had a one in 100 year rainfall event, then the canal would have, based on the modeling, risen up to about 7.6. Um, feet. So looking at the rain that we actually did have, um, you can see that that T5W gauge peaked out, as I said, right there, um, just over 5.6 feet, which would look, be more analogous to uh, a five-year event. Um, however, we know from the rainfall amounts over that three-day period or those 72 hours that the C4 basin experienced close to a one in 10 year event. And in particular, if we zero in and focus just on the city of Sweetwater, um, they experienced closer to a one in 25 year event. Um, so you could have expect, you would have expected um, canal stages to rise somewhere up around the 1 in 10 or 1 in 25 year event. At least the 1 in 10 year event um, based on the entire basin um, receiving that 1 in 10 year event. But that's not what we saw. 
Um, canal stages only peaked out roughly there at 5.6. Um, so what that tells us is that the canal system, um, the primary canal system, the C4 canal, still had additional capacity to be able to receive water um, and receive those inflows from the secondary system. I know we've talked a lot about how the water management system in South Florida operates. It's that sort of coordinated tiered structure of the primary system that the water management district is responsible for. You get into the secondary system where local entities are responsible for, and then the tertiary system, which would all go down to your actual neighborhood, and your homeowners association. All three of those systems have got to be working in concert with one another to be able to ameliorate flooding conditions and deliver those flood waters out to tide and get it off the landscape. So when looking at, at the data um, and the your staff is currently in the process of finalizing a draft report that sort of summarizes this event and what the data shows from a science perspective. But in looking at the data, what this is telling us is that there was still additional capacity in the primary canal system that the water management district operates in order to receive additional inflows um, from those secondary systems and that for whatever reason um, those inflows were not able to be delivered to the primary system. So let's ask ourselves why. Why would, um, what are some of the factors that would have led to um, that water not being able to be delivered to the primary system? Well, for starters, in this six hour time frame, just looking from about uh, 2.30 that afternoon around to um, 8 o'clock that night. Um, just in that six hours, there was an intense amount of rainfall, somewhere on the order of 5.2 inches over um, the basin. So you had a, a significant amount of rain falling in a very short period of time. And um, one possibility is that the secondary systems were just simply overwhelmed with that amount of water in that limited time in order to be able to convey it. So that's something that we're continuing to look into. And as I said, district staff is in the process of finalizing the draft report, um, looking through the data and looking through the science of how this uh, event unfolded. Um, so um, once we get that report um, completed, we'll obviously be sharing it with not only the board members, but the members of the public, and we'll have some continuing discussions. Um, what we can learn from this event and whether or not there are different ways or better ways to operate the system, um, maybe even some changes to that memorandum of understanding that we have with the various entities. Um, so more to come but it's something that flood control is something we definitely take very seriously at the agency. So with that, uh, last thing I'll mention about um, this flooding event is it also impacted one of the COVID-19 testing sites that is at Hard Rock Stadium. Um, we got a call from the state emergency management system and asked us if we could help out and deploy some temporary portable pumps to be able to drain that um, testing site. So I wanted to give a big thanks to the men and women on the field stations in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach for their quick response in deploying those temporary pumps so we could get that testing site drained and back to operations um, to be able to serve in the pandemic that we're all still continuing to experience. So with that, um, sort of looking at uh, what the future may hold, um, the Climate Prediction Center is calling for above average rains all the way through the month of November. Um, so it may be an interesting wet season and we'll see what uh, Mother Nature has to bring us. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that the board members may have. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mitnick. That was a very comprehensive and interesting report, particularly the uh, response to the Memorial Day storm. Uh, Ms. Thorolipich, you had your hand up earlier. Thank you for your patience. I don't know if you still have a question. 
he answered it while he was going. And uh, thank you very much. He's good at doing that. Any other board <clears throat> members have questions? Uh, Mr. Martinez. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, John, I, I think it's important, I want, and I want to take the time um, to commend um, you and the staff and everybody that was involved in this uh, rain event that we had at Memorial Day weekend. Um, you know, it was a one in 25 year storm. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar down here, um, the Sweetwater, um, unfortunately, has traditionally uh, experienced a lot of flooding problems. Um, and uh, I know the city of Sweetwater uh, and, and Dade County has invested a lot of money uh, in pumps and, and trying to make uh, the situation better. And obviously, we at the district, um, because we do understand that, that, that flooding, uh, we take flooding very seriously. We have invested a tremendous amount of money. Uh, we have uh, Put a, uh, we have restored the C4 canal embankment. Uh, we created the C4 emergency uh, reservoir, um, and um, you know we we've gone through a, a lot of effort to make sure that um, the problems that Sweetwater has experienced for uh, as long as I uh, have been here in Dade County that 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 will get better. Um, with that rain event that we got, and even though uh, my understanding is that we even got more than what our forecasters had predicted, uh, the important thing here is that our canal, the C4 canal, never overflowed. Uh, our water was kept within our, the water was kept within our banks. And what that means is that we are able to receive whatever water is sent from the secondary and tertiary uh, canal systems, which are operated by the by the local municipality or the county. Um, so in other words, we never turn back water. So once that canal gets filled to the brim, uh, if if they're if they're sending water to us at that point, the canal system cannot take it and we can't convey it. Uh, and I mention all these things because unfortunately there was a couple of local politicians that took it upon themselves. Um, either through social media or, or, or sending out letters um, to lay blame on the flooding that occurred, um, to lay the blame on us uh, at the district. And that's unfortunate and it's, uh, and it's a shame, but unfortunately that's what politicians do. They find somebody to blame and, and God forbid they, they ever actually look at the mirror. Um, so again, I think it's important um, for me to make a public statement and to uh, congratulate uh, our staff and to congratulate everybody, Armando Billable, he's a field, uh, field office guy here. Uh, and we worked around the clock and we acted um, that, that the speed uh, in which our system and our people uh, worked and made our system um, to be able to receive the amount of water that we got was uh, was wonderful, uh, and 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 I couldn't be prouder. Uh, so again, uh, John, to you and everybody, uh, congratulations. Uh, I'm sure that we will uh, look at this, and and if there's any way that we can make matters better, um, I'm sure that we will. Um, instead of just pointing fingers, um, and and I uh, I encourage you to do that. Um, but again, um, thank you for, for a job well done. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martinez, and thank you for all of your efforts on the district's behalf. I know it's a lot of water over a short period of time, and I, I'm certain there are lessons to be learned and after action reports, and I'm, I'm sure Mr. Mitnick's working through those. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to also echo um, a lot of what my brethren, uh, my Miami-Dade brother, uh, board member Martinez has just said. I also want to point out a few things. Um, you know, we've obviously, um, uh, being down here in Miami-Dade County, are ones who are often engaged in these types of situations vis-a-vis uh, -vis residents and, and local politicians and municipalities 
um, who may not necessarily interface on a routine basis with the South Florida Water Management District, but obviously who have concerns when you have a rain event like we experienced over Memorial Day weekend. Um, you know, I think one of the things that perhaps people do not understand um, before they um, maybe cast some aspersions or, or suggestions or allegations of some sort vis-a-vis -vis the district, um, I think that they uh, do not understand how on point um, that the agency is in terms of being prepared, being ready. Um, you know, uh, there was a suggestion, for instance, that we might have been asleep at the switch. And, and I think, um, you know, those things are alleged, but when you actually peek behind the curtains at the district, you realize that everybody is constantly manning their stations, so to speak, and has been completely on top of um, and ahead of, I think, this situation. I wanted to point out a few things. Um, first of all, John, the graph that you provided, I think at slide 16, can you go to that? That, that, I just want to commend you on that. That, based on my, you know, obviously I've had a little bit of intimate knowledge in, in handling this uh, or helping to handle this situation. That graph is an awesome graph. Um, th that, that is, that tells so much of the story. I think you look at squiggly lines here, um, but when you hear your explanation on it and when you know what's going on, it, it really gives a perfect uh, chronological timeline of what we're dealing with. One of the troubles with these graphs is you try to get them on one page. Um, one of the things that I thought would be relevant to point out is that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that the canal has capacity to hold 10 feet of water. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure of the depth, but the top of the canal bank is up off of this chart. It's up at 8.3. Okay. And so, um, I guess the my my point is is that where you start to see in the middle graph that the stage rises uh, in the afternoon and evening of Tuesday the 26th uh, up to the five point let's say just a little bit over 5.5 .5 before all the pumps and gates and gravity flow kicks on and and, and moves it back down. Um, I think it's important to point out that the the line at the top of that the next little line I guess the six foot line at the, um, that, that is not the, that is not capacity. And so it, it's not like we got to a level and, and I think that's important. The other thing that I think is important to note um, is that before, as we're watching these systems come in and before um, the rain events, we are in communication with these municipalities advising them, um, as you can see the stage level of the canal is around three feet for some time. Um, you know, obviously we didn't get very much rain until we got a ton of rain. And so they were at low levels. The district had communicated to these municipalities and, and to the county that not only were we ready to receive water into the C4 canal, but that our structures were operational. We were capable of opening the gates to allow gravity flow out to the east. We were capable of operating the pumps uh, to move more water out to tide to the east if we needed to. And we were also capable of kicking on um, the flow into the C4 emergency basin um, to the west if we needed to do that. So everybody was on notice way ahead of time that we not only had capacity, but that our systems were operational and we were ready to receive. Um, I think that's important for people to know that we are in communication uh, with the county and the and municipalities that are going to be affected, that we are communicating to them, that we are capable of doing what we need to do. And in fact, you can see through this graph that we do that. We've got the, the I'm assuming the gates are open for the gravity flow. That's the mustard uh, colored line, correct? John? Sorry, I trying to unmute. Um, yes, the mustard line here at the bottom is the gravity flow exiting to the east to tie. Okay, and that's opening the gates and then the red lines are turning on the pumps to the east and then the green is turning on the pumps to the west into the into the basin, correct? Correct. 
Okay. I mean, I think it's important for people to know that, um, you know, the district a was, I mean, it may be obvious to suggest this, but not asleep at the switch. Everybody was ahead of the game. Everybody was monitoring the system. Everybody was communicating with the counties and municipalities. We had capacity. We had operations up and running, capable of turning on the pumps and evacuating the water in the way that we needed to do so. And in fact, we did do so. And at no point um, did the canal ever sort of become incapable of receiving water. I think that's uh, critically important as well. And, and like you mentioned, there is one piece of the analysis that we're going to continue to, um, uh, I mean, at least one piece of the analysis that we're going to continue to investigate, which is, do we have the ability to sort of, e even though we have a memorandum of, of understanding with everybody, if all those municipalities and counties are seeking for us to sort of try to release or move water earlier in the game, you know, if we're capable of doing that without an adverse effect on the levees or on the, um, uh, pumps that are in the C4 canal, we're going to be looking into that. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, John, I can't tell you uh, how good I think this graph is. I mean, really, when you know what you're looking at, it's incredible. And um, I appreciate it. And I also appreciate all your time on this. I know. And Armando. Armando uh, also has done a wonderful job. And, um, you know, I think it's important to point that out. And, you um, Thanks for all you do. Thanks, uh, Vice Chair Wagner. I think you make two excellent points, and and I do also agree that this graph is a tells a really powerful story, and it's it's well done, John. Um, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Bergeron, if you can hear me and unmute yourself, you got it. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, on the sweet water uh, issue here, I m won't spend much time on it, but it seems to me like the secondary system uh, couldn't get the water into our system, and it seemed like we had capacity to uh, keep people safe in that area. But I want to move on to uh, the conservation areas and, and all the water uh, that is moving south and how we can make sure that it continues to move south, south of the Tamiami Trail. Um, John, you had mentioned uh, something about the Cape Sable Sparrow on the, the east side of Shark River Slough. Uh, you had to stop moving water because of the uh, breeding season on that. Yeah, so the two pumps, and I apologize, I went too far back, so I'm going to go forward a little bit. Um, the two pump station that were constructed as part of the C-111 um, Western Spreader Canal project, the S-199 pump station right here, and the S-200 pump station just a little bit north of there, um, where there's subpopulation, I want to say, I think it's subpopulation D over in this area of Everglades National Park. Um, so we're currently within the breeding nesting season for that subpopulation that it, uh, continues through June 30th. Um, and when water levels at two groundwater gauges out in this area exceed a certain threshold, then um, we've got to terminate and secure those pumping operations. So for this event that occurred, um, with the direct rainfall just over top of those two sites, um, that criteria was exceeded and we were not able to use those two pump stations to move some of those waters either down the Aerojet Canal or into the Frog Pond Detention Basin. Hey, I, I was under the impression that uh, these, the western part of Shark River Slough, uh, that's why we shut the S-12 A and B um, in a, November around to July 15th. So you're, you're saying that even on the east side of Shark River Slough, uh, we've got restrictions on natural water flow uh, moving south to Florida Bay? Correct, not only the 
restrictions on the S12s um, on this graphic associated with subpopulation A in this area. We also have restrictions to our operations over on the east side of the park down in the South Day conveyance system for those two pump stations, as well as some of the other pump stations associated with the detention basins um, based on those other subpopulations that live on the east side of Shark River Slough. Okay, so we built 3.6 miles of bridges, or 3.3, I'm not sure what, but uh, spent millions and millions, if not a billion, of infrastructure. And I was under the impression, and I know at a meeting I uh, was talking to Larry Williams, and he had actually said that we the purpose of getting 70% of the water flowing through Shark River Slough and 30% on the west side, uh, that we wouldn't have restrictions reestablishing the natural sheet flow, natural, uh, to Florida Bay. So how do we operate with the infrastructure we're building um, if we're going to be restricted on water flow uh, under these bridges. Uh, Mr. Persia, I'm not sure I have a full answer to that. Um, it probably involves a discussion with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I know they have talked a lot about um, those continued restoration efforts and how those restoration efforts are compatible with the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow and its continued existence. Um, so as we, as you noted, as we continue to um, put infrastructure into the system, um, we'll be um, coming up with ways through those discussions and be able to fully utilize that infrastructure to achieve the restoration goals. Well, that, that would seem mighty important that we're, we're building all this infrastructure to reestablish the natural sheet flow, which benefits the global Everglades. It benefits the discharges uh, that are going out uh, our rivers in volumes that are not compatible with the estuaries. It benefits the central Everglades uh, as water moves through and is not held back at the Tamami Trail. So you have shared adversity, shared impacts globally. And, you know, you, uh, any obstacles that's not going to allow us to move the natural volumes of water south certainly are going to affect the discharges going east and west and certainly are going to affect Florida Bay from lack of water. And we need to address those opticals. Uh, also with the eight and a half square mile area that uh, I know you're working on as we speak uh, to make sure that's not an obstacle. And moving this water south will, will certainly benefit the whole system. And, looks like our rainy seasons, we're going to have a lot of rain and we need to move it south. Uh, so uh, I think, can we operate the first stage of modified water delivery uninterrupted uh, today at eight and a half I think we're restricted to 90 days. Are, are we capable of that? Or are we gonna be shutting this water off because of the eight and a half square mile area or uh, the Cape Sable Sparrow? Is that what's gonna control the flow? So right now we're operating under what's called increment two that still has um, some of those restrictions um, in it, but what all the agencies are trying to push forward towards is the implementation of the combined operating plan. Who we've briefed that several different times to the board, um, so I know that you are familiar with it. Um, so once we get to those operations, it provides a little bit more flexibility 
and how the southern end of the system is operated to combat some of those challenges. And what well, I, I would, think we need to make, make that a high priority. Uh, yeah. We have the well, infrastructure there to move the water. And, that, and that's what I would, see. sorry, Mr. Bergeron, it's Drew. I, you know, your, your brain is right where mine is, is we've got Water Conservation Area 3A you know, they just received a lot of water and, and you and I both know that the conditions can change so quickly and we've seen that happen and we've got a long wet season ahead of us. So John and his team and I are now, you know, sort of contemplating all the plans that, you know, on how to get water and how to do innovative things uh, to move water out of 3A and that includes engaging fish and wildlife and everything because we got a long wet season ahead of us and, and we need 3A in a good place in case we need to move lake water into 3A. So it's that whole global Everglades issue. Um, but you're hitting right on where my brain is as far as uh, we've got to start working on all the plans and what needs to happen because, you know, 3A is, is already above the schedule and we need to really think about how to manage this system throughout the remainder of the wet season. Well, that's true. And it's even going to get more critical as we go forward and uh, so I'd mm -hmm. like us to really pay attention to that. Uh, I know there's two structures on the L28. Uh, are those open that kind of let water sheet flow kind of southwest in the lower port of Big Cypress Preserve and on south? Are they, are they open? I think it's, uh, what is it? No, they're 330, 344 and 343 A and B. Um, no, those structures are not open. They are subject to the same criteria, enclosure criteria, as S12 A and B are. So they're tied to the cave sable sparrow as well? Yes, sir. Well, we're certainly, I know it's a sensitive uh, uh, issue here, but if we're putting, we've put, got all this infrastructure pull the plug to, to rehydrate Everglades National Park and move water to Florida Bay. To, uh, we're going to really have to sit down and um, work out any obstacles that is not going to allow us to utilize the infrastructure that, we're, that we've already built. I think it's extremely critical uh, and especially with the amount of rain we've got. And, and if you look uh, over the last 10 years, uh, nine of them were, we've got so much water and we can't get it south. So uh, I apologize for being so long-winded, but what we have to really address anything that would stop water moving south. We have very fortunate to have the 333 structures modified to be finished here very, very shortly, double the volume of water that can move south. And, but anything that would stop us from that, we need to immediately start working on it. And I apologize for being so long-winded, but it's just, we've got to open up the bottom end of the system and let the natural sheet flow flow to Florida Bay. Thanks very much, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, Ms. Meads? And I just want to remind um, everyone of what the Mississippi tribe shared with us some months back about how when water backs up into 3A, the impact that it has on their land and their lives. Um, so uh, you, we, you know, we hear uh, from Miami Dade, but we can't forget about the people who live in 3A, and it really it concerns me. Um, thanks, Ms. Meach. Are there any more questions or discussion of this from the governing board? Great. If not, we're we'll have public comment on all the technical reports at the end of Mr. Glenn's report. So we'll move on now to the ecological conditions report. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick.
Lawrence, if you would like me to control the um, presentation while you speak and unmute yourself, I can do that for you. Lawrence, could you unmute your mic? And if you need help controlling your presentation, I'm happy to help. But if you could unmute your mic. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Oh, fantastic. So sorry about that. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'd like to give the ecological conditions update for today and following John and saw, seeing all that rainfall, you'll see that conditions have changed very dramatically uh, from last month. So here is the Kissimmee Basin. Uh, you see, uh, this is the restoration area in the Kissimmee River. And a month ago, the floodplain was almost completely dry. Um, one month later, after all the rainfall that we have, with all, you know, only 200 CFS more discharge, the entire floodplain is almost inundated. Um, what this is indicative of, typically it's between about 1,200 and 1,400 CFS of discharge that we get over bank flow to inundate the floodplain. But what you're seeing here is that we are inundated the floodplain with a lot of rainfall directly on the basin, as well as the tributary inputs um, that are coming in into the floodplain and then into the river. Um, because of how quickly the floodplain was inundated and going in increasing discharge in the river, we are seeing a pretty dramatic DO crash or a crash in dissolved oxygen. Um, we have yet to see what the implication of that is. We are looking to see if there's any indication of fish kills along the river, but it is uh, of concern and we hope that the dissolved oxygen conditions will ameliorate themselves. But it's that first flush usually is very, very, uh, not as quick as it happened now. And when we do get those really, really quick flushes of the floodplain, uh, we can get this type of DO condition. I'm looking up at the East Lake Toho drawdown. I want to show you some of the, the work that had been done there. John spoke to it of what was going on with the hydrology. But in the bottom right, you'll see the pumps that were used to pump water out of that lake after gravity discharge was no longer capable at S59. So that has been ceased. And then in the picture on the left, you see the scraping that is going on in the littoral zone. And what happens when you have a lake that is stabilized for after you know, the CNSF was uh, constructed, it, it takes off the, the tops and the bottoms of the high water levels and the low water levels. And the low water levels that used to happen were much lower, and that would allow for oxidation of those muck accumulations that would happen within this area, and it would do it naturally. But after the system has been constructed, um, we don't get those lows quite as often. So this is an extreme drawdown because there was so much muck accumulation along that littoral fringe. And then you get very, very dense monocultures of littoral vegetation that grows that isn't really useful to fish and wildlife. So um, fish and, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, asked if they could you know, do a, a large lake drawdown on East Lake Toho. And this is what it looks like. They've gone in behind that bulrush fringe, which is on the right side, and they have degraded that, that area down and are degrading it down. And they take that muck and they are building in the bottom of the picture a, a um, spoil island. And so here's, you know, you see it's a, a lot of earth that they are actually moving. And this picture shows you that they have gotten down to that original sand substrate. So they have done an excellent job of removing the muck from this area. And they have created 
these spoil islands that they have seeded with millet. And then that's not a racetrack on the top. It's actually a biodegradable fabric that they put down there and it's going to maintain the integrity of that spoil mound as it revegetates. And then it will actually be useful for fish and wildlife. Um, there was also some a prescribed burn that was done. There was about 170 acres of dense cattail that was up on the north edge that was burned in order to remove that so that those, those thick monocultures, whether they be uh, dense cattail or other types of vegetation, you want to have a mosaic, you want to have some open areas, some vegetated areas. And so they went through and did that burning, which will also provide some benefit. And so you see the hydrograph that John spoke of, it was drawn down to the stage of 53 and actually went a little below, but uh, all the water and rain that we have gotten from this standpoint is helping refill of East Lake Toho. Moving on to Lake Okeechobee, and this is not quite current to today. As John mentioned, the lake station is 12.14 feet. Uh, it takes to get about 12, about 12 feet is when the, the flood, the marshes start to inundate. So between about 12 feet and about 15 feet when the water actually reaches the side of the levee is when you start to get marsh uh, inundation. So we're starting to inundate the marsh a bit more. Here you see in the red um, area down at the bottom or this trace, we are coming up very quickly. Uh, we are back up into the ecological envelope and that is a good thing. Um, on the right, you see, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, you see the, some of the really dense phallocinaria beds that have grown and are continuing to grow and recover in the lake. Um, this trajectory of this ascension rate is about half a foot a week. Um, ecology doesn't want it that quick. <laughs> you know, this is where we're like, we're, you know, at one point you're saying, oh, we don't have enough water and now we have water, but we're, we're getting water and it's getting deep too quickly. Uh, the, the marsh ecology prefers about a quarter of a foot per week or a half a foot every two weeks. One of the reasons for this is apple snails typically will lay their eggs about a half a foot above the water surface and it takes about two weeks for those to hatch. So if it comes up too quickly, it drowns all of those out. It can drown out in alligator nests. There are interesting um, ecological factors out there that have taken into account the ascension rate and the recession rate. And that's why that gray band you see in the middle you know, it has a, a nice protracted uh, recession down from the left-hand side at about 15 and a half to where you get into the middle of the summer, beginning of the summer down at about 11 and a half, and then it slowly goes back up. So we are um, filling up pretty quickly. And the impact that that has on wading birds is for the wading bird foraging survey that we did at the beginning of the month, we, there are no birds seen foraging on the lake. Uh, with the recession that we had, it had gotten dry, but there were drying pools that were there that had concentrated prey. Uh, when this recession happens really quickly, or this ascension happens really quickly, it fills those drying pools up, and it actually disperses what prey was left in them out and makes it much more difficult for birds to find that prey. So for the nesting colonies that are on the lake, they are seeing those birds move out of the lake and into the, the wetlands that are on the outside of the lake to forage. So during the dry season, or when it was really dry, the lake was, was serving as a refuge from the dryness that was throughout the region. And it did have area that was inundated and had prey. But now we're seeing that those uh, areas are better actually outside of the lake for foraging wading birds. But SAV, Submerged Aquatic Ve Vegetation, our spring monitoring um, for this program is seeing some really remarkable results. Um, all of the little red and green dots you see there are transect lines where we will take samples. So if you look at the two on the right hand side, which are the northwest and the southwest shore of Lake Okeechobee, we're seeing very dense, dense phallocinaria beds along those transects, which is just fantastic. 
Um, we'll come back to you later in the year with um, acreages, but this is just to see if it's a present or if it's absent. Then in the top left hand corner in Fish Eating Bay, we're seeing some areas where we have Allicinaria, but they're patchy. Uh, one of the things about having transects that you go back to, they are seeing some denser areas that aren't actually on the transect lines, but we are seeing a response in Fish Eating Bay. Then in the southern end, typically we will have a microalga alga that will come back first. This is Cara, um, and it's kind of a sentinel species. It'll come in and be a pioneer that will take root first, and uh, we hope to see pondweed follow it. So we are seeing the, the Cara response. Um, it's a little slow, but we hope to see that increase through the summer, and then hopefully pondweed will follow it in and take root. Looking at the cyanobacterial bloom potential, um, it's been pretty cloudy, so we have to go back to May 29th for this. But uh, what you're seeing on the satellite uh, isn't that great. Um, I'll get more into this in the next slide, though, because we're you know we're still we're still kind of testing this this technology and where it shows bloom. Sometimes there isn't a bloom, and then where it isn't showing bloom, sometimes there is a bloom. So as I spoke last month, we have increased the frequency of our sampling during the, the algal bloom period of, of the year, basically May until September. Um, so we, are, we have increased the number of sites to 30 and we are sampling these every two weeks. And what you see on this, on the right hand side is that algal bloom potential map and then actual samples that were taken and that's the table on the left. So a bloom for the district or for most scientists is considered when chlorophyll levels, we use that as the surrogate for a bloom, are 40 milligram or micrograms per liter or greater. So in the table you will see green values. Those aren't quite bloom conditions yet, but they are elevated. They're 20 to just about 39. And then the red numbers are where you have an algal bloom because it is above 40. Then in the next uh, column up there, you're looking at toxin levels, and that is microcystin, and trying to see where those are. And those are detectable when you get to 0.25 micrograms per liter, and the World Health Organization uh, considers concern when you are at eight. So as we look around and, and you see that the areas that have blooms aren't always coincident with what we are seeing in the satellite imagery but we do have several blooms. There's four values that are bloom condition and some that are coming up. Um, we are getting into the time of year where temperatures are warmer, photo period is longer or how long daylight is available for photosynthesis. And then with these rains, that of course brings more nutrients into the system. So all, we're, we're gonna keep a very close eye on the lake to see you know, how all of this compounds, if it does, if it doesn't. Um, rainfall also has, a, has the potential to knock back blooms. So we're, we're kind of, we're in a wait and see pattern at the moment um, from where we are today. Looking at the estuaries and the St. Lucie estuary, you'll see if you note the graph on the top, going back to June to 19 to June of 20, you do not see any of the blue color in there that says we have in, had inflow from the lake. So we've gone for an entire year without any inflow from Lake Okeechobee to the St. Lucie Estuary. And what I'm bringing up now, as you'll see in just June with the rainfall that we have had, and especially in that particular area, we have had flows increase from very moderate to, to quite large. Um, the weekly average inflow for the past week is 6,000 CFS, and that is very tremendous. If you go down to the bottom two pictures on the left of your screen, you'll see that a month ago, there was a nice gradient of salinity that was going throughout the estuary. So at the tips of the forks, it was you know, 5 to 18. You, know, you got into the middle estuary, it was 18 to 30, which is in a great range for oysters. And then as you got closer to the inlet, it became more saline. 
um, in the picture in the middle, current, you will see that almost the entire, well, the entire beginning of the estuary and mid estuary is fresh. It is between zero and five in salinity. And then from five to 18 out to the mouth, which is usually much more saline. Um, if you look on the right hand side, you see that that is well out of the preferred range for oysters in this area. I uh, wanted to give you some information on, you know, what can oysters handle um, in regards to salinity and lab results have shown that adult oysters are pretty resilient. Um, they can close their shells. If there are in salinity below seven, they have found that they can handle that for up to 30 days and have about 80% survival rate. And then you, you get to a point though where you get below three of salinity for 25 days and you can have almost up to 100% mortality. So there's a sweet spot in there for how long that they can sustain themselves uh, during lower salinity uh, regimes. As you go younger with oysters, spat and larvae, they do not have uh, nearly the, the resilience that adults do. Um, for spat, it's usually about four to eight days below 15 that they start to die. Uh, larva really prefer 15 to 35. Um, our May sampling of oyster spat in uh, the St. Lucie was the greatest that we have seen since 2006. So um, we're not quite certain how that's going to fare if this condition remains such, but the, this, the reproductive system lasts or will continue from June until the beginnings of autumn. So we have more time available for the oysters to contend their, their reproduction um, if these conditions can get back into the good range. Uh, looking at what is going on with seagrasses in the St. Lucie, um, you'll see in the top left hand map, this is at Willoughby Creek, which is just inside the St. Lucie estuary. Uh, down on the bottom, you see uh, we have predominantly Johnson seagrass and shoal grass here. And there is in 2007 what the density looked like and then what it looks like today. Um, it's not much different from last year. We're just entering the growing season. Um, and speaking with the seagrass experts that we have on staff, um, you know, trying to look at why is it a little bit different from last year, a little bit more denuded. And uh, they have indicated that they have seen uh, manatee in this area. They're thinking there might be some grazing pressure going on. Uh, but we are, just to reiterate, we're at the start of the growing season. So we anticipate to see uh, some better numbers coming your way throughout the summer. Uh, looking a little bit more in greater saline conditions uh, here at the, the mouth of the inlet, we see that we do have Johnson seagrass and shoal grass coming back here. It's this, the same sort of thing that we saw at Willoughby Creek. It's a little less, it's a little more sparse, and it's a little more denuded. And uh, we're going there indicating that that herbivory might be part of the reason. Now going over to the Caloosahatchee side, and it's important to, to note that the St. Lucie and the Caloosahatchee, they do not behave the same way. They aren't the same size of an estuary. They aren't physically the same shape of an estuary. The Caloosahatchee is very long. Um, it can handle larger volumes of water. So when we get over to the June rain events where we're seeing total inflows, uh, mostly from the C-43 basin and the tidal basin, only 16 here coming from the lake. Uh, it's 4,000 CFS. And what that has done on this side, uh, last month I spoke to you, the picture on the very bottom left, you saw that the, the low salinity zone, which tape grass prefers zero to five, had retreated very far up into the very narrow part of uh, this system. And that's where we have concern for increased predation on the different um, plankton that is the base of the food web. But with the flows that we have now that has pushed that low salinity zone past Val I-75 into the upper estuary, um, it, there's even uh, 10 salinity or less at Fort Myers. So this is setting up a very nice salinity gradient on this side. And as you see where on the bottom right, uh, the mean salinity levels 
relative to oysters and their preferred range it has pushed uh, those conditions back into the good range at both Cape Coral and at Shelf Point. So then up at our site called CRE2, which is just above Fort Myers, uh, we're looking at submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, previously in 2017 at this site, there was tape grass growing. Um, this area has been pretty saline uh, for the past year and we're not seeing tape grass there, but we are seeing widgeon grass. So although tape grass is, would be one that could grow here if salinity levels were lower, we do have widgeon grass growing. And if you're looking from a habitat standpoint, you want some sort of grass there that is gonna provide habitat for the different fish and plankton and crabs that want to use this area. So although it's not tape grass, we do have some good habitat that is growing here at CRE2. Looking further south, down at CRE8, which is down almost at Sanibel and St. Carlos Bay, uh, we see it's, it's tracking along where it was last year. Uh, the pictures down on the bottom, you do see some nice turtle grass and shoal grass mixtures going and growing in these areas. Uh, that is increasing as we move from March into May. So again, this is the beginning of the growing season and we anticipate there to be some really good response in seagrass uh, increased coverage at this site through the summer. Looking at the stormwater treatment areas with all of this rain, uh, you'll notice that the, all of the cells are fairly well above uh, their preferred average depth, which is that bar that goes down along the bottom. Um, total inflows to the STAs for this water year, remember we're only a couple of months into that, is 169,000 acre feet with only 6% of that or 9,500 acre feet coming from Lake Okeechobee. The, S the STAs currently are not receiving any lake water. Um, we are trying to actually move water out of these cells to, to keep the plants. Uh, they, they don't want too little water. They don't want too much water. That kind of stresses them out. So we're hoping to move some water out of here. But one thing you will notice is last month, uh, STA 5.6 was extremely dry. And so this STA is actually starting to fill. And you can see that on the right hand side where last, last month, those were mostly oranges and uh, reds and browns. And we're starting to get some good inundation in, in STA 5.6. Uh, this is a slide that's showing the annual STA inflow for the period of record that we have since STAs were put online back in about 1995 uh, through today. And you see that it changes annually. Um, there's a, a big change in uh, 2005 to 2020 when all the STAs are actually up running and functional. Um, and then there's a cumulative slide on the other side that just shows through time how much volume has gone through those STAs. Looking at Biscayne Bay, um, last month we had salinities that were above the maximum preferred salinity range and they were saline and hypersaline actually. Um, and on the bottom trace, the black is showing daily inflows from those structures that you see over on the other side, S20, F, 20G, 21A, S21. So all of the, the runoff that is coming out of those canals, you see it spiked really high up above about 5,000 CFS that has drove down salinity dramatically. And uh, we are now uh, in a much better salinity range here in Biscayne Bay. Looking at the depths in the Everglades. So we went from last month being extremely dry uh, this month to being fairly wet within the Everglades. Um, just like Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades ecology prefers an ascension rate of about a quarter of a foot per week or half a foot per two weeks for many of the same reasons that I spoke about from Lake Okeechobee. It is, you don't want to drown apple snail eggs. You don't want to um, disperse prey 
that was concentrated in those drying pools. So what this group of maps does on the, the, the two that are in blue are showing a water difference. So from a month ago, those areas that are darker blue have become to up to two feet greater in inundation depth than before. So over that month, they have increased in depth tremendously and that negatively impacts wading birds and their ability to forage. So looking at the wading bird survey that was recently conducted um, on June 7th, you look at the colonies that I showed you last month. Oops, sorry about that. There was a lag in my, hopefully it'll go back. Okay, um, looking at a comparison between last month's numbers and, and this month's numbers, um, where you see ibis and you see stork, if you see green, that is an increase compared to the number that's in parentheses from last month. So up at the very top at the new colony uh, in Water Conservation Area 1, it had three to 4,000 ibis nesting last month and now it has 2,000 additional. Um, however, we're seeing the stork population is, uh, is, is being the greatest having the greatest impact. Storks, uh, when they nest, they nest typically a little earlier in the season when it's wetter condition. They are a, a very specialized feeder. They, they prefer fish over other items. And what we have seen is with this reversal, they have not been able to fledge or feed their young. Um, they are abandoning nests. And so we're seeing those nests for storks throughout the entire Everglades decrease, where on the flip side, we have seen either no change in ibis or actually increase in ibis nesting. Um, ibis are also a specialist, but as you know, you will see them in your front yard as well. And we're seeing that some of those are either foraging in that area or they're moving out of the area into the urbanized regions to forage and then come back to their nests. So we have definitely a mixed bag for what's going on with wading birds in the Everglades. The storks that made, nested a little late this year have been negatively impacting, impacted. Uh, we did have a banner year for them two years ago. So for long-lived species, they are able to handle these types of decreases much better than a shorter-lived species. So it, it, that's, that's something that kind of keeps us uh, thinking this isn't so horrible. I mean, it is bad, but it's not absolutely horrible because they had a great year a couple years ago and the ibis seemed to be doing pretty well. Uh, going to uh, Florida Bay, you see that the, in the top graph, the 365 day moving some of the five creeks over uh, this past week has been 229,000 acre feet of water, which is above the 105,000 acre feet MFL rule threshold. And then we had salinity, which had gone above the MFL rule of 30, is uh, on its way back down to that line and hopefully will continue if rains continue to fall. Uh, looking at Taylor Slough, oh, sorry about that. Looking at Taylor Slough stages in Florida Bay salinity at the top graph, you will see that in Taylor Slough water depths had gone below ground surface and uh, those have come back above ground surface. So that is good news for that part of the Everglades. And then the two graphs on the bottom show um, salinity average within Eastern Florida Bay and within Central Florida Bay. And where we wanna be is within that interquartile blue range. And we've seen we've achieved that in both areas and both areas are below the 40 uh, salinity that we like to see. Over in the left-hand side, you will note that, so we have the, the sites that are out in the bay proper are between 35 and 40, and, and that's good for this time of year. 
uh, the areas, the three areas that are in red are of concern. Uh, we'd like for these, these near shore areas to be much lower uh, this time of year. They prefer to be in the high teens, maybe the 20s. And that occurs from runoff from this coming from rainfall and flow from the Everglades. So John had mentioned earlier that of all of the regions of the district, this has received uh, the least amount of rainfall. Uh, we did have an event about two weeks ago or three weeks ago that fell over the uh, Florida Bay proper, which kind of dropped those levels, but we are still seeing some elevated levels along the, uh, the shoreline that we would like to see come down. Um, looking at seagrass, uh, and the concern here was that we were getting into a setup that could have been similar to the 2015 die-off. But uh, in the top left uh, graphic, you will see that we have three different species that grow down there. Uh, Thalassia, which is in red, is really the, the species that is going to end up being the, where you're headed to. And we see that it took a pretty big hit and it has continued to not really respond as well. But Halladuli is one that responds quickly and you see that it has actually responded and come back up since that die off in 2015. And then in the Central Bay at Rankin Lake, you're seeing that, that sharp decline of both uh, of Thalassia and then you're seeing an increase in Thalassia in that area, as well as Halidoli. So we're seeing a positive response um, by at least one, if not two, of the seagrass species within Florida Bay. Uh, so we're hoping that these rainfalls that have, have happened and have ameliorated the salinity condition will allow for this continued response uh, by seagrass. And with that, I thank you very much, and I'll take any questions that you have. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Glenn. It's an excellent presentation. Uh, Mr. Olipich. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Glenn, thank you for all of the comprehensive information. They uh, have become so much broader, and uh, that's deeply appreciated. Um, as far as, I'm sorry, I had to put it down because my, my neighbor knocked on my door about something. Um, there's the sheet that has um, the algae bloom on it, and it's, I think it's May 22nd. And I just wanted to ask you if it's possible to use um, more recent dates than that, because we're already, I think, 20 days past that at um, June 10th. Yeah, we, we, have, we have increased our, our frequency. It used to be even further back than that. So we are, are getting, we are out there sampling every two weeks and then there's gonna be a time period in order to do the sample, to validate the sample and then uplate and verify that, that those data are correct. So we'll always have a little bit of a lag. We're never gonna have, um, you know, we don't have data that is, con is conducted that's going to come in on the same day or you typically within that week. So our data are gonna be a little bit of a lag, but it is much better than where we were last summer where I was always reporting a full month back. Now we have a, a much shorter lag in there that I can bring to you every month. Um, Mr. Glenn, I, I'm not, I'm sorry, I was not clear. Um, I'm not referring to the data. I'm referring to the Lake Okeechobee cyanobacteria bloom potential uh, satellite map that is on page nine. It's dated oh. A22. We have had so much cloud cover that that was the last map that we didn't have, that, that we had a, a clear view of the lake. So we will always use the, the map that is the most current but it also has to be able to you know show something and if there's cloud cover we get those big gray spotches on the map that, that don't show anything so we were trying to find the map that was had the least amount of cloud cover to present so there's not a map in 20 days uh yes ma'am okay 
I must be getting exposed to something different, but um, thank you very much. And then I have another question on page 19. Mm -hmm. And um, I always uh, like these, um, the annual STA inflows from 1994 through 19, I'm sorry, through 2020. Yes. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm refining the way I look at things all the time in this year of being on the governing board. So I just wanted to ask you again, when I'm looking at a chart like this or a graph like this, is this my best opportunity to see quote unquote water sending south, water going south? Is this a way from, for a person like me, a non-scientist to judge that? Or is, is there another chart with something different that we could show? Um, that's a good question. I'm gonna start and I may ask John to help finish. But this is looking at that annual average inflows. Um, I would have to ask staff if inflows are always equivalent to um, what we push out of the STAs. And that's where I will hand it to John. Is he going to talk now? Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Um, yes, Mr. Olipish, um, if you're interested in that metric um, for flows flowing south, um, we can break it up into a couple different um, demarcations um, and provide you with a more representative uh, graphic. Um, one, the amount of water that left Lake Okeechobee moving south to the amount of water that went to the water conservation areas moving south, and then three, the amount of water that went in all the way out the bottom into Everglades National Park. So um, Lawrence and I will take that as a task and we'll work towards getting something together for you that we can share. Well, I thank you very much. And I think I've realized over time that it's not black and white and um, it doesn't, it's hard to, to represent because water's going, look at that chart you have for, uh, you know, showing all the arrows where the water is going. It's, it's quite a conundrum really. Uh, so I, I just do appreciate it. And I think too, you know, I, I very much respect what Mr. Bergeron uh, is getting at when he's talking about, you know, all this money spent and all these things we've done and, uh, over time, not just this board, of course, and trying to make sure that we utilize, you know, moving water south. So, you know, what does that mean, particularly for, for him having such a, um, a deep understanding of the very uh, southern part of the system? Does it mean sending water into Everglades National Park? Or perhaps there are some nuances that I really don't understand. But in any case, it is fun and necessary to judge ourselves so that we can always try to do better. And um, another thing I've realized, of course, you know, is like the rain's not the same every year. You know, I think when I originally started crying, you know, send the water south, I was, I don't know what, I was always thinking in terms of, of just black and white. And then you start to think, well, gosh, there, we didn't have that much rain last year, but we had a ton of rain in the year before. And, it would be nice if those kinds of things were um, uh, put into the equation as well. And um, again, it just trying to find ways to uh, judge ourselves in a, in a manner by which we can always try to improve ourselves. Um, thank you so much. Excellent presentations as always. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Olivich. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Glenn, I, I appreciate the good report there. Um, and I've got a question. It may be more geared to Mr. Mitnick or even Ms. Reynolds, so Ms. Jenner. Um, but um, uh, you showed the Kissimmee River plain there, and it's obviously inundated. And I'm just wondering, uh, I know we've got the core deviation in place, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of water fell south of 65A on the C-38 there. And just curious how the uh the restoration that I feel uh has held up i didn't get a chance to ask you about this during the uh 
uh, during the briefing. And Lawrence, I know you you're kind of the expert on uh, C thirty eight. You had any insight, or Miss Reynolds, or this? Yeah, I sp I spoke with the Army Corps actually at the beginning of the week. Um, they were looking for this deviation. How much I asked, how much longer they had for construction? Uh, they were still doing well in construction. They said they had about twenty days left until they were going to um, stop this phase. Of construction because of the onset of the wet season. Uh, it's much easier to work in the dry. So that's what they were trying to work toward. And uh, hopefully that we can keep their looking for inflows of 900 or less to kind of work in the dry. Um, floodplain is getting a little wet. They have continued working, but they're, they're hoping to be able to continue out this phase of their construction. Okay. Just, just, checking to see if they've been able to keep things from eroding there. I know we've had some issues in the past and it looked like they've done a great job. This contractor's done a great job on this lower reach of kind of putting a berm up on the north end to kind of prevent water from overflowing right where they backfilled at. So, uh, but I and just uh, curious. Yeah, it was, it was the Irma, Irma level flows that did a lot of the erosion. So we're still well below that discharge volume right now. Um, and we hope we can we can keep it that way for a little while longer. All right, and then you mentioned the DO crash. Is that kind of system or uh, C38 wide, or is that kind of localized in an area? Or uh, well, for the sensors that we have, is in the restored area, so that's going to be Pool B and Pool C. And uh, what we see on a, on a on a basis is when we have a very very large rain event you get really high discharges or if you have large flushes of water off the floodplain that are very instantaneous rather than being gradual that's when we see that dissolved oxygen um, it kind of strips the water of, of the different phytoplankton that are out there that can photosynthesize um, it makes it very turbid it increases biological oxygen demand but so far we're seeing that and that our sensors are above you um, they are up in pool C and uh, pool D. But well, I'll, I'll investigate and I'll find out for you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Glenn. Well, thank you, Mr. Butler. Mr. Steinley. Lawrence, thanks. Jay Steinley. Um, I think you got this this page in right under the uh, right, 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 right at the last minute. So can you, I think it's page 25. That's the uh, Florida Bay seagrass update. I'm just going to ask you to turn it up because I don't have it in the materials and I can't find it online. And it, I think it it's was, a good, it good was chart. a last minute entry. <laughs> uh, maybe one more. There we go. Okay, so c c can you just spend a little bit more time on this? I think what I've um, this is either a graph that I haven't seen before, or it's been a while. I understand the park's been closed. Um, sure. Is this, is, is this a new measurement? Uh, um, no, uh, these, we... this is the seagrass. Uh, I talked about the monitoring last month that is done um, for recover. So it is going back. It started in 1995. It is done annually. And what they're doing is they're looking at a density or a cover glass. So they have a quadrat that about a meter squared they'll throw out and they'll look at it and you go from zero of being no cover up to five of being extremely dense in coverage. And there's a gradation scale in there that all the scientists know how to use. And so what they're looking at are three different species. They're looking at Ceragodium, Halidulli, and Thalassia. And uh, Thalassia typically is what's called your climax community. So where the other two will come in and, and be what's called a pioneer when, when if the system has crashed or something has happened, usually those two species, which are Halidulli and Syringonium, they can come in and, and kind of be the pioneers in that area. They'll go establish themselves. And they, they change the, the, the system such that Thalassia now can come in behind it. So you're seeing... Um, from 1995 in the top draft graph, if we're looking at Johnson Key, how 
the last, yeah, the red line kind of goes and bobs and weaves, and then it comes up and it stays very stable for a long period of time. That means that, you know, it was well established. It was the, the climax community there. Um, it is a mixed system. So there are others are going to be there, but typically when one is in great abundance, it's going to make the others not in as great abundance. So when you get to the 2015 um, year or point in that graph, you'll see that dramatic decline in both Thalassia and Halidouli. And then you see our Thalassia and Serangonium, but you see the green one on the bottom, which was kind of the one that was running along the bottom, jumps up because that's saying, okay, I'm the pioneer species. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to try to reestablish myself and then make conditions such that the others can follow. And where you see that very evident is over on in Rankin Lake on the right-hand side, where you have Halidouli uh, going along. You see the, the Thalassia crash and then you see a very large increase in Halidouli. So it came up and it made that condition such that you see the Thalassia starting to come up to meet it on the bottom because the Thalassia now is coming back and it's trying to um, actually surpass and become the ultimate species that's out there again. So these are long-term data. It shows you the variation that happens across years um, and you see stable conditions and then you see where you had the crash where they become very unstable and then how that, that community tries to stabilize itself again in the following years. Thanks, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, I mean, this is, I guess I'm surprised. Um, and, and now, you know, what, 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 this, what this makes clear to me is I guess I focus too much on the current uh, salinity levels, um, which are important. But in this case, it highlights the fact that recovery is a multi-year, if not a, a decades-long process. So I was just shocked to see that, at least in Johnson Key, with two of the different two of the three species, we're still below, if I'm reading this right, we're still below 2015 um, uh, or conditions preceding 2015 die-off. So this is just a reminder to me that while we could be meeting MFL, while the salinity levels could be high, or excuse me, lower um, and, and, and healthy, um, I'm interpreting this, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is a long-term recovery process, which emphasizes even more, along with everything else, the importance of sending as much water south as we can, uh, as well as the impact, as, as Cheryl said, um, to, the, to the fishing industry, to the tourism industry, um, which, um, which relies not just on this direct resource, but the, but, but the, the broader implications of Florida Bay to the, to the, to the fishery of, of Florida and the, and the Keys. Um, but uh, it, should that be a, uh, is that an accurate takeaway that, that seagrass um, recovery is a, um, is a long, uh, process, certainly much longer than I expected. You are exactly correct. You interpreted the data perfectly. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Stanley. Uh, Ms. Meads? So now that we are out of the dry season and into the wet season, just looking back at, at what we've come through, I don't know who uh, with the staff can answer this question. Um, did we meet our obligations to users um, by supplying the water that they had legal rights to? In any case, did we miss that mark? Hey, Cheryl, this is true. Uh, the way I would say that is we, uh, there was never any restrictions imposed on any users uh, that were in the Lake Okeechobee service area. Uh, obviously, the uh, drought conditions in Lee County uh, resulted in restrictions for irrigation, and that's more due to aquifer levels. But I think, you know, thinking about the areas that are dependent on Lake Okeechobee and the conservation areas, we never got to a point where we needed to impose restrictions. Thanks, Drew. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Bergeron? Mr. 
Mr. Bergeron, I see your hands up. I'm not sure if that's left over from last time or if that's a new comment. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. What, what I'm, I believe that the importance of the natural volumes of water flowing south is extremely important. I will tell you that over the last decade, I would say nine out of 10 years, the central Everglades uh, would be three foot of water, three and a half foot of water, which is not a wetland anymore. It's a reservoir and uh, tremendously affecting all the wildlife and the plant communities. And on the other side of the Tamami Trail, it's dry or very little water and and having huge impacts to Florida Bay. Uh, I believe that it benefits the discharges that, that go out the rivers that are in quantities at times greater than natural. Uh, I believe the bottom end of this system, we will start getting benefits for projects that we've been building over the last 20 years. Uh, and, and these volumes of water with the, the timing and distribution, uh, once we are not restricted, and uh, I think there will be a huge benefit to, to the environment. And I think that that's, uh, and I'd like to ask uh, John the same question. It's mo water moving south when we have these uh, heavy rains we have, and we can reestablish that. Doesn't that really benefit the global and, and, and the rivers that take huge impacts at times when the lake ri rises to a point that we're having to move <laughs> quantities of water uh, greater than natural? If it's going out the bottom end of the system, uh, compatible with the environment and the ecology and all our wildlife and our plant communities, uh, timing and distribution, doesn't that benefit the whole global? Yeah, Mr. Bergeron, what I hear you describing is restoration and is what um, everybody is working to achieve and get that timing, uh, quantity, quality, timing, and distribution um, corrected as best as we can given the 8.1, 8.3 million people that live in South Florida today. Yeah. Yeah, and I know I speak a lot about this bottleneck there, uh, but I truly believe that it benefits the global by, by, you know, opening up the bottom end of the system. Uh, so that's all I got. Uh, thanks, Mr. Bergeron. And Mr. Olipich. Thank you very much, Chair Goss. Um, perhaps it would be helpful if Mr. Mitnick and Mr. Bartlett and any others who could assist made a list of obstacles to sending water to Florida Bay. I, th I think that's how to ask for that. And I'm saying this because I think if we go back to some of our earliest board meetings, we have been talking about this. And staff, I feel like sometimes you just can't answer the questions because it's so difficult. It's so overwhelming. There are so many obstacles. Nonetheless, if we had a list of those obstacles, maybe we could um, drill through it. And I look at one of them is this, you know, curtain wall thing. I, I listened in on that phone call it was or that Zoom meeting. It was very, uh, very, very good and very informative. Nonetheless, um, I think it would be helpful to be, um, for us to have a list 
and to be clear. So I ask for that, please. That's not a problem. We can do that. Do you want it right now, Mr. Olipish? No, just um, by the next meeting, please. Okay, sure. Well, thanks, Jackie. I think that's a that's a great request, and I think these guys are excellent at flowcharts, so it shouldn't be too hard. Um, there's no more board questions on the technical reports. We'll go to uh, public comment, Rosie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For public comment on the technical reports, first we have Newton Cook, followed by Michael Collins. Mr. Cook, if you could unmute your mic. I just hit one uh, star six. Did I come through? You did. We hear you loud and clear. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, First of all, John and Lawrence, as usual, uh, uh, a great, uh, uh, a great presentation. And the lady asking for uh, the restrictions south, there is an excellent presentation on that. It was made uh, a, a while ago, and uh, I think uh, these guys know where it is, and they can go find it for you. First of all, I want to say thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, your comments uh, confirming John's report are 100% on point. Uh, anybody that knows me for the last 15 years know that I've been telling people that Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow is directly responsible for much of the destruction from St. Lucie and the Calusahatchee to the WCAs. And anytime someone tells you the federal agencies are not preventing water from flowing south under the Tamiana Trail, they are either grossly ignorant or they're lying. And if you listen, you'll hear people tell you We've never restricted any flow on the Tamiami Trail. Well, we ain't a bird. And I remind you that at the governing board meeting in Fort Myers late last year, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Larry Williams, twice confirmed that, as Mr. Bergeron said, what are we going to do when we build the bridges and mud waters and everything is all built out? He confirmed that after all that's done, nine months, up to nine months of the year, the restrictions will remain. And in my experience, I've known restrictions to start as early as October 15th and to run as late as August 13th. And if you have a rain event, the estuaries are going to be bombed until we open up the bottom end of the system and let at least 18,000 CFS flow out the bottom. We have between 18 and 30,000 CFS of water coming in north of the lake every time we have a storm. 30,000 with Irma, 18,000 with the one that happened in uh, January 2016. Right now, two of the S12s are closed. 600 CFS. We got 5,000 CFS coming in the top of the lake. It just, and WCA3 is already over schedule. And then on the other, on the East Coast, we're dumping water into Bart Sound that doesn't want it because it can't go in the east side of the Sparrow. Now, second topic, we hear the mantras shouted, send the water south, send the water south, okay? During the, what, also, lower the lake 10.5 feet, lower the lake before May 10.5 feet. Guess what? That's what we've been doing. The district's been doing that. And what happens? We get a friggin' video from a politician complaining because the water's going south. It makes no sense. It's irrational. And then... They complain about, well, it went to the farmers. Well, guess where the farmers are? The farmers are in the pineapple forest, just south of the lake. Naturally, water runs out of the lake south through that area. It don't get in an airplane and fly down to the Tamiami Trail. I mean, we've got people who just literally come out with some of the most irrational statements regarding moving water. And thank God we have a great staff at the Water Management District, and I might add a great governing board who have been doing some really good stuff and asking the right questions. So sorry if I'm a little unhappy, but when the governing board's doing the right thing and the staff is doing the right thing and we get people complaining, it kind of uh, bothers me a bit. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Next we have Michael Collins. Hey there. 
I hope you guys enjoyed the 10 days of balance between drought and flood that Mother Nature granted you this year. Um, and I think you're going to find that um, you, if you thought you were having fun uh, dealing with the issues and the participants in the debate over the dry side, it's a pale shadow of what happens when it gets wet. Um, I'm not going to get into all the, the arguments about the savings clause. I'm tired of people misinterpreting and misrepresenting people's intentions when they discuss that issue, and it's an issue that's probably going to have to get settled in court. There's a more important and closer to home issue that kind of lines up with that um, regarding lake levels. Um, the world's changing around us. The amount of money predicted in the integrated delivery schedule to be available for restoration is not going to show up. It's not going to happen, guys, um, for a bunch of reasons. What is going to be available, this good news is bad news, is, is changes to operations. And it's good news because the district's already embarked on an aggressive campaign of improving conveyance and the operational capabilities. Um, but the bad news is there are a wide variety of constraints on your ability to send water south. Jackie uh, Thurlow Lippish is spot on. There is a broader spectrum that was presented almost annually to the board for years on constraints. And I would suggest that before, that would be a pretty good basis for the staff to start with uh, on an updated version. Um, it's not just endangered species. It's not just the Cape Sable Sparrow. It's you know things like the consent agreement, which restricts the ability to move water. And the bad news on some of this is the situation, for instance, with the sparrows, an awful lot worse than it even sounds. Um, the it, today, this year on May 28th, uh, subpopulation C had achieved 86 of the demanded 90 days of dry out. Uh, subpopulation D, which controls the flows to Florida Bay, also had achieved 80 days. There was a rain event and the clock started again. Fish and Wildlife doesn't always come clean when they tell you how they're, they're mandating this has to happen. And as Newton has suggested, they have continually and without apology for over 20 years, uh, insisted that the bureaucratic control they have over a single species take precedence over the operation of the entire system. So I think it's way past time to get a presentation on those constraints. But just remember if the lake doesn't get the water back in it. If the court has not raised the water levels above Mars 08 to go back to what was originally there, it's going to be very hard to restore the Everglades given the constraints you guys are looking at. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Next for public comment on the technical reports, we have Laura Reynolds followed by Mike Elfenbein. Hi, thank you, Laura Reynolds, representing the Florida Keys Fishing Guides Association. I have a question about the Biscayne Bay slide. I don't know if you can put that back up or not, but I noticed in that slide, the word preferred was in there for the salinity levels in Biscayne Bay. My understanding is that with the water reservation as well as the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project now being combined to be called bbc -er, the water levels in at least the near shore area or the salinity levels, uh, the target was mesohaline, which is much less than 35 parts per thousand. So I just wanted some clarification from staff on that. I did raise this issue last month. Um, you know, this part of the county is the only place where saltwater intrusion is moving. Of course, we're, we're, we're seeing that the operations at Turkey Point are contributing to that markedly. We're very concerned with that. We're seeing the, the hypersaline plume and the intrusion line moving at still 500 feet a year in certain places. Um, again, we've requested a meeting with uh, your staff to discuss the issues with operations. We sent a letter on April 8th uh, pointing all those conflicts out and we wanted to discuss that information with you. We would like to have that meeting as soon as possible. We now have challenged the NPDES permit along with other petitioners, Florida Keys Aqueduct Authority with Monroe County intervening. Um, and it's important to us that we discuss these issues with district staff who 
uh, have been looking at these issues since 2009, at least, uh, and, and before. And it's important that we understand um, uh, you know, the, the conflicts that you might see with Everglades restoration, as well as um, any issues with the Lower East Coast water supply and preventing saltwater intrusion. Uh, so again, I would reiterate the request for that meeting uh, and like to do that as soon as possible. And then I just wanted to take a moment to congratulate Paula Cobb on your new appointment with FPL. Congratulations. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, next, we have Mr. Mike Elfenbein. You're recognized for public comment on the technical reports. Good afternoon, Mike Elfenbein. Um, John, Lawrence, amazing job. You know, the staff at the district is unwavering, second to none. You guys really are the best. But I, my comments are more tailored toward John's report. Um, John, you're about to feel a tingling sensation in the seat of your pants. Um, you are a master of your craft. You are exceptional. You are unbelievable. I don't know how you're able to maneuver not only the technical and scientific aspects of everything at the district, but you're able to balance staff and incoming and outgoing administrations like nobody I've ever seen before. Kudos to you, sir. Amazing. Um, what I noted specifically in your report is, is that you gave everybody an understanding of what the three greatest obstructions are to moving water south. The seaside sparrow, the seaside red herring, and the seaside, uh, sorry, seaside sparrow and the seaside sparrow. Um, Mr. Wagner, uh, Mr. Bergeron made some exceptional comments. I'm glad to see that Jackie's catching on and getting the understanding for what the problem is here. Hopefully we can get the whole board to understand what's happening with the Seaside Sparrow. But Mr. Wagner, you made a comment to the effect of that people who don't work with the district uh, throw stones or cast dispersions, um, specifically as it related to Miami-Dade and the flooding and um, politicians. But I want you to understand is that you have people walking in and out of your doors on a daily basis who have at one point worked for or with the district, specifically folks like Kimberly Mitchell, um, Shannon Estenos, folks who now support the Everglades Foundation and that narrative. Um, and they'll walk out of meetings like this where you guys clearly specify that the sparrow is a problem. And they'll tell everybody that it's a red herring, that we're just making it up that it has no impediment on water flow whatsoever. And it's important that you understand that because you guys are working hand in hand with these people who continue to obstruct progress of doing exactly what it is that they're trying to get you to do. And at the same time, the people who really want to see you do something, they try to cast us in a dark shadow because we're talking about some red, red herring. Um, the reality is, is the sparrow, uh, Jackie, is the list of obstacles. Um, that is the list. Um, and why folks like Shannon Estenos and Kim Mitchell, who've been associated with the district for so long and have advocated for sending water south, continue to obstruct the ability to remove the sparrow obstructions from the system uh, is beyond me. And I'm hopeful that you guys will see through this smoke and mirrors and finally work to get rid of this problem that's been around for as long as Colonel Rice was at the Army Corps. Um, and advocated for the same thing. That was 20 years ago. This is a failed project, the Sparrow is. We had three in subpopulation A, and we had zero snail kites nesting south of the Kissimmee Lake uh, this season. Thank you guys so much for your time. I hope you have a great day. Keep doing a great job. We're very proud of you. Thank you, Mr. Alpenbein. Uh, next, the next speaker on the um, technical reports public comments is Nyla Pipes. Hi there, Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. Um, I began the meeting by saying that we don't want to be rewriting history. And there was something said by uh, Cheryl Meads that was a question about while we didn't get, it, it, was, it was regarding who had uh, existing users and who had restrictions this year. And I just wanna say that while we didn't get to a point where the existing legal users had restrictions imposed, we can't continue to ignore the fact that water was one and a half feet below ground level in the southern part of the system. You know, we had major issues, whether we want to acknowledge them as major issues or not, during this drought. And the problem is, is we simply don't have other storage built in than the lake at this point. 
So this is why ASR wells to the north of the lake are important as a part of the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project. This is why continuing the EAA reservoir is important, but the, the infrastructure is just not in place. However, that doesn't mean managing the lake too low is a solution, and we have to acknowledge that it goes further than the existing legal users. There are environmental concerns here. Now, back to Lawrence's uh, presentation. I wanted to say he said something very important about the first flush. A lot of the time when we have this first flush of nutrients, people, they don't understand that what happens is the nutrients sit in the soil until we get a lot of groundwater flow and a lot of surface water flow that bring those nutrients to our nearest water bodies. This goes right back to why I insist on talking about all our septic tank issues throughout the state. We had major fecal bacteria in both the North Fork and the South Fork of the St. Lucie River with the very first rainfall. And during you know, the, the flooding, of course, everyone's septic systems were uh, underwater. The amount of phone calls to the people pumping the septic you know, tanks must have been ridiculous. Um, we have to be real about this. That fecal bacteria is also an indication of the nutrient pollution happening. You know, the, the, the nitrates that come from these septic systems and from this sewage pollution are readily available food, easily digested and fed upon by these algal blooms. So we've got to get real about that. And I just wanted to make sure and mention that, especially considering we have a unique situation. Oh wait, it's not that unique. Something I've been trying to tell people for a long time, and so have many of you at the district. The inflows from our own local, local basin on the St. Lucie side are absolutely much larger than anything we ever get from Lake O, and they're higher in nutrients. So take that for what it is. You can take it to the bank. It's a fact, and we see this. We see this every rainy season. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Mr. Chairman, there are no additional raised hands. Uh, thanks very much, Rosie, and thank you to all our commenters. We're now gonna move on to the discussion agenda, item number 28. And the first one is acquisition of land interest in Miami-Dade County. Uh, Mr. Collins is gonna be leading that discussion after Mr. Collins' presentation. We'll go to um, public comment and we'll have board discussion. Good afternoon, Chairman Goss, board members. Thank you for your time and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm here today to talk about a potential land acquisition in Miami-Dade County. The land that we're, that we're looking to acquire consists of two locations, 83.8 acres in the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Preserve, specifically in the L31E flowway, and 10 acres in the Bird Drive Basin. The 83.3 acres in Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands phase one is needed for construction, and this could represent, depending on final design, the final necessary land acquisition in the project. The 10 acres in the Bird Drive Basin is contiguous to 50 acres already owned by the district. The consideration for this co combination of 94 acres is the district would be granting an easement over 50 acres uh, for an antenna easement to uh, iHeartRadio. The way the easement is constructed it, it ensures compatibility with future SERP projects. Just by way of background, the Bird Drive Basin was a component in the Yellow Book. It was planned as a shallow impoundment, four feet above grade. The project requires planning and authorization to be finalized. And with that, I present this resolution for your consideration. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Collins. We'll, I imagine there'll be some board questions. Um, first, we'll take uh, public input. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For this item, I have Mark Perry, followed by Christopher McVoid. Mr. Perry, if you could unmute your mic. By pressing star six.
we can circle back to Mr. Perry. Um, Christopher McVoid, McVoy? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Great, uh, my name is Dr. Christopher McVoy, MCVOY. Um, I was involved many years ago in the development of SERP and in the science uh, that supported SERP. More recently, I've been involved in the Bird Drive Basin litigation in relation to the 836 proposed extension and provided expert testimony as to regarding the Bird Drive, Bird Drive Basin role within uh, SERP. And I'd like to make two points regarding it. One is that um, that involvement involved some modeling, rerunning the two by two model um, in cooperation with, with Tom Van Lent. And um, what came out of that modeling is really striking importance of that two mile by two mile area and the uh, piece of land south of it um, to SERP and to, res uh, to restoration. It's important both locally and regionally. It has a lot of influence on what happens with the excess water from area 2B especially and how that gets back into Everglades National Park. The other th part of my involvement in Bird Dark Basin, I've been fortunate over the last year to be able to go almost monthly into the area and think a lot about a concern that was raised several years ago that um, the Bird Dry Basin might not actually be able to function as a four feet deep reservoir, as Mr. Collins mentioned, because the aquifer is extremely leaky, which is known for that area. What I found and what others I think have found is that there is actually quite a bit of surface water still, despite canals on most sides of the uh, of the Bird Drive Basin, there's still quite a bit of surface water, definite wetland characteristics, and that makes one think, well, why is it that um, it's able to store water? And I think the answer lies in the soils. There's a pretty thick layer of either muck or marl, or in some cases both, on that area. And I believe that's what's allowing it to hold water. In any case, the importance of the area and the ability to store up to four feet of water on it is really critical. I can't emphasize enough the need to, for the district to re-examine the modeling that we did, make sure that we didn't make any mistakes. And I would be very cautious of approving any uh, uses of the area until the, the final use for it and the ability to meet SERP's needs measured in the, um, in the yellow book, until that's been fully addressed. Let's not foreclose any options. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McVoyd. The next public comment on this acquisition of land interest item is Laura Reynolds, followed by Anna Upton. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? We hear you. Okay, great. So I, I reiterate the comments that, that Chris McVoy said, and I, I represent, um, um, several nonprofits that are part of the Hold the Line Coalition in Miami-Dade County, uh, who also worked uh, to, you know, keep sprawl from pushing out into the Bird Drive Basin and also worked on the 836 case, including Friends of the Everglades and Isaac Walton League, um, among other members. Um, so, so what I'd like to say is that we know that this project hasn't been designed yet, we know that um, it's very important from the work that we did in the 836 case and critical for supplying water to a project that's actually moving forward right now in the BBC -er, um, uh, combined project of BBCW and C111. So with that, I know Miami-Dade County has put forward a letter suggesting that Bird Drive be part of that. Um, it is possible that uh, moving this forward quickly, as soon as July, potentially, if it does get included in that project, could allow us to understand what the footprint of this project is, uh, specifically. The last time the board discussed it, it was in 2012, and at that time, it was a conveyance feature, it was conceptual, it hasn't been modeled. We still don't know how the benefits from the Yellow Book will be met. And so what we're suggesting here is that you delay this, you figure out what 
is going to be done on this property before foreclosing your options. Based on what we've learned and what Chris McVoy, as well as Tom Van Lent modeled and studied, we've discovered that this is a critical piece that it needs to be looked at and the benefits from this um, have not yet been met. And it's not clear whether the conveyance feature from 2012 will meet those benefits. So I urge the board and the staff to really ensure that you're meeting those benefits, that you know whether this is part of BBC -er or not, and then revisit this issue and make sure that you're not foreclosing your options. After all, this is filling wetlands um, and it's important to ensure that you're not, um, you're not keeping a flowage equalization basin from happening. Um, the, the aquifer recharge here is critical to Miami-Dade County's consumptive use permit, and we're also considering uh, a seepage barrier as well. So this property may be much more important than originally thought of. Um, and so I encourage you to look at all of that uh, and, and make sure that uh, permitting this does not have any impact. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Anna Upton, you're recognized for public comment on the acquisition of land interest item. Good afternoon, this is Anna Upton. I'm here on behalf of the Everglades Foundation. Um, while the agenda item is framed in terms of a land acquisition, what is actually happening here is iHeartMedia is seeking to construct and install up to four antenna masts and other improvements, including access roads on land that was purchased for a CERP project with taxpayer dollars. Prior boards have entered into agreements that allowed SERP lands to be encumbered with restrictions and limitations that were not always in the best interest of the district. Uh, this board knows that all too well because it's one of the first things that you had to tackle after being appointed and unwinding a prior bad contract that was entered into. So we wanna make sure that we don't go down the same road here. The Everglades Foundation is asking that a vote on this item be deferred to ensure that the appropriate protections are included in the written agreement. So it's clear that if the presence of any of the improvements that are done on the district owned SERP project lands are later determined to be inconsistent with the SERP project, or would result in an increased cost to build around them, that the district could require removal of any improvement at iHeartMedia's expense. I have reviewed the over 70 page document that includes the, uh, agree the agreement and its exhibits that include the easement terms. The last version of the agreement that I saw does not do that. It speaks to modification of the improvements. It doesn't specifically require removal. There's also language in a couple sections that are inconsistent and create ambiguities and opportunities for future litigation that are not in the, in the district's best interest. In particular, there is language in there the district conveys and grants to iHeartMedia, quiet and peaceful possession, use, and enjoyment of the easement areas, and grants free unencumbered access to the antenna tract with the ax with via the access track seven days a week, 24 hours a day, without exceptions. The district includes land, uh, language in there that allows it to flow water, but it's seemingly inconsistent with its ability to provide access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and yet flow water entirely over the property. So we're asking that uh, this item be deferred for a vote. I think the land acquisition that's being proposed in exchange for the easement is not worth accepting limitations on how and when the district is able to use this property when it so desires for a future SERP project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Upton. Next, we have Paul Schweit for item number 28. Uh, uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you for an opportunity to speak to this item. It's, it's an important item, and now, I understand and I appreciate the district's efforts to acquire land in the Biscayne Bay coastal wetlands. That's an important project. I just suggest that uh, the district here is giving away more than it should uh, to get what uh, to get what it's getting. I represented Michelle Garcia and Tropical Audubon in the recent and successful challenge uh, against Miami-Dade County's 
uh, comprehensive plan amendment to allow the extension of State Road 836 across uh, this area, the Bird Drive Recharge area. And, and during that trial, I, I submitted written comments, by the way, to you all about this. And I cited in the transcript where the county uh, cited exactly this radio antenna project as, as evidence that the district had really moved on from any plans to utilize the Bird Drive Recharge area as part of SERP. The county argued this project's not consistent uh, with utilizing the bird drive recharge area for SERP. And, and they took that position because it's true. Uh, th th this project as it's currently proposed because it allows construction of private drives and culverts and other systems for drainage and flow of water for vehicular and pedestrian access uh, would foreclose at least some of what you could do in the bird drive recharge area under SERP. So uh, approving it at this stage uh, limits what the district could do in this area where the district's already made otherwise huge investments. Once you build a road and Dr. McBoy uh, spoke to this, once you build a road, whether it's a six lane highway or an access road, you're, you're automatically limiting your water storage capability. So at a minimum, uh, we would suggest that the, the district defer the item, uh, that uh, if, you, if you decide to move forward, that you include language that would make clear that uh, any easement granted uh, isn't precedent for any other roads through the area, that any roads be bridged so that you can maintain, store uh, water uh, at levels that have been considered in the past. And, and by the way, it's, it's uh, worth noting, because uh, the district should think about it, this area has uh, just been listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service for designation as critical habitat for the bonneted bat. That's, that's new, uh, but you know, it just uh, speaks to how uh, there's a lot happening in this area right now. And once you approve this easement, you have limited what you can do on the property in the future. And uh, <clears throat> I just think you, should move more slowly before you do that. Thank you so much for your time and for considering these comments. Mr. Chairman, could I ask Paul a question? Yes. Paul, are you still there? Yes, I am. Hi, this is a, a Charlie Martinez, board member uh, Martinez. Paul, where are where are we um, as far as the that ongoing litigation with Day County due to the A36? Yeah, th that's th the next step. Yeah, the short answer is we did get a recommended order from an administrative law <laughs> judge that found the, the proposed comprehensive plan amendment was not yes. consistent. Uh, the county has filed exceptions, uh, about 100 pages of exceptions uh, to the recommended order. Uh, by the way, Tropical Audubon, we filed some very limited exceptions, still asking the governor and cabinet to affirm the, the ruling uh, and conclude that it's not a consistent project. And then those will go before the governor and cabinet at some point. We're still in the briefing process, uh, Mr. Martinez. Okay, okay, thank you. And congratulations on, on your work. <laughs> well, it's, it's tentative, but we're hopeful. Thank you. The next public comment on item 28 is Diana Umpieri, followed by Doug Gaston. Hi, hi. You hear me okay? I hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, so this is uh, Diana Pierre uh, represent, representing Sierra Club. And um, we just, you know, I think um, the people before me articulated really well from the science perspective, all the various reasons why um, um, we need you to, uh, I'm sorry, I have a dog that's calling for attention. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, on our end, we really, we want you to vote no. Um, I, and I think one of the really big reasons is that, you know, we look at this area as an area that we want to restore. Um, we have, you know, for a very long time, um, you know, restrictions have been put on the urban, the urban development boundary so that we can in fact have this important buffer, um, which is not only important for the Everglades, but it's equally important for wildlife habitats. Um, I sent, and I don't know if Rosie got it or not, um, but because the, uh, the federal um, register just sent a notice yesterday on the proposed critical habitat for the, I'm sorry, my dog, <laughs> for the Florida bonnet uh, bat, um, we got the GIS files. I 
did did a map real quick, which I uh, forwarded to all the governing board members and um, to Rosie. And again, I don't know if you're able to show that or not to them, uh, but I want you just to see that in fact, um, this proposed area, which is based on, you know, as you know, critical habitat um, designations are pretty hard to get and they're based on a lot of good scientific data to prove that an endangered species um, really needs uh, that level of protection. And uh, in that area where this is being proposed is right smack where, um, where this proposed habitat will be. Um, so uh, there's just no way that um, we, can, we can support. Um, we certainly support getting land for, um, you know, the, for the, um, for the Biscayne um, Bay Coastal Wetlands Preserve, and I hope that some other kind of um, deal can be made with the with our heart media for that. Uh, but we are adamantly opposed to having this area be used for that. And um, thank you for your comment. And again, I hope you vote now on item 28. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sampieri. Next, we have Doug Gaston. Can you hear me? I hear you, Mr. Gaston. Great. Uh, Doug Gaston, Audubon, Florida. Good afternoon, Chairman Goss, board members. Uh, we have a number of concerns similar to some of the ones that have been expressed already about this project, uh, specifically whether locking into a perpetual easement today when the restoration project contemplated for the property hasn't been designed yet, whether that's prudent, uh, and whether the agreement provides the district with all the flexibility it needs to accommodate uh, project design and changes from the yellow book plan that are inevitable and uh, often significant. Uh, but on a different point, South Florida is an important corridor and stopover for migratory birds. And uh, it's inevitable that a cluster of 300 foot towers and guy wires and facilities uh, are likely to be a major obstacle for migrant uh, birds flying in and out of the area, and injuries and deaths are likely a result. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recognized this threat in their 2016 recommended best practices for communications tower siting, uh, stating that the communications towers are some of the tallest structures across the landscape, and birds are regular, regularly found dead uh, around these towers. Uh, and there was a 2012 study prepared for Palm Beach County in connection with the Sugarland Wind Project that detected between 80,000 and 340,000 targets uh, flying by at less than 300 feet in height uh, during the sampling period. So it, it stands to reason that low level flights would be as common around the bird drive area and that the towers uh, have uh, potentially severe impacts to migratory and other bird species, some of which may be endangered or threatened. Uh, on that point, uh, a 2018 public notice of permit application for towers in this uh, area the Corps determined that uh, the proposed project has the potential to affect the Florida bonneted bat, which has been mentioned, uh, the eastern indigo snake, wood stores, Everglades snail kite, Florida panthers, and the American crocodile. So while complying with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service best practices is a good start, uh, this project really begs a bigger question. And that relates back to yesterday's land management workshop. And, and that's whether projects of this type on district property intended for restoration projects are really compatible with the district's mission uh, to safeguard and restore our water resources and ecosystems. Uh, and that includes migratory birds, resident birds, and, and wildlife. Uh, so, you know, even with best practices, mortality will occur uh, once these towers are constructed and uh, post-construction monitoring and reporting won't change that. And even though the area is dominated by Malaluka, or however you say that, it's still a wetland habitat that provides a resting place that contains forage, the tired migratory birds we use during their stopover. So we believe it would be prudent to take a step back, consider the larger policy concern, not whether we can do this, but whether we should do this. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gaston. The next public comment on the acquisition of land interest item is Nyla Pipes, followed by Stephen Green. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. So Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands is one of those projects that, um, quite frankly, often sort of takes a back burner to so many other Ever Everglades restoration projects. 
and it's a really important project and it's one that we need to make sure we don't see any delays in. And, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about, um, you know, us not having everything designed and all of that. But the thing is, is it's really hard to design a project when you don't have the land acquired. And I just caution that we don't necessarily tap the brakes based upon some rather vague what ifs, because that's a part of the planning to begin with. Um, you know, we don't want to get bogged down in imminent domain later on. Uh, land acquisition is always hard. And use of land, you know, deciding on those uses, that's always difficult too. Um, you know, I'm in support. Let's move forward. Let's quit with the delays. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Stephen Green, you're recognized. My name is Stephen Green. Um, I am a professor emeritus of biology at the University of Miami. And my specialty in that is conservation planning. Um, uh, I'm also here representing the Tropical Fruit Growers of South Florida, which is a nonprofit association of farmers in, uh, in Miami-Dade County and, and beyond. Uh, and they have taken a position with respect to uh, the ex uh, extension of 836, but have not specifically reviewed um, this acquisition item. Um, based on my experience in helping to plan and design national parks and wildlife reserves in India and East Africa and Uganda and West Africa and Sierra Leone, one of the, one of the key features in any such planning is to look carefully at any positions that you may take with regard to land use that could immutably change things so they couldn't be reversed in the future. That seems to be the case should this acquisition go through as stated. Not only that, we don't know exactly what changes are there. We're talking about balancing as we do in all such procedures as the, as the acquisition in front of you, balancing costs and, 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 uh, and benefits or risks and benefits. In this case, the benefits appear to be uncertain with respect to uh, uh, particularly with uh, uh, um, water uh, and uh, water retention and, uh, and uh, uh, drinking water safety issues. And, they appear, and the risks appear to be completely unknown and undefined because there is no study uh, regarding any impacts on wildlife. Both of those unknown risks and unknown benefits are in large part because we don't have any details of exactly what would occur. So therefore, as a professional in the area of land use planning, particularly for conservation purposes, and that's what's involved here, conservation from water and conservation of wildlife, is that I urge you to defer until we have the details, do not write a blank check. Thank you. Thank you. The next public speaker for item 28 is Lisa Enterlandy, followed by Michael Collins. Hi, uh, this is Lisa Enterlandy with the Everglades Law Center. I, uh, we wanted to join those that are expressing concerns about this item moving forward. I'm actually surprised to hear anyone suggesting that we would ignore those concerns or that doing so would be a benefit. This is a uh, relatively controversial item because you are allowing infrastructure to be built on a surf restoration footprint, which is really not a precedent that we support setting. Um, you know, and with this project, like has been said, the final form and configuration of the project is not known. So we just don't know exactly how it will impact the final project. I think in general, we'd rather see the district acquiring lands directly, uh, the lands that are needed for restoration directly, rather than compromising restoration projects by allowing development within project footprints in exchange for project lands. And I do know, I'm aware that some language was put into the agreement to protect the district's interests. However, the language that we reviewed did not seem as strong as we would like to see in terms of uh, protecting the restoration lands and allowing them to be used for their needed purposes. Now, as to the process, we were told that changes were made to this agreement as late as yesterday. I have not seen those changes and they were not provided for our review. And I just know that with the pride that this board and agency takes in terms of transparency and public participation, it does not feel like this item is ready for final board consideration. So we would request that you please uh, consider this item as a briefing today. Take the concerns that have been raised under consideration. 
direct your staff to go back and ensure that these comments and concerns are addressed and bring the final item back for public review and for board review for consideration at a later date. We thank you so much for your consideration of our comments. Thank you, Ms. Interlandy. Uh, the next public commenter on item 28 is Michael Collins, followed by Caroline McLaughlin. Hey there. This one's been a lot of fun for the last 25 years or so. Um, and I, I feel obliged to correct some of the uh, public record. Um, this project did not advance to the planning stages, largely because when the initial, uh, you know, studies were done, it basically was concluded by the district that at that time, uh, by that board who are not the people that they're being accused of being, um, that there were sufficient number of impediments to using this in the way the yellow book had anticipated that it would be better to proceed in different places. Now, there's been all sorts of litigation. The district got beat up on a couple of inverse condemnation cases. Um, and what you're looking at is a dynamic tension between those who believe truly that every single square inch of it is valuable and none of it should be given up. And other people who are trying to find a way that some of the land could be used for other purposes. But some of the reasons it wasn't approved is it's in the wrong location. It's on the wrong side of Chrome Avenue. If you're going to use it for storage, you're going to have to figure out what you're store, you know, you're flowing the water to. And there's a large amount of property that doesn't belong to the district that may be impacted. Um, it was decided to put the flowage down the west side of the highway for, for a variety of reasons. Um, there's also the question of, of uh, the substrate is extremely permeable. It's not a great place to put a reservoir. Um, and the decision was made at, at some point in the past, at least actually, actually probably in two or three times, to, to get rid of the project and transfer the funds to lands that are more critically needed for the Biscayne Bay project and Florida Bay projects. Um, district hasn't been able to achieve that. But I do believe the policy adopted was that if any land was, was, was to be transferred, any of the funding that was received would have to be spent down in that basin, preserving and protecting Biscayne Bay and Florida Bay. And I happen to be one of the people that thought that was a reasonable thing to do. So if you're going to take a look at this, I would suggest you look at the entire picture, not just is this valuable to birds, every square inch out there is valuable to some birds. Um, look at the balance and think about where you're going to get the money you're going to need for Biscayne Bay and Florida Bay improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Collins. Next, we have Caroline McLaughlin. Good afternoon. Caroline McLaughlin on behalf of the National Parks Conservation Association. Um, in accordance with uh, comments you've heard before, we'd like to ask that a vote on this item be deferred to a later date. Um, we have some concerns about this agreement and about its potential to impact our ability to implement restoration projects and flow water in this area in the future. Uh, we're concerned that in the future, if these structures are determined to be inconsistent with SERP and do prove to be an impediment to restoration, that there are no clear provisions that would require their removal at the company's expense. Um, as Lisa Interlandy just mentioned, I believe the agreement language was updated as recently as yesterday. Um, so I'd really like to encourage you to defer this item to a later date, um, allow the public time to review the updated terms of the agreement, and take some additional time to ensure the agreement does not jeopardize our future ability to proceed with critical Everglades restoration projects. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. The next two public speakers for item 28 is Adrian Barman, and then she's going to be followed by Eve Samples. Hello, do you hear me? I hear you, Ms. Barman. Thank you. My name is Adrian Barman, and I'm from the Broward Sierra Club, and I absolutely do not support this proposal to build onto the Bird Basin area. I believe our wetlands are crucial to maintain and to recharge our aquifer. And this is all part of the SERP project. So I am against this proposal 
to build over the bird basin. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barman. Next, we have Eve Samples. Good afternoon. Thank you again for the opportunity to weigh in. We appreciate your patience, um, both the governing board and staff. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of the Everglades, which is by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And I've been rereading her autobiography lately, Voice of the River, and I can't help but uh, smile thinking about what she might say in regards to this discussion. I'll, I'll try to provide some feedback, um, I'm sure much less articulately than she would have. I just want to echo all the those who spoke before me urging the governing board to hit the brakes on this. I think it boils down to the fact that this cell tower installation proposed by iHeartMedia would be located in the SERP footprint on land that was acquired for restoration purposes. It's as simple for that. There are questions about whether this proposed installation would be an impediment, and there are too many questions to proceed today. I'll stop my comments there and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Samples. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any additional hands raised. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rosie, and thank you to all our commenters. Those are helpful. Uh, I'd like to hear from the governing board. Mr. Martinez, your hand is still raised. I don't know if that's from last time or if you'd like to speak again. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, thank you. That's, I, I re-raised it. I put it down and then I raised it again. Um, anyways, thank you for that. Um, uh, to Stephen, and I don't know if this is to Stephen or um, somebody else in staff, when, um, when did we make the, the agreement, the actual easement agreement um, available to the public, number one? Number two, I've heard a couple of times that there were some changes made uh, as late as yesterday or the day before, uh, and, and can you comment on that? Sure. Hey, uh, Mr. Martinez, this is Drew. Um, basically, as soon as we published the agenda seven days ago, we got requests for the easement and we immediately provided it to those that were interested. Um, and then we started hearing concerns about strengthening the language uh, to make sure that whatever adjustments needed to be made to accommodate SERP were um, on iHeartMedia's uh, dime. And so we uh, engaged iHeartMedia uh, talked about it, um, came up with some new language. Um, but the agreement is not in a final form by any means because uh, this agenda item was teed up as the governing board giving us authorization to move forward. Um, but it, it, it wasn't necessarily moving forward with something that was drafted. Um, certainly we would we are completely open to sharing whatever agreement we end up with or you know may forge forward after this board meeting with anyone who is interested in the public because these are public lands. Okay, and Drew, is, 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 there any, is there any reason or is there any factor out there that makes this uh, an extremely time sensitive item? <clears throat> I wouldn't say extremely time sensitive. There is timing associated with it. Um, we, the core is ready to move forward with Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands construction for phase one um, for that southern part of, BB, of Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands. They have, we are able to certify the land they need to move forward this summer with what they want to move <coughs> forward with, but they have said that we, they don't need these parcels uh, that we're talking about today until next calendar year, or maybe it's next fiscal year. Okay, it, so then you, okay, so, so you, answer, is, you, you, answer, you answer my, my next, my next question then. Well, there was and Jennifer, that was, you might have better detail. Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. It, it is next calendar year. We would need to certify these lands by the March or April timeframe of 2021 calendar year in order to keep the project on track. Okay, um, and Drew, um, let's assume, let's assume this, that the iHeart radio antenna never even came into the picture um, and we would have identified these lands as, as uh, needed <clears throat> to the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project, which 
um, as everybody knows, it's it's a um, it's a big priority uh, for me and for uh, especially anybody down here in Dade County. Um, how would we have how would we have gone about to acquire those lands if this um, item or this if I heard radio hadn't come to us and to do the swap? Would we have just simply gone out and buy it? Uh, that's correct. So that, that it would be just a traditional land acquisition where we would have to use funds either appropriated by the state or collected by the district to acquire the lands. And of course, we have, you know, land acquisition priorities across the district. So it's not like the money just materialized. It would have to be a board decision to use the money for these project lands. Okay. So, um, Mr. Chairman, um, so based on that, um, based on the fact that um, we did make some changes to this agreement, I understand that it's not final, and 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 I applaud Drew and staff for uh, working with the interested stakeholders uh, that required the changes. At the end of the day, um, there were changes made, um, and and I don't think it's fair um, for all this for all these stakeholders um, uh, that haven't really had the chance uh, to maybe look at those changes and and go back to iHeartRadio um, uh, on our behalf and ask for maybe clarification or modifications to that agreement. Um, there's just too many ifs. Um, to me, what was a driving factor here is that we were getting the 80 some odd acres down for Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands uh, because that's very important. But, but the two are not mutually exclusive because uh, we know that uh, without one, we can do the other. Um, and so based on that, I'd, I'd like to um, ask with all due respect to all my board members and after I hear from them uh, that we table this, this uh, item uh, and give a chance to iHeartRadio to go and meet with um, some of these other, some of these groups that have spoken out today, uh, which there's quite a few of them. Um, and hopefully they can have a meeting of the minds and, uh, and then it can come back to us in the near future. Um, but there's just too many ifs. And by the way, the, the, another big if was the one brought up that there is litigation going on uh, with Dade County uh, in reference to the 836 uh, Expressway, which is, which is another uh, reason why um, maybe we need to let this thing play out a little bit. Um, Mr. Martinez, thank you uh, very much for your comments. And I will certainly give deference to you as the uh, as a Miami-Dade member. This is in your backyard and I, this has been a project you care a lot about. Um, I, I heard some things in this conversation which I, I need to be more comfortable with. So I, I think that we're probably on the same page and this is not gonna go forward today. Um, the question, one of the questions I have, and then I'll turn to the other board members and, and perhaps Stephen, you can help me with this quickly is this, this is conservation land or, or restoration land. And is, do we have a precedent? Have we put um, other infrastructure on those lands in the past, or would this be a precedent? Uh, the short answer is I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I, I'd like to find, I, again, I, we're, we're probably not I mean, going I, anywhere today. I think there is, um, isn't there some sort of uh, power line rerouting out of Everglades National Park that goes through restoration lands that is um, ongoing? I don't know whether John or Stephen knows that. You're, you're, you're correct, Drew. There's a FPL transmission line that's being rerouted out of Everglades National Park and it'll tra traverse through the Bird Drive Basin on its way north. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's go to um, Mr. Steinle. No, Mr. Chair, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to take uh, um, the opportunity away from other board members to, to speak, but um, I think, I, think uh, I, would, I would expect that we're all in agreement. Can I make a motion to, to defer uh, this, this item? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you're, you make a motion, we'll get a second, and then let's have some, I'll, I'll give, have a discussion period so um, other people can have a chance to say what what's on their mind. So I, so I make that motion. And we have a motion to defer to a later time and a second. Um, so we're going to go to discussion now of that. Um, Mr. Steinle, do you have anything else you'd like to say on that? No. Okay. Mr. Olipich? 
Thank you. I just want to thank everybody who came to speak, especially um, the renowned Christopher W. McVoy, author of Landscapes and Hydrology of the pre drainage Everglades, uh, and also um, Dr. Stephen Green. Uh, I think that lends itself to the importance of this issue. I had a negative reaction to it when I originally was presented with it, but did not know enough about it. So to hear everybody's voices and the importance of that um, verifies that having giant cell towers in the middle of something that is supposed to be, uh, you know, restoration lands just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olipich. Mr. Bergeron. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> No, I, I see a, an awful lot of concerns by all of the stakeholders and uh, I kind of, I, I think we should try to defer this and, uh, and study it some more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to also echo uh, some comments by Board Member Martinez, um, when I first was appointed, I uh, received several phone calls about the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project and how it had taken for a variety of different circumstances and reasons or whatever it may be, um, sort of a backseat and had at times been um, long forgotten, if not completely forgotten. Um, but people who were calling were imploring to me how critical it was and how as a, as a Miami Dade um, board member, uh, it should be top of mind and, and pressed when possible to the forefront um, for the health of Biscayne Bay and Florida Bay. Um, it's in that regard that I uh, elevated in my mind um, the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project and also did some research with respect to this particular issue as it related to the Bird Drive Basin. Um, and, and from what I had understood, and this may not be completely true or, or maybe totally true, um, was that the Bird Drive Basin from a viability standpoint over time despite its original inclusion in the yellow book and the SERP um, projects had sort of either diminished or had been put a little further down on the totem pole in terms of uh, best bang for our buck, so to speak, and, and where projects would be uh, best used. And in fact, I was guided to some documentation that suggested that there may be a, um, there may have been some effort to sort of transfer what had been looked at in Bird Drive Basin over to Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay. And so with that in mind, the acquisition of 83 acres, uh, which I understand has a seven figure value in the Bis inside what is, you know, has been sort of a forgotten Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetland project, at least in some regard, was originally um, a good thing to me and, and something I thought uh, on balance had a lot of value to us and would help push things forward in a way that I thought, you know, from my research was, was meaningful. Uh, that's, that's number one. Um, number two is that um, I think it's important for the public to know and for the stakeholders to know. Um, and because I have been engaged on this particular project and have some level of detail um, and knowledge with respect to it, that the district is not um, unaware or does not, you know, the staff in the district, I think, is without any input from anybody, keenly taking um, into consideration issues of SERP. And so for, for sure, um, when I was asking questions about this particular project being inside the SERP footprint, uh, that was a very important thing, not only to me, but it was an important thing to ev from every staff member that I spoke to with respect to this project. And so it's not like 
SERP is, is going to be or has been in any conversation that I have had, not really been front and center uh, in all of our conversations. And I think it's, um, that being said, I do think it's important and I think it will be increasingly important, not just on this particular issue, but on every issue that really comes before the governing board for people who are applying or making application or, or seeking to do something uh, to do more than simply engage with staff at the district or, or governing board members at the district, but to also reach out proactively and engage uh, environmental groups and stakeholders who have a vested interest and concern about any sort of project that might take place inside a SERP footprint or have some sort of environmentally potentially adverse impact so that everybody can feel comfortable uh, that they've been engaged and, and, and they are up on the issues. And that's not to say that everybody will ultimately agree with one another. I know for sure that that's probably not gonna be the case most of the time, but I do want and expect, I think, for people who are seeking to do things to engage folks who obviously have a concern about where these things are going on. And so with that being said, um, I think it's important to note that the change, as I understand it, the changes that have taken place relatively recently, um, which I agree should be, you know, looked at and, and the language should be, um, uh, should protect the district and, and, and future CERC projects. But I also think it's important to note that the language that's been sort of tinkered in the last couple of days, as far as I understand it, was language that was being tinkered because of the feedback that we received from some of the stakeholders who thought the language was not tight enough and needed to be tighter. So it, it is moving, as far as I understand it, in the direction of the people voicing concern today vis-a-vis -vis this particular project. And from what I understand, and I think it's important to have this kind of direction in there, um, to the extent that somehow, some way, the, the, the SERP footprint project that was proposed here, in fact, um, ultimately um, rears its head again or becomes viable or is viable or something that's given a green light, that we do have protectionary language in there that fully protects the district and puts the onus on iHeart uh, Radio to you know, remove at their cost or modify or whatever it may be. Uh, the equipment that's there and the access that's there. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I am in favor. I mean, I know this is sort of a long way around to it. I'm, I'm certainly in favor of a deferral so that um, the groups can get together and have a conversation and, and perhaps, you know, mutually collaborate on, on language that people are comfortable with. Um, but I also, I'm also cognizant of the fact, and this will be my last point, but I think it's an important point that may have been lost in, in some of this. You know, the, the iHeart radio people, this is, they, they didn't show up uh, yesterday, so to speak. Um, their contract to acquire and, and to do this had been previously approved by the district uh, several years ago, uh, as I, I understand that. And um, through a series of events that had some sort of condition to do with the Miami-Dade County uh, Commission, that they needed to get something from them. And ultimately it sort of got kicked down the road by the commission and suddenly they found themselves where they once were inside an approved contract already by the district for this location. They found themselves out of contract by time. And so they came back once they got what they needed from a third party to say to us, okay, I'm ready to sign the exact same contract that you approved several years ago because they were out of contract and and then suddenly um you know all these issues cropped up with respect to bringing it back before the board and so i do have some level of empathy out there for people who from re regardless of what category of business or interest or stakeholder position that they have um to get jam jammed up inside um you know a governmental agency in perpetuity um, you know, really is, is, 
is troubling to me as well. And, and I don't, you know, I don't want to be in some, one of these quagmires all the time for people who can't get, the, we can't get out of the agency because we're being either inefficient or whatnot. I don't necessarily think that's going on here. And it's, there's a variety of different issues that are, um, you know, precipitating where we're at. And I certainly support um, people being engaged and, and having meaningful conversations with one another. So I am in support of the deferral, but I just wanted to give because I felt like I had a couple more granular details about the, the, the way this went down and, and how this is all going. Um, I just wanted to put that on the, on the table for my fellow board members. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Wagner. Uh, Colonel Rum. Yes, th yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I really appreciate uh, the comments that Mr. Martinez and Vice Chair Wagner added to this discussion, along with uh, the public comments uh, related uh, to this, this discussion as well. I, I think in light of um, everything that's been said, I'll, uh, I would definitely support a deferral so that um, everyone feels comfortable with, with the uh, way ahead. Uh, I want to also uh, lend my support, though, for the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands uh, project as well. And I, I think there's a fine balance there in, in how we proceed. And maybe in, we need to have a discussion separate from this on what our policy may be going forward on uh, doing leases and other types of things inside a, a SERP footprint. Because in some cases, you know, we've got 10, 20 years before that project uh, gets underway. Um, and it might be a discussion worth having. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Roman. Uh, Mr. Butler. Ben, I see you're unmuted, but I'm having a tough time hearing you. Oh, yep. Okay. I had my safety trigger on. There you go. Check that off. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll back up again. Uh, I want to echo um, some of Ms. Roman's comments and, uh, of course, Mr. Wagner's comments. Um, uh, the uh, oh, I'm catching train of thought there. I was on a roll without <laughs> y'all hearing me. Um, the... Uh, uh, I, I want one of the things that um, I, I want to I want to thank staff for uh, bringing a creative solution to us. Um, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want depending on how this issue, this particular item ends up, I, I don't want to prevent any other type of creative type things because, you know, in reality, this was this was a way for uh, for us to, to gain partials and uh, with with no cash exchange. And um, granted, there are a lot of other issues that, uh, that that a lot of stakeholders have brought up that 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 this deal may not be may not be feasible. But uh, but I want to I want to encourage staff and and of course everybody else. Let's don't be scared of looking at creative fixes to um, to some of our uh, to, to to restoration. Um, with that, have we? Um, I didn't hear any comments from my heart media. Um, in the public comment period, it, do we have anybody here from My Heart Media that uh, maybe could speak? Yeah, they are live and they they can unmute, so they are available. If you'd like to hear from them, I, I would. If, if if there's somebody if, if there's somebody here, just to give, give them the opportunity to to have it be part of the discussion. I see there's three of you, Miss Edwards. Are you interested in? There you go. Mr. Chairman, I see that Alec Bassetta is unmuted. Mr. Bassetta, would you like to speak? Yeah, you're, you're, we're looking for someone from iHeartMedia and I'll recognize anyone. Ms. Edwards Walpole. Are you able to speak? I see that your mic is now unmuted. Uh, 
This is Randy Mullinax. I'll be happy uh, to provide any type of technical information that you want. Uh, I am primarily an engineer and not involved in the real estate aspects of the deal. Oh, th thank you, Randy. Uh, Mr. Butler, do you have specific questions? No, I didn't have any specific questions. I just, we, we were doing a lot of talk about I Heart Media and just didn't know if they uh, wanted to provide some, some comments here. I know if we were having this discussion live that they would probably be standing there next to the podium and we could call them up. But I uh, just didn't know if there was anybody here that, uh, that maybe would like to offer some discussion from them. All right, is, is Ms. Edwards, are you available? All right, so Mr. Mr. Butler, Chairman, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We do have, um, I believe, a representative calling in with the last four digits of 8574. At the press yeah. star six to unmute. Yeah, it looks like they're unmuted. If, if that person would like to introduce themselves and speak, they're more than welcome. Hi, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Very good, thank you. We have been trying at this for a few moments. Um, Mr. Chairman, this is Katie Edwards Walpole on behalf of Bird Drive Mitigation and uh, for iHeartMedia. Uh, I really, really appreciate the comments today. Um, I will tell you as a, a former lawmaker, the types of issues that have been brought up, I am sitting here nodding my head in agreement. And if I were able to be there, I would be happy to jump up and go to the podium. I've got a, a running list to address many of the, the very valid concerns that have been brought up. Um, one of the, the points that was raised earlier uh, you know, talking about the longevity of this project. Um, I have aged tremendously. I've gotten married. I've had a kid since I first began working with the district. We've been through many real estate directors, uh, a very new good governing board uh, since then. But we began this discussion with the district back in 2015. The original exchange agreement was approved in 2017. And part of the reason that we're back here today that exchange agreement included these conditions to close on the underlying real estate transaction. And part of that was allowing iHeart to continue getting permits so that we could gauge whether the site was viable, be responsive to concerns from both Fish and Wildlife, the core, Miami-Dade Derm, DEP, and uh, you know, be at a point where once we had the permits in place, we would then proceed to closing. And as many of you know, having been involved on the district board, you know that, that projects take a long time to scope and get permitted. And so here we are today without those, uh, some of those permits in place, and we agreed to waive those conditions that we had asked for because it was important to us to get the district the land it needed, the 83 acres uh, for Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, so it would be able to certify those lands and, and proceed to close with that. So that was the, the underlying reason for, for the exchange agreement. One of the benefits though, um, in, in waiting and taking our time uh, to close, we've worked with staff and staff had recognized that we needed to make modifications to the site plan. And I will tell you, I know a lot of the, the environmental groups and friends that I have heard from today uh, I was just as appalled as you were to hear uh, Miami-Dade County use uh, this to say that somehow the district had retreated and had given up on uh, CERP projects in, in, this, in this area. Um, our experience has been anything but that. And the, the site plan changes that we have gone through over the years have always anticipated that at some point we the public, and I say we collectively, the district, because this project would benefit the entire region as a whole, how could we design something that would both provide, and remember, WIOD as a, as a public broadcast emergency network providing that public benefit and service, how could we provide for uh, that project and still design the 
site in such a way where the district, regardless of whatever changes in modeling or the yellow book may come down the road, we would be able to allow for flowage, for inundation on the site. We would be able to go in there and address a critical need um, for the control of invasives and exotics. I know, you know, keeping the, the budget for invasives low is important. We talked about that yesterday in the workshop. Uh, trying to, you know, rehabilitate what was a degraded area of wetlands to make sure that it can be rehabilitated, provide a better foraging nesting area, and a, a whole gamut of, of things that we have done proactively and in response to the very valid concerns of a number of, of state, federal, and local agencies to deal with the wading bird populations. I will tell you, you had some speakers that talked about the importance of this, and, and, and Doug, uh, I know from Audubon, we were exchanging some emails back and forth this morning. Doug, I have become somewhat of an aviation, a bird BMP aficionado because I have learned, you referenced one of the reports, and I'm learning from iHeart's radio engineers, futuristically thinking how we design towers that mitigate those impacts and then taking it a step forward, once the tower is constructed, how we monitor to give better information to the various permitting agencies feeding information both to Fish and Wildlife and to the FCC so that these projects can be modeled and designed better. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about those really valid concerns and how to address them. It's aggravating when people diminish the role of Bird Drive Basin, and I want to make sure, you know, we, we respect the 836 project and, and keep that somewhat siloed and separate because I don't think that our project is of that scope and I don't think that the designers and the folks that were pushing for that comp plan amendment have taken the amount of time and approach that we have with this facility to anticipate that the district may have a need and it may at some point may want to deal with the canal which we have uh, the easement for out in Bird Drive Basin. So it was really important to us to make sure that, let's say, access to the radio tower site is severed because the district wants to take advantage of the potential for that north-south conveyance canal in Bird Drive Basin. iHeart on its own dime would have to go through that same process to get a right-of-way permit to construct a canal crossing again at its own cost. We don't stand in a position to inhibit projects. In fact, we try to design locations for culverts, sizes, to think of every feasible way that we can continue to exist with something that has not yet been designed, scoped, et cetera. So it's been a really interesting challenge, but nonetheless, I'm so happy that today, after five years, all of the constructive criticism and the issues that have been raised are things that we have been working towards. And when this project came up before the previous board um, back in 2017, you know, we've had public meetings through the public and land team. I know a lot of folks that are in the audience and that spoke today, um, you were there. And the same deal with 2017. In fact, um, you can go back and look and see, but Audubon of Florida, I was presently surprised. I didn't ask anybody to get up and speak, but they did, and they were supportive of the concept and what we were trying to do. Um, and so I get, you know, it's three years later. We've been at this an awful long time. Um, if the board chooses to defer, I commit to getting back together with all of the various stakeholder groups and with staff to really dig deep and walk through how this project um, will work and, and take into account various feedback and see how we can respond accordingly. But I just, I wanted to really thank staff because over the years, um, like through Matt Morrison's team with Federal Affairs, through Stephen's team, working through the real estate contract language to make sure that everything is, is very pro-district, pro-SERP to anticipate, again, every possible issue that may come up as speculative or as remote as it may seem. So I don't want the public to think that um, that staff has not been uh, proactive or responsive. I, I think we're all in the same wavelength. We just did not do a really good job at coming back and communicating better on all of the wonderful benefits and the things that we've done 
to address a lot of the concerns, if not all, that have been raised today. So I thank you to everyone who has spoken and who has raised concerns. And um, I will tell you as a former state lawmaker, I've gotten good at, at winning people over and I hope that when this comes back next month, um, I will have won you over and it'll be you know, on the merits of this and, and hopefully we get some really good feedback and we can move this forward. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair Wagner for your remarks as well. Um, thank you, Ms. Edward Walpole. I, I really appreciate that, and I think that helps uh, put things in perspective. Uh, I understand it's uh, been a long and frustrating process, and I, my, my gut tells me we're getting close to the end. Um, I have a motion and a second on the floor to defer this, um, and I think it's part of that deferral. It's going to be an education process and maybe a, a discussion um, back and forth with some of the stakeholders and staff to make sure that everyone's uh, comfortable with this before we do bring it up for a final vote. Um, is there any further discussion by the board? I see a bunch of hands raised and I think those are from before or are they not? Um, Mr. Martinez, do you have something else you'd like to say? No, sorry, that was from before. I didn't take okay. it down. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, as I said uh, to, to you and Vice Chair Wagner, I, it's, this is your district and I'm, I'm particularly sensitive to uh, what you wanna do here. Um, Mr. Bergeron, your hand is up. Is that left over from before? Or do you have something else to say? No, that's left up from before. Great. I, I don't know if we formally need to take a vote, but I may as well. I'll take a quick roll call vote. Um, this is a, a motion and a second to defer this until a further meeting. Um, and I'll start with uh, Mr. Bergeron. All right, I'll come back to Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Butler. I agree to defer right now. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Steinley? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Thanks, sir. Um, and I vote yes. So that's a unanimous, and, and thank you all very much. Um, I think that was a really um, good discussion. It probably could have happened much quicker, but I think it was better to hear from everybody and to understand the issue better. So I appreciate that. And now let's move on to the next item, which is uh, 29 in the C44 stormwater treatment area. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and board members. Can you hear me okay? This is Alan. Yeah, hi, Alan. I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, so this next item is uh, C44 stormwater treatment area. Uh, Rosie, do I have control of the uh, the page up and down? You do, but if you need assistance, just let me know. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to go to the next page and it doesn't seem to be working. Could we go next slide? Okay, just to um, briefly summarize again, uh, the project, the C44 Reservoir and STA Complex as a whole. Uh, this project captures 65% of the basin runoff from C44 on an average annual basis. And since the C44 conveys water from the lake uh, to the St. Lucie estuary, it's also capable of intercepting those flows uh, directly from Lake Okeechobee in addition to that water. Um, the Corps of Engineers is constructing the reservoir piece of the complex and South Florida Water Management District is responsible for constructing the STA. Next slide. So the reservoir piece is 3,400 acres in size uh, with a storage volume of 50,600 acre feet, which is equivalent to 16.5 billion gallons. Uh, that's instantaneous storage. <clears throat> and the Corps' contract is well underway and they're due to complete that um, in February of 2021. Next slide. Meanwhile, the district is constructing the 6,300-acre STA site, uh, which can store another 9,500 acre feet or 3.1 billion gallons instantaneously, and also has the water quality component. Uh, once the STA cells are up and running, they will be full of vegetation and they will filter water uh, similar to our existing STAs at 1 West, uh, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. Um, as we sit here today, five of the six STA cells are complete and they have been filled and are undergoing, undergoing grow-in of that vegetation. 
85% of the canals and levees are, have been completed. The water control structures and their associated control buildings have been completed. And completion of the, uh, the last cell of the STA is due um, September of 2020. Uh, the contractor has put us on notice that they will request some more days due to uh, Hurricane Dorian preparation and some of the unusual rainfall that we've gotten, um, but it shouldn't push that schedule out too much more. There would just be um, uh, a couple weeks associated with each of those events at most. Next slide. And so going back in time, the original con construction contract was executed back in 2014. Unfortunately, the contract was terminated in 2018 for breach of contract, and that is currently in litigation. Uh, in January of 2019, in order to complete the construction, including repairs to the prior contractor's work, uh, the go governing board authorized negotiation and execution of a new contract. That contract was executed with Bergeron, who was the second lowest responsive and responsible bidder in the original 2014 bid. And that new contract is a time and materials contract, um, which provided, uh, initially just provided the original funds left over from the first contract with Blue Goose. Um, even though at the time it was known that that remaining 25 million uh, was not going to cover all the work that was needed uh, because there were additional funds needed for repair work. This proposed action uh, before you today makes no changes to that contract. Next slide. And so the re replacement contractor's cost loaded schedule um, underwent ex extensive vetting to verify appropriate level or, or pr appropriate pricing and level of effort. Um, we've got heavy construction specialist software uh, that the district is using to provide highly detailed tracking of all the man hours, all the equipment hours, um, all the logging of all the activities that are going, out, going on out there at the site, uh, just to make sure that uh, there's no equipment time, man hours, et cetera, being wasted. Um, everything out there <clears throat> is being used for a specific purpose. Uh, whether it be repairs or completion of the work that was left over from the original contract. Since the last board item um, to fully fund um, the Bergeron contract, um, there's been discovery of additional repairs and earthwork needed um, that were left over from Blue Goose, the original contractor, uh, that are necessitating um, an estimated additional $9 million to complete all of the work out there. Largely, uh, that $9 million consists of a target elevation for the various cell bottoms, cell bottoms one through six, that were chosen by Blue Goose, that instead of resulting in a balanced earthwork site, resulted in an excess. And so material has had to be um, scraped up and transported off site. And in the next slide, I'll kind of step through, kind of show in principle what that's about. Uh, next slide, please. So at the time of the original bid, the contractor was provided a range that he could choose his target elevation for the cells to be. <clears throat> and as long as um, the, the elevation selected was within that range and they hit the tolerance of that that elevation, um, you can imagine the cells need to be graded pretty flat. Uh, the flatness of the cells is what, is what um, enables the sheet flow um, through the vegetation once it's grown in and provides a really high degree of water quality that you wanna get out of an STA. And so in uh, the contractor's best interest, since it was a lump sum bid, it would have made sense for that contractor to choose a target elevation for each of the cells that overall project wide would have resulted in balanced earthwork. And so on the picture to the left, you can see a scenario where that target elevation, in other words, that flat bottom shown in the green line, that represents the cell bottom chosen. And on the left, you can see where the amount of dirt, the amount of excess dirt above that line is pretty much ballpark in line with the fill areas or the, area, the, the white areas below the green line such that if you, if you excavate that, that brown area above the green and put it into the holes in white, 
you get roughly a balanced uh, earthwork site. You don't have a need to either import nor export material. Looking over to the right, if the target elevation chosen is a little bit too low, um, then you wind up with too much brown above the green line and your holes in white will be filled in below the, below the green line and you'll still have brown material left over. And so that's an excess requiring export um, scenario. And so that's the situation that was discovered um, here at the C44 STA um, after the estimates to complete uh, for Bergeron were done. This is obviously highly exaggerated. Um, the land out there is much flatter than this, but uh, you can see those kind of hills and valleys are, are kind of exaggerated just to kind of show the point and, and display the issue at hand. And so um, that's been what has caused uh, the need for this additional money. And so next slide, Rosie, please. Uh, so the resolution for the board's consideration today is to authorize the additional funding to the contract um, with Bergeron um, which is currently estimated to be $9 million. And with that, be happy to take any questions. Um, thanks very much, Alan, for the presentation. Um, is that just cell six? The issue at hand uh, was discovered in cells three, four, five, and six. So it would, they'd all have to be readjusted? Correct. No, uh, the, the target elevations have been set and achieved um, in cells one through five already. Okay. And if you didn't do that, what would happen? I'm sorry. Alan, go, Alan, ahead. go ahead and take the technical questions. Yeah, okay. if you if you weren't to to get the exactly right, I understand you said there'd be a flow pro problem, but how much of a flow problem would it be? Okay, so there could have been a variation in the bottom elevation. In other words, there's other elevations that could have worked within the range. Um, since this elevation was selected and the control structures were selected um, in concert with them. Um, you've got to get the, uh, the cell bottoms um, correctly lined up. Otherwise, there would be conflicts with the elevations that were graded for the control structures. Um, also, target depth is important. Um, the STA cells need to operate ideally at about a foot and a half worth of depth. Um, so that's where uh, that specified range comes in. Okay. Uh, Mr. Martinez, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Alan, first of all, the cell bottom, um, did we have any problems with the cell bottom itself or was that properly done? In, in other words, is that level, because we're talking two different things. We're talking this, the, the, the cell bottom here, uh, having to be level, and then we have the target elevation. Is the cell bottom, was that properly done as far as being level? Yes, it's it's really just the target elevation that's the okay. issue. Okay, so, the so, so, so that's fine. So, and, and I think for, in order for my colleagues or, and, and maybe the people in the public to kind of visualize this better, um, let's assume that Blue Goose was still on the job. And as you mentioned earlier, in this contract, they are given enough latitude that they can pick the elevation, the final elevation of where, um, of, of where the, the, the top of the SCA is going to be so that they can balance the site. Balancing the site, and I think you explained it great with that illustration, just means you can move all the dirt around wherever you want, but when you're done, you better make sure you don't need any dirt, and you better make sure you don't have any dirt left over. And basically, that's what balancing the site means. So they were given that option. Let's assume Blue Goose, which obviously they, they picked um, a little bit lower elevation than, than would have been ideal. And so now in this case, they end up with the leftover material. Um, what would have happened in that case? They simply would have, eat, have, have had to have eaten the additional cost um, and time associated with moving that material within that lump sum fee of $100 million that they originally bid. Okay. 
and 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 again so that for for the benefit of my colleagues so that they understand some of you might be saying but wait a minute we have surplus we have surplus material that's a good thing right well the problem when you when you do earthwork jobs like this when you have surplus material you need to move that material at the time that you're done with the job in other words you can't just let it sit around and what happens is you usually don't have somebody um, waiting around that needs that dirt. And even if they do need that dirt, that dirt itself has very, very little value. The cost comes in the moving of that dirt and the heavy equipment that's necessary to do that. Um, so now let's get into the, the contract um, and this, the, 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 the contract for this job. The original contract on this job was, I believe, what, 100 million? That's correct. 100 million. And of that 100 million, we paid Blue Goose, I believe it was 75? Correct. So 75. So we had 25 left that we did not pay Blue Goose for us to give to the new contractor, which is Bergeron. And then on top of that, we had the $14 million that we approved previous to this um, last year uh, for repairs to be done. And then now we have this $9 million. Um, so more or less, I guess that the, the contract with Bergeron is somewhere right now about $47, $48 million, correct? That's correct, sir. So at the time we initially brought Bergeron on board, we had an, an estimate um, to complete uh, the project uh, from where we sat at that point in time of $39 million. Okay. So you're exactly correct with your numbers. The initial contract, we simply took the money that was left over from Blue Goose and that got them going. But even at that Alan, time, we knew Alan, that okay. we were going to need uh, the additional $14 million uh, to cover the rest of that estimate. Okay, also important, Alan, explain to us all, why is it that at the time that we uh, fired Blue Goose and we went out and we got bids from other contractors to come out and finish this job, why did we go into a time and materials contract instead of a regular lump sum contract? Hey, come in, figure what you need to finish this job and let's do a lump sum contract. It was largely based on a couple of things. Number one, just the sheer volume of unknowns that were, that were out there at the time. A new contractor um, coming into this situation isn't working with a clean site. He's got a situation where there's a litany of, of every combination you can think of, of a work that was complete, partially complete, complete then washed away um, by the fact that the previous canal banks and embankments in many cases were not stabilized with vegetation. So it would have been extremely difficult for a contractor to provide a lump sum price in a situation like that. Um, the other thing that becomes difficult in a situation like that is if you've got a set of drawings and specs that have been partially completed. Um, and again, you've got a combination of work left over and work that needs to be repaired, work that was left um, to wash out after initial completion and payment, um, you've got a very difficult situation in putting together a bid package um, that a contractor would be able to bid a lump sum on if, just as he, as he would if he was coming in brand new. And so that's why uh, the contract was um, set up on a time and materials basis. Okay. <clears throat> um, and and not Mr. only Mr. Martinez, might, might I add yes. something? This is Drew. Yes. Uh, so that decision was made before this board took over. But the, if you think about the context of when that decision was made, it was, it was right after a very high harmful algae bloom discharge year in 2018. And, you know, while we do not prefer time and materials and we don't really have those kind of contracts, the public interest in making sure this project got done in, in time, you know, as expeditiously as possible because of these discharge events that we've been experiencing 
kind of over overran those kind of those types of decisions uh, that would normally, you know, if we weren't in such a hurry, we might bid it out again and take the time to try to figure that all out. But this is one of those situations where the public interest is so strong to finish this project to be able to intercept discharges that, you know, we did what we could to respect public dollars by putting in all the mechanisms necessary to do in, you know, line by line, decimal point by decimal point oversight of time and materials to make sure we, we weren't getting taken advantage of, but at the same time get this project done. Um, and so that decision, which was before our time, really put us at the place where we are today to have this STA available, this, you know, five of the six cells available this year if we start to see discharges, um, and then all six available at the end of the wet season, possibly this year. Uh, for the for the future, so it's that's that, I just wanted to sort of point out that balance that that they found themselves in at the time. Okay, um, and 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 by the way, I I agree a hundred percent because normally, as you said, Drew, um, I would probably object ninety nine out of a hundred times if I were to ever get um, staff um, to ask me to approve an atomic materials contract. Um, but in a case like this, the option would have been number one, I don't think you're gonna get, you would have gotten too many people that would have cared to bid on this. And if they did or whoever did, the amount of contingency because of those unknowns that Alan just mentioned, the amount of contingency that they would carry on that contract would have been cost prohibitive to even go, go, go forward on this. Not only that, but I think it sets us up very nicely in our litigation with Blue Goose going forward because we're going to be able to, and again, thanks to the software, which I believe that, that Alan spoke about earlier, that allows us to track all this heavy machinery and all the earthwork and all the work being done, that it allows us to track it uh, to a detail um, that will hopefully um, make our case that much stronger when we go back to Blue Goose and, and, get, um, and get all this money back and we are made whole on this contract. So um, thank you. That's all the questions I had, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Martinez. That was helpful. It was a good discussion. Um, I, I have a question for either Alan or Jennifer and or, or maybe even Paula. And the, the question is simple. Is, is this a new contract? This is Paula. This is not a new contract. Okay. I just, I know semantics matter. Yep, so, this is not a new contract and there are zero changes made to the previous contract that was done very, very early on in 2019. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more board comment. Is there any public comment on this? Uh, yes, so far we have one hand raised for item number 29. It's Eve Samples. Ms. Samples, you're recognized to speak. Thank you again. Um, I, I just wanted to respectfully request that the governing board be as transparent as possible about governing board member Ron Bergeron's um, involvement, ownership of Bergeron land development. I fully understand that the Florida Commission on Ethics reviewed uh, his appointment to the governing board and stated that his companies won't be barred from doing business and that in this particular case, the deal was signed before he was appointed. But I just think the more you can talk about it publicly, um, the better. Um, it's, it's not just about what's a legal conflict of interest, but what might be perceived as a conflict of interest. And I didn't see any notation of this in the agenda item. I may have missed it, but wanted to get my comments on the record. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Samples. Um, Mr. Bergeron has um, stated that he will be abstaining from the vote on this item as he did on item 15 and he's also going to be abstaining from any discussion as he has been um, and that was one of the reasons I asked whether this is a new contract or not because I wanted to understand that. Um, is there any board member has any other discussion? Mr. Chairman we have one more public comment. Great. Nyla Pipes. I just wanted to thank you all for continuing to move forward as quickly as possible on this particular project. It cannot be um, stated enough how much we need this storage and this treatment in the St. Lucie Basin, uh, the C44 Basin. So thank you very much. And uh, 
you know, we'll talk about it soon, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Any more, Rosie? I do not see any additional hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Great. Um, I'm looking for a motion and a second on uh, item 29. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Charlie Martinez. I'll make a motion uh, that we approve the item as presented. I have a motion by Mr. Martinez in resolution 2020-0610. Is there a second? I'll second it. It's Jackie Thurlow Lippich. I have a motion and a second by Ms. Lippich. Um, Thurlow Lippich, um, is there any further board discussion on this item? Hearing none, I'm going to call the question. Um, Mr. Butler? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Steinley? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. I'm going to vote yes and let the record show that Mr. Bergeron is abstaining from vote on item number 29. The next item is a uh, C43 moving across the state. Good afternoon, Chairman and Governing Board members. This is Jennifer Reynolds, and I'm going to give you a short presentation on the C43 Reservoir Project. And the reason that this is coming to the Governing Board is we are requesting an exception to policy for this project only, uh, basically because of the magnitude of this project. And I'll explain um, what this exception is uh, that we're requesting. but I might need Rosie to run the slides. Okay, so I wanna remind you of the scale of this project. This project is 10,000 acres. It's going to store 170,000 acre feet of water from the Caloosahatchee Basin. And this facility spans six miles east-west and three miles north-south. The perimeter canal, is about 100 feet wide and the bottom of the embankment of the reservoir itself is about 200 feet wide. So that's nearly a football field, you know, um, that the base of this reservoir, it, the span that it is. And the reason that that's important uh, Rosie, could you just um, do the slides for me. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with them. You could go to the background, the one previous to this. Perfect. So this construction really got going on this project in 2017 with these two construction packages that are currently active for a total of nearly $600 million. And so $600 million is a really big project for us. Go to the next slide, please, Rosie. Our typical construction projects are in the $50 million to $100 million range. And our current policy limits staff to negotiate change orders on those projects to $500,000, either for a single change order or for a total cumulative total uh, for the change orders for a project. And so the exception that we're asking the board to consider will allow us to continue this project without delay. And the reason is twofold. One is because we're concerned that the current policy will cause us to delay the construction and the progress of the contractor. Because as this construction moves forward, the contractor will be doing about $500,000 worth of construction work every day, or about $10 million each month. And so the current policy would require us to stop the contractor if a change order occurs and come to the governing board and delay the contract and the construction on this project um, potentially for more than a month at a time. Uh, as we negotiate the change orders and bring them to the board. The second reason is because we already have 
a change order that needs your consideration. And Rosie, if you could go to the next slide. So let me explain this initial change order that we have on this project. When we bid the contract back in 2019, we went out to bid with um, an expedited construction contract bid. Because in January 2019, we, we wanted to expedite construction of this project in accordance with Governor DeSantis's order to move forward on Everglades construction. And so at that time, we knew that we had some site conditions on this project site that were going to need remediation. We knew about these cypress bog domes, about six of them, but we didn't know the extent of the muck that was underneath the canopies. Um, since that time, we've also identified 20 borrow pits across the site. And the reason that these have to be remediated is because they're within the footprint of that very wide base of the reservoir itself. And so in order to withstand the weight necessary to construct those very large levees that hold back the water in this reservoir, uh, the foundation has to be completely reliable and strong. And so these areas have to be remediated in order to build on top of them. At the time of bid, it would have taken us about 12 to 18 months to figure out exactly what needed to happen with these sites in order to be able to include it in the scope of the contract. Instead, we moved over and with the bid process at that time, and we've saved that time by allowing the contractor that's on site to give us a bid for that remediation work. And the bid amount for that remediation work is about $6 million. And that includes all of the remediation work that you see on this slide. So what we're asking the board to consider, and Rosie, could you go to the next slide, is a resolution that would approve the $6 million change order and also provide for $4 million worth of negotiation ability on future change orders so that we don't delay this project. So for this project only, it would be a not to exceed $10 million of change order authority um, for us to keep this project moving as we move forward with construction. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks very much. Are there any questions or actually is there any public comment? We'll start with that. No, Mr. Chairman, there are no hands that are raised for this item. Uh, thank you. Are there any board comments? I'm seeing none. I'm going to go ahead and make a motion on uh, resolution 2020-0611. And oh, hang on, Mr. Martinez, is your hand up or is that left over? Yes. Yes. Just real quick. Um, Jennifer, and again, I just want to reiterate since, since this is um, uh, an exception to our regular policy that um, you will be reporting to us on a monthly basis and giving us a, uh, a detail of any of those new change orders that, that you approve um, on the month prior to our meetings, and you'll keep that on an ongoing basis until we reach that $4 million uh, plateau. Yes, Mr. Martinez, thank you for that question. We will be providing the board um, a detail of all, of all of and any change orders that we negotiate as part of this exception, and we'll do that on a monthly basis to the board. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you for that question, Mr. Martinez. Uh, Mr. Steinle? Okay. Just quickly, Mr. Chair, it's Jay Steinle. Um, um, one of the, uh, it, you know, just, just, just as we watch um, what we approve on initial budget uh, and over time, uh, how these um, expenditures can increase, one of the questions I asked staff was, what is over time for the projects the um, the typical change order uh, impact or percentage? And I think it's between one and two percent. 
um, compared to peers or or or, or other um, uh, entities in the round three to four percent. Now, obviously, we want zero percent, and we want to even better come in below. Uh, I think that's wishful thinking. But uh, one of the things that I might suggest is, in the interest of full transparency um, with the public and around um, uh, budget uh, conservation or, or or fiduciary duty just uh, for the audit team to, to look at this more closely over time to track those uh, overages amount, overage amounts. So uh, uh, just wanted to make a comment that I, I, I expect to follow up on that. Um, that's great. Thanks, Mr. Steinle. Do you need something formal from us for the audit or is that something you can deal with? Uh, I think um, I'll discuss and get back to you if, if, uh, if we need that. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Roman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to follow up on uh, Mr. Steinley's comment, I asked uh, staff to take a look at the change order percentage uh, for CERT projects in particular uh, to kind of break those out and to see if, if they're in line with the averages or if they show something different. So I just wanted to share that with you. And um, Mr. Chair, if you need a second on this motion, I'd be happy to second it. Thank you. I will take the second and we'll continue the discussion. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Uh, uh, Colonel Reynolds, you, um, the $6 million, is, that is uh, unsuitable subsoils under the levees. And then I guess you have the cost of uh, embankment material that you'd have to excavate to replace the unsuitable and have y'all pretty well identified all of the unsuitable uh, bog holes? That's correct, Mr. Bergeron. Um, your characterization of what needs to be done is accurate and we believe we have identified all of the areas that need remediation and they are included in that estimate. And I guess the unsuitables, uh, there's normally a muck blanket on these levees, so I, I assume you can dispose of that on the levees itself. I'm not sure exactly what and we're doing with the uns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Mr. Bergeron. Um, Mr. Wells, can you refresh my memory? How, the contractor on this came in well under anyone else, didn't they? And I'm, I know you weren't working with us at the time, so that may not be a fair question for you. They did come well under. I don't have those exact amounts um, in front of me. Um, I'm not sure if Alan has them and if he's still on. Okay, and then can you give us just really briefly sort of a status of how this project's going? Yes, so this project is going very well. Um, we are move, continuing to move forward and we did save a lot of time with having this contractor do this um, investigative work on site while being able to maintain construction on other aspects of the project. And so looking forward, the pump station package is scheduled to be complete in um, by 2022 and the entire project is scheduled to be complete substantially complete where we could start potentially putting water into the reservoir um, in December of 2023. Well, that's for those of us on the west coast that's wonderful news um, thanks very much uh, I have a motion and a second is there any for, further board discussion uh, Mr. Steinley and Mr. Bergeron, your hands are still raised. I think those are leftovers. Let me make sure. Yeah, one. Well, Great. And I'll call that question. Uh, Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Steinley? Yes. Mr. Lipich? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. And I vote yes, that passes unanimously. Thanks very much, everyone.
We'll move on, and thank you, Jennifer. We'll move on to the next one, which is uh, item 31, an emergency action by the Seminole Tribe of Florida with uh, Mr. Walker. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Seminole Tribe of Florida to talk to you about an emergency action the tribe took over the weekend on the Big Cypress Reservation. Uh, if you go to that, that slide there, and sorry about the graphics, they're not the best. The bottom graphic shows on the top, the road up there is West Boundary Road on the Big Cypress Reservation. The bottom line going east-west is the West Feeder Canal. And the canal in between is called the Cowbone Canal. Uh, over the weekend, due to the heavy rainfall and, and anticipated additional rainfall, uh, there was a threat of flooding of about 22 home sites uh, for tribal members who live along and adjacent to that canal. And uh, the top graphic shows uh, what the tribe did. The uh, excavation you see to the uh, to the right of the main connection to the to the um, uh, to the West Feeder Canal was excavated around to the east and. Uh, open into an open channel into the West Feeder Canal. There are, we use the uh, uh, siltation curtains and so forth to protect the uh, water quality as it was done. It did alleviate the flooding uh, in that area. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, under the compact and the criteria manual, when the tribe does take emergency action, it's required to um, advise the governing board at the last at the next governing board and I apologize for the brevity of this presentation but that was only a few days ago and in order to get this presentation to you we had to cut it kind of short uh, we did provide notice as required of the compact on June 6 and as I indicated um, that was an unforeseen uh, circumstance uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment and mentioned it was necessary to protect the life and property of tribal members residing in the Cypress Reservation. Next slide, please. We we're getting a rain a lot sooner than we anticipated. Um, and I think all the um, weather related issues are things you've well spent a good deal of time talking about today and probably are well familiar with. The, the complicating factor in this case is a significant design flaw that exists in this project. And if we could go back up to the map, Rosie, the two slides before. Cowbone Canal, which uh, originally uh, was serviced by a project culvert constructed by the Corps of Engineers when West Feeder Canal was, was, was constructed uh, years ago. That structure you see on the uh, drawing in the north is actually a pump station to pump the water north for irrigation purposes. There is no uh, gravity drainage through this system for those residences. The, um, uh, this, part, this basin was part of the um, Seminole Tribe critical project as part of the project with the Corps of Engineers. And in the process of redoing this area as part of that critical project, the gravity drainage connection was eliminated and uh, was replaced by this pump station. Drainage was to be provided for this area through a series of pumps, which uh, routinely fail and don't provide the kind of uh, protection for flood protection that you would typically get. And just as a uh, aside, uh, the district doesn't typically permit pumps to protect residential areas. Most of the projects you permit that require drainage for residential areas are required to provide that drainage by gravity. For just the very reasons that, that uh, occurred in this case, the pumps often don't work when you need them most, and therefore you're left with no, uh, no means of getting drainage to the people that need them. So if you go back to the third slide or fourth slide, Uh, one more, one more after that. Okay, so uh, one of the things we also have to provide is uh, our conforming actions. Um, 
This also is, I will mention, uh, the district and the tribe also have an agreement, a memorandum of understanding, when we're doing something on the district's right of way, that we are required to meet your substantive requirements of uh, the district's right of way criteria, like any other uh, person who's using your right of way is doing. And in this emergency circumstance, we have to propose conforming actions to bring it in what we did in line with um, the district's criteria. Your criteria doesn't, doesn't allow open channel connections to district facilities, such as the North West Peter Canal. So uh, again, given the short period of time, we've not had time yet to work with district and the Corps to develop the interim solution here, um, which could allow the ditch to remain in place until we come up with something else. Could install interim culverts with risers in the levee between the canal and the West Feeder Canal, or we could install permanent culverts and risers in the levee between Cowbone Canal and the West Feeder Canal. Uh, the last one is what we propose doing, and we have a pending work plan amendment actually in house for that to occur. Um, it's been held up for a variety of reasons that uh, this time is too short to talk about today. We go to the next slide, please. So uh, again, as I mentioned uh, before, because of the right-of-way impacts here, we need, do need to provide a, a, um, a right-of-way application and how we plan to bring it into compliance with your standards. And we will be, uh, if there are any impediments in the district's access until we come up with an interim or a permanent solution here, uh, if you need alternate access to get on your right of way, the tribe will work with you to make sure you're able to get your equipment where it needs to go. And finally, we're going to be looking at installing safety barricades and lighting as necessary. While your, your folks are not out there during the night often, uh, some tribal members do if they're out there fishing. And so we want to make sure that everyone who might use that right of way is aware of this and are not uh, harmed by the uh, emergency action. And uh, next slide. That's it, uh, real short and sweet for this late in the day. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Walker, for bringing this to us in such a timely um, fashion. Is there any public comment on this, Rosie? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, there is not. Um, for the board, um, this is a briefing item. We're not gonna be taking a vote on it. Uh, if you'd like to comment, or if you have a question for either Mr. Walker or uh, Ms. Cobb, uh, please raise your hand and uh, I will call on you. And Mr. Chairman, this is Paula, if I might just please. very briefly mention the, the process. So um, now that the tribe has made this presentation, staff will work with the board prior to the next board meeting in July to determine whether we need to issue a final order memorializing those conforming actions. And so that's what we'll be doing. We'll work with the, not only the tribe um, over the coming weeks, but we'll also inform, work to inform the board members whether that final order is necessary during the next board meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Cobb. Any board discussion on that or any comment? Okay, seeing none, thanks Mr. Walker very much. Uh, we'll move on to staff reports. Thank you. Our first staff report is a monthly financial with uh, Ms. Heater. Thank you, Chairman. Um, before I get into the monthly financial report, I would like to uh, note that there is a report um, with an emergency procurement that staff needed to enter into related to some cleaning um, for some of our pump stations. Um, per um, the procurement policy, I, I need to report that. Um, moving on to the monthly financial report. The monthly financial report is for the month ending April of 2020, which is 58% you know, of the fiscal year's completion. Um, we've collected thus far $468.8 million. Um, that's $79.4 million higher um, than the prior year collections of 389.4 million um, for the same reporting period. Recognition of intergovernmental revenues are um, 
the lead of uh, causing that, that increase. They're $79.2 million higher. Um, I do want to note that our ad valorem collections are slightly behind, uh, about 2% for uh, the month of April, according to our historical performance, uh, which is about 96% that we should be at collection, and we're at 94. Um, I did uh, perform a look ahead, and uh, we have collected an additional $5.1 million through today, June 11th. Um, that still does not catch us up um, to. Uh, the June uh, collections rate, but we are not, you know, completed yet with the month of June, and that is when tax receipt uh, sales do uh, typically occur. So uh, staff is keeping an eye on the ad valorem collections, speaking with those uh, county tax collectors um, that are slightly behind trend. So uh, if I foresee any issues, I will be sure to bring it up at my next monthly financial report. Um, investment earnings, as Mr. Steinle uh, briefed this morning, uh, we are on target to make uh, additional uh, funding over our $7 million um, investment earnings. We've collected $6 million thus far. And um, expenditures, the expenditure side, were 53% uh, obligated. That's expended and encumbered at $731 million. Um, I wanted to give you an update that staff right now are working with the departments. This is the time of year um, where we hone in on available monies and uh, put a plan together on encumbering the remaining amount that needs to be encumbered to get us through the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, analyze what needs to be converted um, as a rebudget into your 21 fiscal year, as well as project, you know, how much available savings will be um, at the end of your fiscal year to help with your expenses um, in future years for one-time expenses. So in conclusion, governing board members, members of the public, uh, your revenues and expenditures um, that support the district do not illustrate any fiscal concerns uh, to report through the month of April and the quick look ahead into June. And I thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Heater. Um, when are, we're gonna be taking a look at the budget in July. Yes, sir. It, have you had any indication that um, as a result of COVID that the legislature will be cutting back on anything that's gonna be um, material to us or that's gonna make us have to adjust our budget? Um, no, sir, I have not. Uh, we do work very closely with our partners, uh, DEP, and uh, they have not uh, indicated or received any, any word um, that our funding for Everglades restoration, you know, is, is uh, being looked at. You know. Great. Mr. Bartlett, I see you're on. Do you have any comments on that? I, I think Candy covered it well. Um, it. There are two funding pots that we receive from the state. One of them is general revenue, which is based on sales tax, which will take a hit. We get very little general revenue. Most of our um, funding is through documentary stamps. Um, and so that, and that's sort of set aside per constitution for environmental restoration. And we haven't seen any indication that documentary stamp revenues are gonna take the same kind of hit that uh, general revenue will get. In addition, there is relief provided by the federal Act, can't remember the name of it, where states are provided some funds to bridge uh, a recession gap. Um, and so right now, as we look towards next year's budget, um, I don't see any threats to cuts necessarily that would cause us to um, not be able to execute our mission. Thank you very much, Ms. Barlett. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Ms. Heater. Is there any board member who has a question for Ms. Heater? Okay, saying none, we'll go on to Ms. Cobb. Good afternoon. I just have one update for the board and for the public. We did extend our emergency order in response to COVID-19. Um, and this is the order that is based on the governor's emergency order um, at the state level. And we are consistent with that order, which was extended through July 7th. So we extended our order through that same time period. And this order continues to assure that we can be uh, responsive to the public and get our business done. Um, even virtually. So it allows us to do things like the virtual online meetings, 
to accept our bid packages and specifications uh, virtually um, and via email, um, as well as to make those emergency procurements like Candy has mentioned before. And that concludes my report, unless there are any questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Kopp? All right, seeing none, we'll go to Mr. Bartlett, your executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a few things I want to talk about uh, today. First of all, I always commit to give you an update on the EAA Reservoir Project. And there are a few things uh, of note to talk about here. One is the what we call the New Start issue. Uh, and that is where the Corps has interpreted the 2018 WERDA package to require the EAA Reservoir Project to need a new start designation from Congress. Um, and once you get a new start, then you can receive construction appropriations. And that's why it's an important uh, decision that they made uh, that we don't agree with. Um, we have not heard any, any more news related to that new start decision by the Corps, although we are definitely engaged in those discussions. Um, what I would say is that the, this is not giving the core reason to pause what they're doing right now with respect to the EAA Reservoir Project, because they are in design right now. They'll be in design through the end of the calendar year uh, and into next year because of the magnitude of the project. Uh, so I talked to the Colonel yesterday. He is continuing uh, all, you know, full throttle on the design in hopes that the uh, new start issue will be get resolved one way or another. I can tell you um, we are engaged with the core in the discussions, but we're also engaged with our congressional delegation. And we see a lot of support in the congressional delegation to try to resolve this. And that could be either through a designation of a new start for the project or most more than likely through a WERDA uh, effort and WERDA 2020 to make it clear that as they did before, they, that this is not a standalone project that needs a new start, but it is an amendment to of the Central Everglades project, which has a new start. So we'll see, we're will see. we seeing a lot of uh, interest uh, in making sure that there isn't any delays on the reservoir project, but it is not in a resolved state yet. The other piece um, is that the Corps has also not released their final report closing the books on the EAA reservoir authorization. Uh, that it's, we, the Corps calls it a 1308 report, but it's the report that answers all the questions that were raised by the Secretary of the Army at time of authorization in 2018. It was ex expected in May. Uh, while we haven't gotten that report, we did get all the other things that were going to come along commensurate with it, like our permits, which we recognized 18 today for the stormwater treatment area, and a project partnership agreement um, a pre-partnership cooperative agreement, which the Colonel and I both signed, and we then immediately issued the notice to proceed for the next phase of construction of the stormwater treatment area, um, which is the Northern Berm and Northern Canal uh, construction. So they are mobilized uh, to do that construction project. We remain 12 months ahead of schedule on the stormwater treatment area, and we'll have a stormwater treatment area ready for use in 2023. Um, because neither of these issues are impeding our efforts. Um, so while the issues are disagreeable, um, they haven't slowed things yet, uh, but we'll have to definitely continue to monitor this situation and engage uh, to make sure that the pre reservoir project does not get impeded um, due to these types of issues. It certainly hasn't on our efforts to build the stormwater treatment area. So that's the reservoir project. I um, also wanted to update you, we have on our work in the northern watersheds, so we've concluded all our workshops on the draft, first draft of the 40E61 rule. That rule is still open for public comment through June, um, and so we'll be collecting comments uh, from the public this month. Uh, and then at the same time, we are looking at launching our watershed planning efforts in June as well for all three northern watersheds so that we can basically get underway with the things we outlined in the draft rule, which is focusing on targeted basins, looking for ways to improve uh, phosphorus uh, reduction for our two estuaries in Lake Okeechobee. Uh, so with all that happening in June, we are looking to schedule a discussion on these northern watersheds, including the draft rule for board discussion in July. And then we'll get a chance to hear from the public at that time. 
So I'd also like to basically with respect to COVID operations at the district, uh, we are still operating as we were last month, um, still getting the job done, very proud of staff and, and staff's ability to cope in these search situations. We are getting the buildings ready to repopulate. Um, and that is basically getting the signage up, getting the cleaning stations ready, uh, getting splash boards in the right areas for those people that have to interact with the public more frequently and getting all our policies in place for when we are ready to repopulate buildings. Um, right now, we're not seeing a huge public demand for access to the buildings because we've adapted with our permittees and our contractors and all the things we have to do that does engage the outside public we've been able to do remotely. With respect to governing board meetings, we're gonna engage you one by one, see, you know, gauge y'all's comfort on when you might be ready to reconvene in person and compare that to with our spacing and our facilities and you know whether we can make that work. I do not anticipate face-to-face -face in July, um, but uh, that could change, but I don't, I don't anticipate that. But we'll just have to stay engaged with you on y'all's perspectives with regard to that. On the irrigation orders, I know there's a lot of interest on the board with respect to the local government's response to our letters we sent 138 letters to local governments. Uh, last month, I reported that 43 had responded and we'd engaged with. This month, we're up to 106 of the 138 are engaged in responding. And that's a result of a lot of our regional reps that are in your areas uh, working with our staff at the central office and engaging and making contact with these local governments. Uh, I would say that two staff, Robert Wabenstrant and Jim Harmon, have been really working hard to make, get all these things rolling and try to get all of our local ordinances updated. We talked a little bit about the budget preparation. Um, like I said, I, as we are looking at next year's budget, which starts October 1st, but we really start our discussions in July, uh, I am, I'm seeing that we'll be able to continue the stuff we've started this year. Uh, that this board made a priority like the enhanced monitoring and expediting the projects and, and all those types of efforts. Uh, it, I think we'll, we looks like we'll be able to continue those. What I ask each of you to do is between now and July, if there's things that are on your mind that you want to talk about whether I could squeeze it into the budget or not, give me a call and so that I can work on that proactively before the July board meeting. The last thing I want to talk about is Paula Cobb. So basically, uh, <clears throat> basically a year ago, I had to come down to the water management district when it was changing over um, in a very rapid and dramatic way. And that was a lot of work. It was a lot of stress, um, but it was, you know, it was gonna be made much easier for me because Paula Cobb joined me um, on this journey. She's a trusted professional. I work with her at DEP through some very hard issues and very hard times. She's a friend, she's a confidant. And everyone knows that Paula is an incredible person. And that's why she's been offered another incredible opportunity in her career that I cannot possibly compete with. As you can tell, losing Paula is tough for me, but I'm extremely happy for her with her, this district transitioned into a very well-respected public institution. And I know we're gonna miss her. I know the people that work with her, her staff will miss her very, very much. I know that Jen, John, Sean and I will miss her input analysis and engagement and humor, which we benefit from every day. She is no wallflower. She's a great person. And so Paula, I thank you for joining me on this journey. I would absolutely remember this past year fondly for many reasons, but mostly because of our teamwork. Mr. Chairman, that's it for my report. I'm gonna go in the corner and cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Mr. Bartlett. I, I appreciate all your comments. That was a good report. And um, I absolutely echo your, your thoughts on uh, Ms. Cobb. Um, we'll go now to uh, our final agenda item, which is a board comment. and. I'll, I'll kick it off and I'll be quick. And I just want to thank Paula very much for 
for taking a chance on us and uh, leaving Tallahassee, coming down to uh, southeastern Florida and, and starting your life again. Um, you've showed incredible leadership. Um, we have an excellent team of attorneys and, and you were an incredible leader. You helped to set the tone of transparency, of detached professionalism. It was really needed at the time. We have a new board, we had a new executive staff and you, you were exactly what we needed. Um, you provided me and the board excellent counsel. Uh, you're gonna be missed uh, more than you know and I personally wish you the best in your new endeavor. And I understand this is your last meeting. So I, perhaps you'll listen in in the future just for giggles. Are there any other board members? Mr. Wagner, Vice Chair Wagner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also wanted to make a note on Paula Cobb. This has felt like a historic year uh, for us, and it certainly has been for me. Uh, as a lawyer and the, um, the lone attorney on the board over the past year or so, I feel like I've really developed a very close relationship to Paula. Uh, we've discussed a myriad of legal issues related to the his, you know, legal history related to the district and a lot of the legal issues, big and small, that affect the district and the board on a daily basis. I just cannot tell you all how remarkable a lawyer and a person Paula is. She's professional, she's personable, she's prepared, she's smart, she's responsive, and she's always on point. She cares about the district, her job, all of the people here, our larger mission, and the meaning of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, she understands the practical relationships we have with all of our stakeholders. Um, as a lawyer, Paula's ability to talk knowledgeably about high level expert matters, uh, and then equally transition into bringing down some of the highly um, technical and scientific detail into layman's terms and then having practical discussions about advice and counsel and how to handle situations has just been second to none. Um, I always enjoyed our conversations, Paula, your expert advice, the way that you handled every legal matter we spoke about. I really wish you the best um, in your next chapter in your life. And this is truly a bittersweet moment for me personally. I'm gonna deeply miss you and um, I hope you won't be a stranger. Thanks so much for everything. Thank you, Vice Chair Wagner. Ms. Meads. Sorry, that took me a minute. Um, uh, congratulations, Paula. We will miss you so much. Um, I, I wanted on a different note on, for me in closing, I noticed uh, today that there's a lot of um, emotion today among the stakeholders. And I, it's, it, it, it's interesting because just this past week, I was talking to a stakeholder bragging on all of you about how we had a, a, a rough start, about how uh, we, you know, how I care about each and every one of you. Um, I've gotten to know so many of you. You know, you guys ask us to come visit you or have lunch or dinner or whatever and you know and Gary Ritter I still want to go to a ranch you know that the the flu has slowed those things down but we have enjoyed that we have enjoyed getting to know you um, we are owned by no one um, uh, we represent 8.7 million people. We represent every single stakeholder, no matter who you are or what your interest is. We all, we want each and every one of you to have water. We want that water to be clean. We want the Everglades to be restored. We want the bay healthy. We want the coastal communities to be without blue-green algae. It was said uh, today a couple of times, or at least once, that we are supposed to be uh, objective, and there was some comment about, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter. What does matter is um, that it's just simply not true. We are here for everyone, and, and I think that you can see that we're very transparent and that we uh, serve you with passion. And uh, we always want to be available to you and look forward to seeing you all again in uh, person.
Thank you, Ms. Meads. Mr. Martinez. Yes, just real quick, Paula, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You have uh, made uh, this, this last um, year and a half, however long it's been, um, that much easier to deal with. Uh, you're a total breath of fresh air. Um, you made things so simple, even for those of us that are not as smart as board member Wagner. Um, and, uh, and, you, and you had such a way of going about it. It was never confrontational. It was just always done in such a nice, nice way. Um, good luck to you. My God, FPNL is getting our starting quarterback um, so I hope they appreciate you um, as much as we have been able to. So again, good luck. Hope, this, hope you stay in touch. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Ms. Thurl Jackie, Ms. Thurlow-Lipich. Thank you, Chairman Goss. Um, I'm sorry, Paula, um, I think that um, you had a lot to do with refining our mission statement, which really set us on the path um, to righteousness. I believe that. And uh, I wish you all goodwill. And uh, you, are, you are a very uh, special human being. Thank you so much for everything. Um, Mr. Bartlett, uh, this is kind of more pragmatic, but, um, could you, at the next meeting, uh, please give an update on the, the wind network, the water inventory network? I, I saw something in one of the emails I read about it, uh, like members from the district, or uh, not members, but uh, scientists from the district, uh, sending their information to go into that. And I think that's one of the things that we should come back to now and then, because that transparency for the public to easily um, access data is so important. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olipich. Uh, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, Paula, uh, good luck. I uh, wish you luck and uh, hope you do well in your new venture. I have enjoyed getting to know you in these brief few months, and you've been a big part between you and, and Drew and, and uh, Mitnick and Lawrence. Um, you have done a lot in uh, helping, to, uh, helping to get me brought to speed on some issues that, that I just frankly was not aware of before I, before I came onto the board. Uh, I didn't realize just how many different areas um, this district touches. And, um, I appreciate um, appreciate your candor and um, and the advice that you've given along the way, and I appreciate the the service that you've given uh, to the district. Uh, again, I'll echo everybody's comments. Please, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Um, please stop by a board meeting, um, and um, either that or we'll go grab a drink or something. So, um, but uh, good luck to you to venture there. Also, to uh, uh, I'm going to echo some of Cheryl's comments. I'm not typically a blue person, but um, um, uh, but I have uh, this meeting as well as previous meetings. I've enjoyed working uh, with this board. I uh, I certainly I see what each and every one of us, uh, each and every one of you, bring to the table. It's something unique. We've had some good discussions, and um, and uh, and I appreciate all the questions and and insight that, uh, that this board provides, in addition to staff. Um, with that, that's my comments. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Uh, Colonel Rowan? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd, I'd also like to uh, support what everyone has said on the board about Paula and what she's brought to the professional team that came into the district about the same time that we all did. And I want to wish you the best of luck and, and thank you for everything. On a different note, I also would like to um, uh, mention uh, the possibility of Biscayne Bay being a future workshop. Uh, I think it's important if the board takes a closer look at all of the projects related to uh, restoring Biscayne Bay 
And uh, I mentioned it once before, we discussed it once before, but I wanted to make sure after today's meeting that that didn't get lost. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's a great idea. Mr. Bergeron? Yes, well, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, first I wanna uh, thank Paula for all the great things and it's been an honor to work with you and uh, good health and happiness and success into the future. Uh, <clears throat> Also agree that uh, Biscayne Bay, uh, a workshop would, uh, I think, be very important to all of us. And I, I would think that uh, the discussion we had on uh, moving water south, uh, a workshop, and maybe staff can put together uh, any and all obstacles that could stop water flowing. Uh, I think this is a very big issue for the Global Everglades. Um, and I think it's very worthy of a, a complete workshop where, where everybody understands uh, any obstacles that would stop us from implementing uh, modified water delivery. Uh, we have the a construction contract out for raising the Tamiami Trail, uh, which could be completed in the next couple of years. And, um, and I think it's important that we have a, a workshop on making sure we can move this water. And thank all my board members. It's an honor to serve with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bergeron, very much. Uh Ms. Cobb, I'll give you last word before we go to public comment. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, um, I'm not crying, you're crying. Um, I, I really wish I were there to give everyone a hug. Um, this is absolutely a bittersweet moment and I have so appreciated the opportunity uh, to work with all of you um, and to serve the public. Um, this is by far the most professional and talented team I've ever worked with. Uh, not to diminish any of my previous colleagues, but um, you know, Drew, when you called me about this opportunity, um, it was big and it was scary and it required a huge transition um, for my family, including my high school daughters who were not very happy about changing high schools. Um, but they knew the important work that we were all going to do. And so I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate your trust. Um, and I, I appreciate working with you and I, I'm so proud of everything we've accomplished um, the last year. And I look forward to watching you guys accomplish even more. And I wish everyone the best. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Paula. Godspeed. Uh, Rosie, do we have uh, any public comment before we adjourn? We do, Chairman. Uh, Goss, we have a phone-in caller with the last four numbers of 6814. If you want to press star six to unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? I hear you, thank you. Yes, you can hear me? Yes. I, uh, I can hear you. Great, this is Drew Martin. Uh, uh, for some reason, my hand raising function had stopped working, so I had to dial in on a different phone. I just want to thank the board. I did want to mention a couple of things uh, that we discussed today and uh, the importance of Bird Drive Base. And I think it's very important that we protect that area because it's part of SERP. And I think that protecting habitat, and that is an ideal habitat area, is extremely important to restoring the Everglades. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I've, that I think water flowing south in Everglades National Park has not been significantly prevented by the Seaside Sparrow. It's my understanding that those gates are somewhat in the wrong place. That's what someone told me at one time. But that is not really preventing the majority of water getting in there and that the park has always been willing to take as much water as it can get. So I think to continually blame that as a reason for not getting water south into the park and into Florida Bay, I think is somewhat of a, I guess what people would call a red herring. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is I've talked uh, many times about water conservation. I just want to mention 
the other night I was riding on my bicycle at midnight, and that was during the flood advisory, and you all talked about how we were getting, in some cases, 24 inches of rain, and I just observed people were running sprinklers. And I know that Drew Bartlett has been working on upgrading these agreements, but I think it's really important that that the sprinkler systems not be throwing water out during a flood event, as that increases runoff that you have to handle and increases fertilizer going into the environment. So I think it's really important that the district begin to enforce these regulations and, and work through the local utilities and local county governments and city governments that make sure people do the right thing. Because not only is that throwing water into the environment, but it's also putting fertilizers into the environment at, at the absolutely wrong time. So again, thank you very much for letting me comment. I uh, look forward to talking with you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Next, we have Nyla Pipes, followed by Doug Gaston. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. Ms. Meads just said something that I think I really need to address. We all come to this conversation because we care so deeply. And that equates to emotion and passion. And I really respect what she said about, you know, representing all stakeholders and how um, it's apparent that we all come to this with that passion on our sleeves at times. And I wanted to address that because I know today I was a little more passionate than usual. And that's because it can be really frustrating, especially when you go so quickly from such a dry period to such a wet period. And some of us have been at it for a very long time. And you feel like you're kind of yelling, yelling into a cave and, and, and nothing is being accomplished. And I think that this board is doing a lot of good. And I think that these important conversations about passion and about emotion are also a part of that. So I just wanted to, to thank you for hanging in there with those of us who come to the table a little bit passionate at times. You know, Miss Jackie Philolipish actually told me one day never to apologize. And I don't think any of us should apologize for our passion, but I do think that we need to continue to keep space in the conversation for the differing viewpoints. So um, that's not why I raised my hand to speak, however. Why I raised my hand to speak was actually to ask that as we continue forward um, with, you know, transitioning back into, I think Drew said, repopulating the buildings, right? Uh, that we continue to allow the Zoom function for people who are passionate, who do spend time, you know, utilizing the resource in various ways, who very much care about this conversation, to be at the table even when they cannot um, afford the time to spend physically in the room with us. So I think that's really important to be able to continue utilizing the Zoom function so that people who are maybe at their job and can only tune in a bit, still have the ability to weigh in. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask for was at some point uh, in the near future, hopefully an update as to where we are with the uh, C23, C44 interconnect canal. I know that that's something that I've been kind of sounding the alarm on for a, a few months. And I know that, you know, sometimes there's stuff going on behind the scenes and, and then it, it suddenly rears its head again. And I just wanna make sure that I stay up on that conversation. And I think that the public um, needs to be paying attention to that continually as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Mr. Gaston, you're recognized to speak. Can you hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Goss and governing board members. Uh, Doug Gaston, Audubon, Florida. Um, first, I just want to comment on uh, some things in Drew's report, the uh, new starts issue. Uh, you know, however this gets resolved, it's the, the reservoir project is such an important uh, project that's going to help a lot of different areas. Uh, the Caloosahatchee, the St. Lucie, the water conservation areas, Great Glades National Park, Florida Bay, the whole thing. Uh, so we're glad to hear that even though there's still some uncertainty around how it's gonna move forward, there are no delays. Uh, and to that, I'd like to congratulate the staff who was recognized earlier today for all their hard work for getting the permits for the uh, STA portion of the project. Uh, and to thank the board for all you're doing to try to accelerate uh, this project and, uh, and, and really try to push the ball forward, uh, which 
kind of leads me into uh, circling back on, you know, Everglades restoration generally. And that's, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow and how it conflicts with restoration. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that restoration is moving faster uh, because that is the recovery plan for the Sparrow. And it, it, so recovery is going to help the Sparrow, to help the park, to help the bay. Uh, so, you know, it's really not an impediment to restoration, but its continued existence actually depends on it. So, you know, when you hear the, the people say flowing water south hurts the sparrow, that's not really accurate. If you don't change the operations and continue to push for the use of the, the, the S12 structures, uh, then yes, yeah, send the water south without new operations to use new structure will hurt. Uh, but, you know, water release from the westernmost uh, Tamiami Trail structures doesn't flow to central Florida Bay where we see these upticks in salinity due to lack of fresh water flow. So the answer for the bay, the park, and the sparrow is really one and the same. Implementing SERP, uh, increased freshwater flows from Northeast Shark River Slough, and uh, as Mr. Bergeron said, try to mimic the uh, natural flows from Shark River Slough uh, into Taylor Slough. So, uh, you know, COP will help with that. Uh, that's coming up soon. Uh, and, you know, there's some other components to this too, but I, I don't want to get into that because I want to just take my last little bit of time uh, to say goodbye to Paula uh, or say au revoir, as our friend Richard Nixon would say. Um, but in the brief time I've gotten to know her, she's just an exceptional person who I've grown to respect and appreciate and like quite a bit. And I just want to wish you all the best in your next endeavors and uh, hope that you will stay in touch. So take care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Cook? Mr. Ritter, if you could unmute your mic. Oh, okay. I thought you, I thought you had called for Newton Cook. I'm sorry. Um, uh, first of all, I want to concur with everyone's comments on Paula Cobb. She has also been so great to work with for those of us on the outside. And, um, you know, from, from the Farm Bureau, we, we wish her all the best in, in her new endeavors. Uh, Miss Meads, I, I have not forgotten, and we will get you out on a ranch, I promise. Um, I'd like to take this, this opportunity also to thank uh, Jennifer Reynolds, Pam Wade, and Stephanie Olson for putting on three exceptionally good, workshop, good workshops on the works of the District Rule 4061. Um, I just want to take a, a moment to share some general thoughts. Uh, there continues to be a great deal of discussion surrounding the success of the regulatory fo format south of the lake. And as such, um, people want to simply apply it north of the lake. I contend, and I know this may raise a bit of eyebrows, but I contend that the Southern program is not successful simply because of the regulatory format. It's successful because of the commitment of farmers to implement BMPs in concert with the regional projects that are in place um, south of the lake. I will tell you, you will get and continue to get the same commitment to implement BMPs by farmers north of the lake in spite of a different regulatory format. The regulatory program in place north of the lake is being implemented and administered by FDACs with the oversight of DEP as the enforcement arm and the water management district with the monitoring requirement in lieu of a landowner not opting to implement BMPs. Likewise, I think the district will provide basin water quality assessments working with FDACs in assessing the efficacy of BMPs and the need for small and large scale water quality projects north of the lake. We have to understand that there isn't a regulatory program, BMP program that can be designed that will ever achieve 100% of the TMDL um, north of the lake, which is why regional projects in the north are so important, just like they are south of the lake. Um, the Farm Bureau, we will continue to engage in this effort. 
um, with staff to come up with the most effective program in improving water quality north of the lake. Um, we appreciate, you know, all their, all their efforts. And I look forward to seeing everybody in person uh, eventually because I think uh, my wife is getting tired of me raiding the kitchen, um, you know, in between presentations. Um, hope everyone has a good evening. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Next, we have Newton Cook, followed by Matt Pierce. Uh, thank you. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I hear you, Mr. Cook. Okay, thank you. I didn't hit that. Uh, listen, I am glad to get the opportunity not to end the day on a rant. Uh, so, uh, like uh, uh, before me, it's nice to be able to be a little more uh, calm. And, and I, I also want to say, Paula has, has just been wonderful. And God bless her and, and good fortune to her in the future. Um, Jackie, I heard you say you were going out to Dupree. I can only tell you that it is the wonderful example of what the Water Management District and the FWC can do when they work together. It is an incredible place. And I, I, I always encourage anyone to take uh, a morning, because if you get there before daylight, believe it or not, you're going to see a lot of, of, of stuff. And it's just a beautiful place to watch the woods come alive. So I hope you get a chance to get out of the vehicle and walk about 100 yards uh, down one of the trails and just be quiet. It is an incredibly beautiful place. Now, uh, we heard red herring. That red herring is about 15 years old, and it stinks. And I can tell you right now, there's two S12 slopes. Open the other two S12s and the other uh, ways to send water south into the park today. And within 24 hours, you're gonna hear from the US Fish and Wildlife Service that you gotta shut the water off. And this, this business about the Cape Sable Street South Fair is serious. And, and I just want you to understand that when you spend the $2 billion or whatever it is to build those bridges and to build those structures, not a drop of water new will go into that park according to Larry Williams, who is the head of the environment of the endangered species for Florida, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, twice at the meeting at Fort Myers, he said, nine months of the year, water will be restricted from flowing into the park because of the Cape Sable Sea South Sparrow. Now, people could come on here, and as I said once before, when people tell you that water does not be blocked going under that trail, they're either grossly ignorant or they lie. And that's a hard thing to say but it's true. And on a more positive thing, I want to thank you guys. You guys, uh, you're, the, you're a can, tremendous board and you got a tremendous staff to work with. And I'm, I'm glad you got a little taste of wet weather, but God, if we get a hurricane, you watch your staff. It, they are just incredible when everybody else is in panic. So thank you very much. It's been a great meeting. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Next we have Matt Pierce. Mr. Pierce, if you could unmute your mic. Hello, it's Matt Pierce. Hello, Mr. Pierce. Can you hear me? I hear you, Mr. Pierce. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm in the middle of the woods. But anyway, Matt Pierce, Florida Cattlemen Association. Um, I appreciate the opportunity today to come before y'all and speak in, in closing. I'll be brief. Um, I'd like to thank Jackie Thurley Lippish for uh, coming. The one thing she didn't express in uh, her ranch visit was that she was on a horse. Um, so uh, that was uh, very commendable of her. Uh, we saw some pretty good country. Uh, Miss Meads, if you want a ranch tour uh, between myself and Gary, we'll get you on a ranch. Uh, we just need to figure out if you want to be on a horse, whether you want to be on a buggy. Um, but um, Drew, I want to be uh, on the horse. Uh, you and Okay, that's fine. We can arrange that. Um, we can arrange that. Uh, Drew, I, I appreciate uh, your efforts uh, last week um, and, and what we saw in, in, in our, uh, our kind of field visits. Um, I, I appreciate staff and the willingness to reach out to the ranching community and, uh, and you know, see what, what we're doing. And uh, the one thing that's come out of all of this and all of the discussions in, 
and what I hear from the board is that uh, the ranchers north of the lake are going to do more um, for uh, nutrient management. We're, we're going to do, we're going to implement uh, new and more improved BMPs. Uh, there, there are some things that are coming uh, that I think that have been asked for uh, to address the, the situation. Um, so, so just be anxious about that. And then, um, you know, what, what I'll say, and I've heard it today as, as the lake kind of fills up, uh, those waiting birds are on private ranches and I've driven around all day and listened to the meeting and seen Rosetta spoonbills and, and storks and, and, you know, they're, they're on the ranch where, where the level, the, the water level is lower and they can get that, that, uh, that food source that they're after. So I, I'll, uh, I'll finish up by saying thanks and, uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Next, I have Adam Gelber. Hello, board, uh, chair, governing board members. Uh, Adam Gelber here, director of uh, Office of Everglades Restoration Initiatives. Um, I've had the opportunity to sit back and listen to all of the comments during today's meeting. And, and I got to tell you, it's a lot of work being a board member. You have a lot of responsibility uh, ahead of you uh, and a lot of experience behind you from which to draw upon. Um, I'm commenting today to um, kind of speak about the future, this next uh, wet season and what the end of that next wet season was. We reached 14 feet in the lake this past year. And at the end of the year, we have struggled to deliver the dry season flows and other benefits to fish and wildlife and the built environment. And I'm gonna be brief here because this has been a long day. And I'd like to take a quote from University of Florida study from Carl Ravens. And when we look forward to the future and how this uh, looks to the future with Losum, how we manage the lake and how we manage for those uh, benefits, uh, south of the lake. I'm going to take a quote here and I'll conclude with that. The current lores 2008 is 1.25 feet lower than run 25 and WSE. This equates to an average of more than 500,000 acre feet of lost storage capacity in the lake. As a result, unless a new regulation schedule restores some or all of the capacity, there may be insufficient water stored in the regional ecosystem to provide for all the environmental and water supply benefits expected to happen when SERP is complete. So that was Carl Ravens from a University of Florida 2018 report. And like many of the others are sources of information from which to help you all make a guided um, decision. You have a great support staff there. I, I just request that you all keep that in mind because the park was really dry this past year. And um, obviously there were environmental factors that led to that, but we always need to strive to make a better situation. I'm here to help support that goal of attaining um, better dry season flows when we look to the end of next September. Uh, again, great meeting, uh, you know, John, uh, Lawrence, great presentations today, very accurate, and I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galbert. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes our general public comments. Great, with that, I think we'll wrap up the meeting. I'd like to thank uh, my fellow governing board members. I'd like to thank staff. I'd like to thank our stakeholders all for participating. I think it was a good meeting as a result and I appreciate all the comments. Um, I don't know where our next meeting will be, but it'll probably be Zoom and I look forward to seeing you in a month and I'll call for adjournment now. Thanks. <laughs>